you think BW Business World. Spanning across platforms from print to the fast-growing digital space, from custom events to insightful industry books, BW Business World continues to capture a critical market space. Enjoying over 1.2 million engaged reader base, we have replicated this success in digital with a six-fold growth in the past one year. So who is the BW audience? Our magazine readers are the cream of the crop business professionals spread across industries and niche communities. BW Digital engages with a much larger audience, hailing majorly from India and US. We also reach diverse markets including UK and Saudi Arabia. The BW Print Universe comprises of BW Business World, BW Smart Cities, BW Hotelier, BW Applause, BW Education and BW People, each profiling industry leaders and niche sectoral stories. BW Digital Communities target niche segments like startups, CIOs, smart cities, defense, amongst a range of other fields with the following of millions of unique digital users. BW Business World is an industry leader in curating a plethora of IPRs. With multiple industry stakeholders under one roof, BW IPR events generate superlative content. BW Engage offers bespoke brand solutions across functions with inputs from the award-winning BW editorial team. We design and execute a 360-degree marketing model resulting in top-of-mind recall and a large BW Engage client patronage. Why engage with us? We have an award-winning editorial team. We forecast new scoops and future trends before any of our competitors. We provide 360-degree brand solutions and our clients are always happy with the ROI. This is just a glimpse of our client endorsements. To subscribe to our print patronage, visit subscribe.businessworld.in. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also connect with us on WhatsApp on businessworld.in slash WhatsApp. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Khyati Kawa, your host for today's virtual summit and conclave. BW People is HR community initiative of BW Business World with a 40 year old legacy of credibility and a leader's reputation in the business circles. The community focuses on integrating and developing of HR community. BW People integrates human resource professionals and service providers engaged with recruitment and selection, performance management, learning and development, career planning, compensation and benefits, rewards and recognitions, industrial relations, employer branding, employee participation and communication, health and safety, personal well being, administrative HR, labor laws, and more. BW People focuses on creating knowledge base updates on contemporary issues being faced by HR professionals. BW People has a community that, which is dedicated to digital, IP and print magazines that consistently provide latest information to help HR professionals and department to upgrade for future. Well, BW People's HR Learning and Development Excellence Summit 2020, it is a virtual summit that aims to provide a platform for all l &D leaders the sessions will be highlighting how the LD leadership's strategic decisions and effective communication will help position the organization for future growth. BW People's HR Learning and Development Excellence Summit 2020 today focuses on topics related to learning and development excellence to bring forward best kept secrets and hear from the very best amongst us. Those who bear the torch of excellence in the LD landscape of India and by far are the guardians of India's LD practices. So let's kick start this day by thanking our partners. As we all know, no event is possible without the support of its partner. We'd like to thank our education partner, Institute of Public Enterprise. And before we proceed, can we have a look at uh, our audiovisual, please? Also, don't forget to tag us on BW Business World tags. Thank you very much. Can we have the audiovisual, please? We'd like to showcase the legacy that BW Business World has put together in the last four decades. So requesting our uh, partners to please play the audiovisual of BW Legacy. Thank you.
World presents a rich legacy of curated events that enable conversations on policy issues in India. Because of the state of our cities, we have no option but to build smart and resilient cities. Digital India is more for the poor, underprivileged and the deprived. Covering a range of topics, BW Business World events look to create a strong narrative around smart cities, digital India, healthcare, Swachh Bharat, human resource issues, education, banking and finance, among others. The world is fast changing. Best practices are available now on the net. Vikas, development, puri rajiniti mein, ye focus ban gaya hai. BW Business World events provide a speaking platform to the voices that matter. Smart se taluk ye hai ki hum jo basic amenities hain, usko hum chust durust karein. You don't have to be a technologist. You need to understand how technology influences the world. Mahatma Gandhi was a great man. He was the leader of the freedom struggle. We believe that e-governance and IoT will play a very, very important role. BW Business World is an excellent exhibition platform that helps you showcase your services to the right audience. BW Business World's digital transformation went on the fast track in 2020, marrying its legacy of credibility and robust business journalism to a technology-first world. Hosting over 250 virtual summits and webinars across its 17 niche business communities with millions engaging with the power pack content like BW Dialogue Series, Festival of Life web series and custom created webinars and hosting 20 plus virtual summits. Thirty-three million page views on an average, 21 special issues in 2020 hit the stands and multiple IPs scheduled in the coming months, BW has taken a leadership position in the business news segment. To become a part of our legacy, write to us at partner at businessworld.in. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let's kickstart uh, today's event. And I'd like to welcome on screen, Mr. Talis Rizvi, Director, BW People, to join us on screen and uh, welcome this August gathering. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Rizvi. Mr. Rizvi, you are on mute. Request you to please unmute yourself. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Kathy, hope uh, I'm audible. Yes, absolutely. Today we are kickstarting our uh, BW People's HR Learning and Development Excellence Summit and Awards. Uh, this has been uh, scheduled uh, uh, you know, uh, for today, and uh, during the day we'll be listening to a number of uh, CHROs and LND professionals. To put the context right, I would uh, like to share the journey that. Uh, Indian business ecosystem had in a, a past few decades where the transition from industries uh, to knowledge-based workers has come in to play with the IT and ITES and uh, uh, information uh, technology and uh, uh, biotechnology kind of industries have emerged with huge uh, uh, human resource uh, and the workforces that they have. It is very important for any organization to have uh, a kind of workforce that is aligned with the business strategic uh, uh, visions and the objectives 
So there, L&D plays the most important role. And uh, at the same time, uh, we have uh, the service providers who have been uh, contributing to the industry. They play a vital role in uh, making the uh, industry ready for the upcoming challenges. So the industry has, uh, uh, over a period of time, uh, has been trying to transform with the changing uh, uh, scenario. And uh, in this, uh, 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 you'd like to uh, understand that uh, different functions of HR as well as uh, the technical functions, the people have to be trained and they have to be constantly uh, nurtured to uh, look uh, match the uh, current needs of the industry. So keeping that in mind, BW uh, People has come up with the learning and development segment and we are trying to recognize the best in the industry who have contributed uh, uh, to their organizations and uh, have uh, developed a business acumen in their uh, uh, professionals in their uh, organizations. So from here, we would like to take it ahead. And uh, I would uh, request uh, everyone to be there throughout the day and listen to the uh, sessions and join us for the award ceremony towards the end. Uh, I think I would uh, hand it over to Khyati for now. Thank you so much. Thank, Mr. Thank, you, thank you very much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving straight into our first keynote address. But here I'd like to urge all of you to keep commenting, keep telling us which are your key highlights during the day from our speakers, panels. And of course, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do add it in the comment box on whichever platform you're watching us on. Currently, we are going to bring to you the keynote address by Dr. Akil Busrai, CEO Akil Busrai Consulting. Can we have the video message, please? I would like to thank uh, BW people for inviting me for this uh, conference, seminar, whatever you call it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the topic of LND function undergoing a change in the coming time uh, is going to be highly relevant from two points of view. One, it will affect the profession itself, the LND professionals themselves. and they in turn will be affecting the organization to a large extent in terms of revival. So I'd like to make my, uh, share my thoughts uh, in two parts. One, the changes that the organizations are going through now, and I don't want to go through these uh, cliches of, you know, normal and subnormal and new normal and all that. Let's be practical. All of us are practicing managers and we have to see it at the grassroots level as to where we can make an impact and where the organization will feel the impact. Now, post-COVID, there'll be a rush for organizations to recover, rebounce. And that's a reality. They have to recoup the losses in business, revenue, market share uh, that has happened during more than one year period. And the pressure to regain business stature business uh, grounding will be tremendously um, important for any organization. And as a result of that, the business leaders will actually push for more for less. This is going to be the mantra in the coming time. Uh, reduce cost, increase revenue, increase output, increase productivity, bring costs down, recoup the losses we have made during the COVID period. This is a reality. Now, if more or less is going to be the mantra in the coming uh, period. And I'm mentioning deliberately not mentioning months or years because each organization will have its own rhythm to recover. I am passionate about learning. And that's why when I talk about l and I'm talking about myself as much as anybody uh, on, a, on a conference call like this. So as a result of this, we in l and will have to change the way we look at our role in the past. What was our role? We had a calendar, we had an offering to make to the organization and the employees, and we were very proud that we met our calendar and everything went clockwork in many organizations. We were felt very proud. The change will be that we'll have to now genuinely understand business. When I say genuine, <clears throat> I'm not talking about 
uh, um, PAT and PBT and CAGR, many of us in HR, including LMB, know these figures to the next decimal point. How do we reskill and how do we measure that the reskilling that we have provided had actually sufficed to meet the business need? And this is all easy to talk in a conference like this, but when you really get down to offering, how many of us have really understood the shop floor uh, uh, functioning? Um, many of us have done. I'm not being critical of LNB. But at the same time, we've been happy with a very set set of way of working LNB, um, a predictable way, calendar. And I keep using this word calendar, if you notice, uh, we'll have to be agile on our feet and improvise training and reskilling as we go along. And because of this fluid organizations, the need for delivery will also change because some of the boxes themselves will disappear. All these fancy things that we see in technology being used and being talked about and being reported uh, is sometimes we have to distinguish that it's not a fad. That is really possible is practical and implementable. And cost has to be kept in mind. What is possible for multinational organization globally to do something may be a huge challenge for medium-sized companies. And we should not forget that we are catering not only to rich and famous and big. As an LD professional, we have to ensure that the skill pool is impacted by our action and not the ability or capacity of the organization only to shell out more money. Now, technology, use of technology in LND doesn't mean more money. Sometimes it's smart use of money. We are talking about artificial intelligence. We are talking about machine learning, blockchain, robotics. This is reality. And the faster we accept the reality and prepare ourselves, that how do we change the workforce profile? You cannot be a box in the organization and say, oh, my function is LND function. We will provide this, 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 this training, take it or leave it. We'll have to customize it. And as a result of that, the offering has to be having two uh, fundamental foundation. One, it must be relevant to business. And second, it must make a difference to the people whom we are giving this training and learning opportunity so that in return, they make a difference to the organization. So the loop has to get completed. We cannot have a situation where we are isolated from business reality because we are a function that has been sometime in many, and I'm not being critical again, uh, but sometimes we are used to it. That is a certainly expected out of us. There are some standard programs which you must go through in your career, and LND people are the best ones to provide. You know, we have to take pride in our profession that we are not only mere service providers. We are not only mere organizers. We are not mere just coordinating, putting things together. We are the ones who are making impact on the business results. And moment we recognize that fact and take ownership for making a difference, our own thinking will change. And I've been fortunately associated with my team, uh, which is highly, highly connected with business. In Motorola, we started a program, I remember way back in the mid 90s when telecom was not there in the country, we started a program called LEAP, Leadership Accelerated Program, where we committed to the business that you keep growing. And we were growing at a very fast rate. Motorola had just come to the country and I was looking after Asia Pacific. And we were growing in Malaysia, in, uh, in Australia, uh, also in Korea. Uh, and and shortage of people. And we said, you go ahead and grow the business, the business leaders. We will ensure that we provide you enough leadership and manpower uh, with the right set of skills. Of course, we are, I'm talking about leadership skills, not technical skills. Now, as a result of that, we were able to assure the business that you'll never run short of leaders because we will proactively train people in advance. And this LEAP program was a prototype for 15 months where we had five modules and I'll not go into too much detail, but it's important to know that customized to the business need. Classroom training, on-job application in your business, next time classroom training outside your business, third training, and the last assignment outside your country or region or outside your function also. And if we can get this embedded in our psyche, that we are here to make a difference, 
feel proud of our function that we are here to make a difference and not just one more organization, boxing organization chart, then we would actually look back at ourselves maybe a few months or maybe years from now and say, we made a difference. And that feeling of having made the contribution gives me at least a pride that our function, l &D function, is an important and integral part of organization uh, existence and growth. And moment you understand that you are not just one uh, piece of uh, jigsaw puzzle, you, without you, the jigsaw puzzle is incomplete. And I know it sounds a little cheeky and a little bit of uh, arrogance here, but there's no harm in feeling a little proud about our own function and making sure that we make a difference, but there's a big but, that we have to earn that respect of genuinely making a difference. So thank you once again, uh, BW people for inviting me uh, and, and to all my colleagues uh, who are going to participate in this program, I wish you good learning. More than that, I wish you a good networking where you can pick up a phone, a WhatsApp each other or um, meet hopefully after COVID, or connect with each other to learn how to solve problems that are uh, that you are facing in your organization. And no one feel alone. We are all in it together as a function, as a, a set of professionals with the similar commitment. We can actually step to each other and make sure that we all become uh, that much more effective in making a difference to the organization. Uh, sometime, uh, this type of talk uh, makes you feel good. Oh, yeah, yeah, a good thing to say, but I would encourage each one, make a list of three or four things that you want to impact. Just three things. Measure it and execute it with only one difference. This time, execute it along with the line managers. Let's not keep ourselves away as specialists in learning and development. Let's merge with the mainstream of the business, become part of the business structure with line managers, work with line managers. They know best what is needed. And if we can satisfy them as our customer, then our value addition will be of meaning to the organization. So closing this, uh, so my thoughts, learn business, absolutely nitty gritty of your own business, what the competition is doing. Now, many times l &D people say, look, my job is only to provide training to my organization, what is happening in competition, what is happening in technology, advancement. Uh, it, it, certainly there are a lot of specialists who do that. Of course, there are specialists who do that. But who are the people who are going to be impacted by the change in environment? In, in Shell, um, we used to spend a lot of energy and resources on sustainable development and alternate energy. And it's very comical that an oil company is spending a huge amount of resources on solar energy, on ocean energy to use waves as generating electricity. Isn't it oxymoronic? But the function felt that we should train our people on those alternate technology because the future will be shaped by those technology. And if it's good for Shell now or in future, I'm adding value as an LNP function. So thank you once again um, for giving me this opportunity to share my thought. Um, my colleagues who are organizing this conference have my email address and my contact. I'll be very happy, very happy uh, to hear from some of you and if there's any way we can synergize our uh, way of working or thinking together, I'll be more than happy to partner. So thank you once again. Goodbye. Good luck. With those wise words from Mr. Busrai, I think we are all ready and set to dive into our next panel discussion. But if you have any questions for our panelists or speakers, don't forget to punch it in the comment or chat box uh, wherever you're watching us on. Also moving forward, the topic that we're going to discuss next is learning and development and the new age candidate. We have with us
on panel, Mr. Karanjit Singh Uppal, head of L&D at KFC. We also have with us Chit Bhanu Nagri, Senior Vice President, People Operations at Razorpay. And on panel, we also have Mr. Ashish Anand, CHRO SAR Group of Companies. And moderating this session would be Mr. Sunit Sinha, Partner and Head, People, Performance and Culture at KPMG. A very warm welcome to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Hi. So, Mr. Sinha, I'd leave the screen to you to take the conversation forward. Once again, a very warm welcome, gentlemen. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, hi, Karanjit. Uh, I think uh, we have all, all, all I, I'm not sure if I can see all the other panelists in my view, but welcome, everyone. And uh, a very good morning to all of you. It's a, it's an interesting topic, a topic with which we've been talking about not just recently, but for the last almost a year. If one looks at how 2020 went, uh, all of us, uh, uh, there was no management theory, there was no, ma uh, there was no scenario plan, there was no strategy uh, 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 that uh, had prepared us for what uh, transpired in 2020. So uh, anyway, here we are, uh, sitting on uh, the 27th of February 2021 exactly a year later and, and I welcome my uh, fellow panelists Karanjit, uh, Chitbanu and Ashish. Hi Ashish, good to see you again. Hi, good yeah. to see you again. Hi. It's Hi. been a while. So the, I thought uh, we have around 40-45 minutes. Uh, we'll keep it interactive, we'll keep it going. There are a set of topics that I wanted to cover and uh, as I thought instead of me starting with some five minutes of monologue and sharing my thoughts, let's get the uh, uh, interaction going right at the start. I, I was thinking of structuring uh, the questions or the broad, you know, three, four areas that we'll talk about. One is obviously the, the, the big question that we all keep talking about and all of us in the uh, larger learning and development space or the people space, are talk is the, how has COVID really changed the way we are looking at learning? You know, I mean, the, the obvious one is yes, uh, because when blended learning and digital learning was there for, for a while, this has probably accelerated it. So I'll probably go around and seek your initial views on your own experiences in your organization and what you've seen in terms of how the pandemic in a way accelerated some of that and, and some learnings coming out of that. Because uh, my own sense is, and I'm happy to hear uh, your views on contrarian views as well, that some of these changes will stick. I mean, there will be a time when the whole world is vaccinated and we're all back to what used to be considered normal before March of 2020. But I think some changes will stick. That's one. Second is then, therefore, how does it change the way we're looking at, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the topic is the new candidate. So, you know, the new candidate, I would imagine, is, the, is in a way the, the new learner who is more empowered, has more access to learning material than ever before. I mean, uh, I know I often, uh, so in, in my current role, of course, I look at people in HR uh, for KPMG India. However, in, you know, having worked with clients over the last two decades, one of the biggest challenges I used to, clients who say that how, you know, our people are always on LinkedIn and other social media. Why can't we get them as enthusiastic about our learning management systems? Why don't we use our own internal systems that much? So the fact of the matter is that today we are all digital. So if it's all digital, how does that change the way we measure and and, and, the and I think the, uh, the third big area, and, and we can uh, uh, debate that towards the end, is that this does present an interesting challenge because in my mind, learning and onboarding and what we do through our programs is not just about skill building. That's how you're also onboarding people, you know, aligning them to your value system, your ways of working, you know, quote unquote, you know, culture as a term that we, we often use. Now, in a remote manner and, and you know, while we've had, we've been forced to do it over the last one year, but going forward, is that sustainable? Because, you know, humans are social uh, learners. We like to connect. And so some thoughts around that, I would say those are three broad buckets that, uh, and, and I leave it to you in terms of which, which ones of, which one of these would you like to take up? We maybe we'll go around the room for a couple of times and then we'll do some closing remarks. Sounds okay in terms of structure? Sounds good, Sunit. Thank you. Sure. So um, maybe I'll go in the order that uh, we were introduced. So Karanjit, you know, I'll put you on the spot first and uh, get your thoughts in terms of how has it been? I mean, some experiences, some learnings from the last uh, year as, as you've you know, tried, uh, as you've uh, driven the Lindy agenda in your organization, what, what are you seeing? What can you share with us? Of course. And uh, thank you, Sunit. Uh, it sets a broad context and being very specific uh, in the world of KFC. Uh, we learned a lot in the process. Uh, it's a journey 
and I'm happy to share that uh, we are able to partner with our employees and seek their inputs as well. So it's been a two way communication. So the employees have come back and told us, you know, this works, this does not work. We are so far away from our offices or restaurants. This is a better way of doing things, not a better way of doing things. And I think uh, uh, the key thing for us was just to listen more, more openly to the employees and understand where is it that they are coming from. So we revised our entire uh, LND strategy, not only bases the newer business model, but also how do we curate our existing programs bases the need and the accessibility and the acceptability of the employees. Also with lots of to and fro, we understood quite a few of the things. So we are fortunate as a country. It's a blessing in disguise that we do have internet across a majority of our cities across tiers one, two, three, four. We are honestly, we are blessed. Employees have come back and said, you know, uh, why do you want to talk about Zoom? Let's talk about WhatsApp because I am more comfortable doing WhatsApp. In fact, they came back and saying, I'm so much used to Facebook, so much used to Instagram. Uh, can you take my learning on through Facebook and Instagram? And we are trying to figure out, uh, are we going to violate any IPRs or anything? So we said, let's stick to WhatsApp for a start because it reaches across, everybody is used to it and it is a known medium, a known channel. And I'm referring to the period from 25th of March, 2020, way up to let's say 25th of September, 2020. So in spite of the lockdowns, the regulations and everything, we were able to connect at least twice on a daily basis across our workforce. So what we also understood was this helped us to jumpstart our own digital learning agenda. That is there. Also what we understood was that, you know, employees are more than eager to share their experiences when they're sitting at home, share their own apprehensions as part of their own learning journeys. So very few simple things they would come back and say that, you know, uh, I'm happy you're sharing this. At least I can remember parts of the business because staying away from the business for three to five months is not that easy. And more importantly, in the KFC setup, in the retail business, if you don't see your customer, how do you inculcate the hospitality behaviors and, you know, and the norms around it? So when we introduced our playbook also, addressing the government lockdowns, the brand standards and everything, we also ensured that, you know, it is communicated in very small video led snippets, all basis feedback from employees. So we did a very simple exercise, just going a little specific over here. We went back to the employees and asked them that how much of a video do you watch? And the target age group is between 22 to 28 years. And they just came back and said, any YouTube video, any Facebook video beyond 90 seconds doesn't work for us. We get switched off. We have very less attention spans. We said, well, thank you so much. Then this feedback corroborated with the feedback and research done by Google and YouTube separately. And then they, we said that, okay, whatever we do, because playbooks are huge, content is immense. We had to force ourselves to tune our mindsets to look at all our training programs into bite-sized modules. From there, we brought the videos down from huge five to six minutes. It's, these are really huge videos. We brought it down to one and a half minutes. Our target was 90 seconds. We were able to keep it up to 100 seconds. When we rolled it out through the playbook, the employees understood it. And best part is even our partners, the businesses would come back and say, hey, you know, uh, can you give us also a sense that are these employees engaged with us or not? Uh, are we building enough faith in them that, you know, we want them to be with us, we don't want to lose them. So for us, it was a big blessing. We were able to connect, we were able to engage, and we were able to give that hope and faith to the new age employee, right? who can really jump from one company to another and say that, you know, we are there for you. So yes, we have also made a few mistakes. Yes, we have experimented a lot. And overall, if, if we've done 10 new different things, we got six or seven out of them correct. Three or four, we couldn't get them right, but that's fine. At the end of the day, as far as the business is concerned, not only we were able to retain everyone with this engagement come learning, come business relevant activity, we were also able to satisfy our customers based on their customer matrix. 
this is the customer feedback through social media of facebook insta and whatever feedback we got and more importantly from a business point of view we when we were expanding we had so much of customer and employee feedback i think that has really helped us from september onwards even as we speak towards the last week of february so we are still curating our lnd model we are still going ahead and seeing what works what does not work however employees have come back and said that you know in tools like zoom and ms teams you have separate breakout sessions you know we try to do role plays and on leadership development we try to build more concepts on empathy on listening we try to attune the first time managers of manager of managers more and more concepts through role plays now that feedback is coming that one advantage of digital is that we don't need to travel and see the entire body language as long as you keep the video or the camera at least 6 feet away and then do the role play we can see the complete body of the person and then conduct our role plays and what we've understood from that to conduct appraisals across a broader geography in india we actually don't need employees to come over to offices so work from home and working from office it's a blended model uh, we are also coming to, in terms to it and what we have understood is that it is an equal partnership with the employee and the customer and business as long as it is listening to us and more importantly we are listening to the business you know it's a very healthy partnership so for us a lot depends on what we want to achieve in objective as well as in our profit measures so from a yeah. business point of view whatever we've done are we profitable yeah. yes are we uh, driving positive sales growth yes and have we maintained our cost lines the answer is absolute yes there are definite six digit based numbers on which we are not only saving cost but we are also profitable so the strategy is working out as far as the Great. business employees and customers are concerned no so i press quite a few of your points sunit just like no no, no I, i absolutely correct it but i mean thanks to that i would want to pick up two points that i really loved and we of course will come back to it once we heard from chitpanu and ashish as well one is the fact that you actually listened and you listened more you changed the delivery mechanisms you brought those 5 6 minute videos down to 90 seconds i think so keeping the learner at the center you know we always we talk of being human centered but how often are we really in sort of just pushing content down and the second is that really the the good news that all of this has helped you deliver those outcomes not just maintain from a business perspective but probably even have have a higher impact and you're carrying that on into other areas like you know going forward in terms of even doing appraisals etc so some great opening points karanji thank you for that i'll i'll, I'll switch to uh chit bhanu and uh, maybe chit bhanu picking up from some of the things that uh, karan ji just said it, it, of course sharing your experiences sharing some of the key uh, lessons learned and i loved the point that karan ji said it's not always we may not get it perfect and in, in, you know as no, no none of us were prepared for this so it's fine to say that you know we know what 6 out of 10 right four we will you know we'll fight another day and, and get those right the next time so some some reflections on your lessons learned what did you see in your organization and how are things now that we're not in the lockdown mode however we're still uh, not back to the normal we used to be uh, working in sure sunit uh, thank you and uh, karan first of all uh, you know connecting to some of the thoughts and the context in which you spoke i and my wife are are big fans of kfc and and almost all the offerings i can't tell you you know how uh, how uh you know patiently i am waiting for uh, the you know for us to be on the on the better side of of covid and for us to have an opportunity to to you know visit one of the restaurants you know on a lighter side one of my personal learning needs are if i could know how kfc gets the chicken just right i really would love to learn more about that but sure. uh, but but uh, but on a more serious note uh, uh, i think folks uh, i've seen majority of narrative around learning needs and and are uh the lessons learned to be on uh how we have gone digital how from predominantly being a physical led learning model we have gone digital how tools platforms have become more important uh, and and with due respect to these because i know these are important dimensions of the problem but i think uh, this is just this is just one side of the problem statement and frankly uh the more we emphasize only on on the platform and the fact that we have got digital i think more we are only skimming the surface 
one of my personal realizations at Razorpay, the organization where I work and, and in general has been, I think the biggest thing for us to realize and accept is that the learning needs have changed or at least the priority with which we look at our learning needs have changed. What do I mean by that? Let's go a little beyond the surface level observations. You know, what has been the biggest difference that COVID has made? I think the three biggest uh, changes or realizations that COVID has brought, first of all, resilience is very, very important. The folks who have been resilient through the process, who did not give up, who were able to stand emotionally strong, have come out more successful, stronger at the end of it. Second is the importance of, importance of compassion. I mean, let's forget about our professional lives for a moment. As individuals, I have tens and twenties of my friends who say that they have rediscovered their connections with their relatives, friends, families. You know, the proximity with which they used to connect with their relatives has maybe trebled, uh, you know, during COVID. And, and they would not connect as much and with as much of as much of emotion with their family, right? So the realization that compassion is very, very important for us as individuals and professionals, I think is a big realization. And finally, the last one has been the importance of health. While I think it's it's a it's it's an often abused term, but frankly, COVID has made me realize and many people whom I speak with that that the more I understand my health and the more I focus on my health, the better I will be as an individual and as a professional. Right now, let me put it on an organizational context. How many organizations are now extrapolating this and saying, if this has been an important realization for an individual, maybe this is an important learning need for us as an organization. And hence, what kind of learning infrastructure, what kind of learning needs do we have to build to make a more resilient organization, to build more compassion across the organization, and to ensure that an organization we come out more healthy, more focused on our personal uh, uh, you know, health. And I think at Razorpay, we have done we have done all of this. Uh, a lot of our learning curriculum, uh, the way we used to prioritize it, has significantly shifted uh, with a focus towards uh, sort of these three pillars. Uh, and I'm sure so have a lot of other organizations. I'm, I'm only trying to bring this up because to me, these have been most important. Uh, you know, we have, we have looked at external counselors. We have looked at external trainers who have come and who have advised our people on how to be re resilient, more on the emotional side of it. You know, uh, I, think, I think COVID has sapped a lot of energy emotionally, physically from a lot of people. People are tired working from home. People are tired not having an emotional connect with, with people. And they're helping people realize this, accept this and come out stronger. Uh, I think all learning interventions that go to some level of depth in, in this area have been successful. So we have partnered with organizations that are experts in behavioral sciences and that have helped our people realize, accept and grow stronger around resilience. Similarly around compassion, I think we today have a lot more open dialogue with our managers, with our leaders on how, what we call as the caring leader, how they can be more caring, how can they be more compassionate towards their people. And that does not mean we discount accountability anywhere, but what's the right balance between accountability and compassion? And then how we strike that right balance, keeping COVID in context, and how do we then train our managers around it has been another important uh, realization. And finally, health and all aspects of health. Uh, I'm sure many people in the audience here would have uh, heard about uh, seven, eight months back, uh, Razorpay completely re-engineered its, uh, its uh, leave policy. And we said it's today a holistic wellness uh, program rather than just a leave policy. So it doesn't matter whether you have, you have fever, you have cough, you have cold, or you are feeling emotionally down, or there's a problem in the family. All of this comes under the broad umbrella of wellness. And we want you to, in such times, take time off, feel better, and then come. We have spent a lot of time around learning as well to help people realize the importance of health. We have launched programs where we train people on yoga, physical fitness, emotional wellness, etc. And I think that has resonated with our people. We today see a lot many of our people coming back and saying, what more can I do? Uh, you're organizing programs, but I'm busy with work. Can you convince my leaders that they need to prioritize this as much as my work delivery? And we are trying to see how we, without compromising on our delivery targets, how can we make more time attention for, for programs and trainings related to physical and mental health? So Sunit, those have been some of my realizations, which I think are equally important. No, I, I love the points of the fact that the learning needs themselves have changed because when you're talking of the new learner, the new candidate, as, as the topic is, we have to look at the needs having changed. And yes, some of these, the pandemic made us realize this. And, and I would say that 
some the, these could be one of the uh, uh, the themes that stick beyond the pandemic i mean two years three years on the line also this, i mean obviously one we don't have a crystal ball but uh, looks like that is going to be pervasive because people have been reminded of that so, so thanks for sharing that and moving from learning needs and ashish for pulling you into uh, you've been waiting uh, you know, patiently and uh, and coming to you in terms of we've talked about yes what changed and the pro kind of programs and the outcomes that that got delivered currently the laid that out very well i i like the way chit maru talked of the uh, changing needs and therefore how that's changed the way we think about uh, lnd in this uh, in this environment in your mind therefore i mean and and, and obviously uh, feel free to share the way you want to structure your thoughts and experience uh, over the last one year but maybe also talking a little bit about therefore are we measuring the right things when it comes to what we need to deliver in terms of learning to our people the so the needs are changing the way we are delivering it is changing so do we need to change our metrics and probably touch upon also the point uh, chitwan also mentioned it you know we are in a 24 by 7 almost we are on zoom and teams and whichever platform you're using so we are almost always on so there were there's an element of you know when i was in the office my supervisor or team manager didn't know when i had taken a water cooler break you know i i Except not for an oxygen break, as people call it, or I've gone for coffee. Today, everyone knows that oh, Sunit's offline. So what's he up to, <laughs> right? So there's a little, little, little element of the you know the office has re- come into my home. So about my own privacy, including data privacy for that matter. So maybe touch upon a couple of those points, Ashish, as you share with us your thoughts. So thanks, thanks a lot, Sunit, and uh, uh, I think much have been said by our fellow, fellow colleagues here, panelists here. So Sunit, there are there are two things which. Uh, one thing is very important during the pandemic time and all of us didn't know how to react about it and all of us were uh, and including all of us and the and the whoever is attending the webinar uh, the the conference all of us are worried about our own well being first that are we first going to survive this covid are we going to survive with the job uh, and there are two biggest uncertainty all of us carried in our mind where irrespective of where, whether you were a shareholder whether you are a senior management you are a cxo or middle manager junior manager everyone was going through the same phase and the world was at an equal level feel to that extent just to just to cut the story short what at the and we realized that uh, in the in the first 25 30 days or two weeks three weeks itself we realized that there is huge amount of uncertainty which is there in everybody's mind and how do we cut this uncertainty in that so what we did is 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 that we announced in the company is that because of pandemic nobody is going to lose job and nobody will have a adverse effect because of pandemic in the, till the, this financial ends after that what happens we we didn't know so that was a big one which we we did and which took out all the uncertainty from from everybody's mind and that's where that's where the the uh, the ball start rolling uh given the scenario of of that and i'll come back to on the learning need what we did and and how the metrics in changed uh we at a at a sar group is a multi dimensional business it's in a it's in a battery power storage and consumer appliance uh, uh, electric vehicle b2b e-commerce etc etc our all businesses have been growing around 30 40% cagr over last few years this year itself we are growing 30 with the same pace so we haven't taken any hit in the business and that's the single reason where the when the category has grown by 3% we would have grown we have grown by 40% in the market share uh, in in the in the growth from the last year because we build a purpose in at, at that point in time is that see look the reality is that you can't go out but the reality is also that the, the, there is a consumer sentiment there's a need to fulfill so there will be somebody will be passive so what's your what's your need is that uh your your insecurity about your your losing job or your 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 having an adverse impact on 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 your profession has been taken away com- completely so that you 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 rest uh uh, uh you you be in in the in in peace first of all that brought a lot of sense of ownership and passion in the in the organization because look uh and we said that whatever delta or whatever hit has to be taken the hit will be taken by the shareholder not by the employees that's that's number one principle that brought a lot of sense of and that made our life much simpler to bring in lot of things in, in that 
Uh, in fact, one of the largest change management programs we launched online. Uh, uh, and classically, if you look at it, it's a very large sales and distribution organization with the multi geography. Uh, if you do any change management within the sales process, et cetera, we launched the biggest change management program in sales and distribution called Nai Disha. And it was completely done, done online. In my 20 years of an experience with all large FMCG financial institutions, I, I had never come across any implementation which was done online. And with the lowest start of, of the employee. So we just changed the method of communication. So what we did is instead of we realized no eight hours, it's very difficult for you to consume. So we just broke it into two, two hours of four sessions, et cetera. We kept giving them a lot of any, whichever method people wanted to consume, we gave the information. So if you had to give a snippet, we give the snippets on, on WhatsApp. You want it on our own platform, we give it on our platform. So in that sense, we used all methods to communicate and we didn't actually think that uh, 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 which method will be useful, which method will not be useful. If you think uh, uh, telephone communication is is uh, uh, is more in, uh, for a group of 10 people, if they want to be understood in, 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 in voice manner, we actually facilitated that. So we tailor made everything to, to suit the need in, in that. I did give you an example because, and that resulted into, into success. Just some of these learnings which I carry, Sunit, I think going to stay for, forever. The classical way of looking at things is that, you know, your training has to happen within uh, uh, eight hours. You know, this is the only format which will open. I think we we got to be open about open source learning platform and a closed door learning platform in a very small snippets. Uh, and you will have to, so this is all consumerization of the, of the training program. So we will have to make it like a consumer. So if you, if you launch a product in the market, if you launch a shampoo in the market, basically you do a good packaging, you see, okay, you want a one rupee per sachet, five gram sachet, I'll give you five gram. You want hundred ML, I'll give you hundred ML. I think learning has to also go through this, this phase. And that's where the whole learning function has to change. And I can see some changes happening and uh, it's it's not that people are not, not adapting to it. Uh, in the the other aspect is that people people can be only dealt with people if they can't be dealt with robots and and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the machines. So human human interaction will be important. Uh, I'll just to give you an example, we opened our office in October, we, but we said that we will only office open the office in three days in a week, Monday, Wednesday mm -hmm. and Friday. Uh, whosoever wants to come and meet people can come. There is no restriction on, or there is no force on anyone to come uh, here. The heightened uh, uh, excessive use of Zoom and MS team, MS team platform was there for first two months. Later on, we realized that it actually work happens without being being obsessively, uh, 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 you know, being being present. And I think one of the reasons why we, we could do that is that we just took out the uncertainty from mind. So everybody was focused on how do we survive and how do we how do we capture the market share in the market? That's the only. And fortunately, we are not in the hospitality sector. We are not in a hotel industry, which is which was adversely impacted by uh, by the by the COVID. So that's long and short of the, the entire story. I mean, it, I hope it helps. No, no, absolutely, Ashish. And I think uh, the point I'm looking at that. Giving that sense of psychological safety right up front helped because you know you can't get people to learn and do the massive like for instance the change program, management program that you launched with the sales force if they were think worried about their, their their jobs and I think the other part I I liked is that we the, we ourselves as a learning function as a fraternity have to change because uh, and you know we may have been thinking about these things but the COVID situation accelerated that so maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll ask you to share thoughts on, on some of that and then I'll, I'll come back to uh, Chidbanu and, and Karanjit, which is the fact that therefore going forward, you know, we, we, we've been in a way look, reflecting so far uh, and, and I'm just doing a quick time check. I think we have kind of halfway through our session. We've been doing a little bit of a back, back view mirror in the reflecting on the past and what's it been like. As you look forward, Ashish, as you look at what, what you're, therefore, what are you telling your l &D teams in, in the organization, how are you looking at, therefore, what is it that you need to focus on? What should they spend time on? I mean, one of the thoughts and one, one, of, one of the colleagues I was talking to in, 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 in the KPMG context was the fact that how, if we continue to remain socially dispersed and a lot of organizations are saying that, look, we may not come back to the 100% in office model, you know, remote working 
a hybrid model working from anywhere may remain. So therefore, our role as potentially, how do you really onboard new joiners? How do you really get people uh, to understand the culture, the values of the place? All of that, how does that, how does that work out? So some crystal ball gazing, Ashish, in terms of how you're looking at the next 18 months to two years from a learning agenda perspective. I can actually share some of live example. Actually, during the pandemic, we onboarded three CXOs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, all three interviews also happened uh, virtually at a CXO level, and we onboarded, onboarded three CX, CXOs. So it was a very different experience, uh, uh, to be very frank on, on that. I don't think so. Uh, any one of us would have been uh, would have been comfortable in any other scenario that unless until you don't know what, what suits somebody wears, what clothes somebody wears, how he or she talks. Uh, what's his body language, what's his motivation, etc. And you have to do that judgment over a, over a screen. Uh, whatever number of hours you, you, you can only see part of your body, you don't, you, you, you can't ask someone to stand up, you would like to see, see you. And similar goes in the, in the induction, because induction is, is actually, if you look at, is a familiarization process and making both the parties equally comfortable with each other. And we may not realize, uh, and, and I keep saying that, uh, is that <coughs> joining in a company is a 50% risk for an employee and a 50% risk for an employer both. Uh, because both of us, both the parties actually placing a bet on each other. Uh, and when you place a bet on each other, uh, uh, many times as an employee and all of us are an employee, we don't realize that the organization is also uh, uh, at a risk by hiring you because they're investing resource, time, effort, et cetera, everything. And, in anticipation that you'll deliver something meaningful for the shareholders uh, at the end of end of the day, and so, so the induction process, the way it happened, uh, uh, is is, uh, and I can share is that it was a little tough at this at the at the beginning is is to, to to get new people into into in in that group. But what I have realized over a period of time, see, look, this hybrid model, even if remain, but I don't think so. Any employee who is working from home will be hundred percent physically be distant from the from managers meeting today there's a restrictions of managers not meeting but even if you look at a classical work from home many firms have uh, at some point in time you do have a human interaction what will change Sumit uh, Sur Suritan I'm sure from your previous Accenture and, and the other experience I'm sure you can carry is, is that uh, the, in, the, the interaction level from the manager it's not necessary that you see everybody on an eight hour basis. That's the biggest learning all of us carry. Uh, as long as your purpose is so, what will change? Uh, and uh, as long as your purpose is there and the organization and your task is cut out very well, spread out, maybe you'll have a frequency of meeting with the managers and there will be little social social interaction besides the work which will bond the people together uh, and and that's what happens on the co co coffee table uh, discussions or etc cetera, etc cetera. i think that will happen now coming back to specific to in, in induction you may get inducted virtually for for sure but some physical interaction will need otherwise we will we will create an organization which is isolated uh, com com completely there are companies which has taken bold decisions ar around it uh, I think we'll have to wait and see how it works. I'm frankly not too gungo about that it can work virtually, but uh, uh, then we are going back to the antithesis of the human mankind and the psychological need of, of human interaction. Uh, there, it's possible your 30, 30 days first interaction can have, an, ha, can have a, a, a virtual uh, induction. But in some 90 days, 180 days, you will have interactions with, with your, your line managers and, and organization. And I think the hybrid model will only operate. I don't think so. It's 100% virtual induction is going to operate, uh, is, is my sense. No, fair point, Ashish. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we, we all are social learners. We're social animals, as, as people say. So it's, uh, it's going to be virtually impossible to, always, to, to sustain this. And, and there's a, some amount of certainty, uh, uncertainty, I would say. So given the uncertainty, and uh, Karanjit, I'll come back to you, uh, uh, some, some reflections, thoughts, as you look ahead, uh, how, how uh, should, and, and probably also for the uh, benefit of people listening in to our, our talk today, to our session today, how should l and functions and l and professionals think differently? Uh, there, there are some learnings that we've had to do perforce, uh, and, you, and you touched upon those. I, I love the point about the fact that 
you know, don't seek perfection. You won't get everything right. You know, try to get some some things right and learn from them. How how would you? What would your recommendation be to L and D functions and L and D professionals in terms of now? Given the uncertainty, Ashish mentioned that you know, we we don't know how exactly things will unfold. What should be they be thinking of when it comes to how do I look at learning needs? How do I look at my strategy? What is it? Where do I invest? Sure. So, um, and it's a very important point also. Thank you for raising, Sunil. Um, the coming set of nine to twelve months will be equally tough, if not tougher. We must be mentally prepared for that. We've just come out of uh, a negative GDP as a country in terms of domestic consumption. We are sitting at positive zero point four. We should be grateful and thankful for that. This is the macroeconomic context. At a business level. the business priorities and the models will also undergo change to address the changing requirements of the setups for an l&d professional understanding where is the change happening and more importantly why is the change happening is very important because when a business transforms itself the business may not get enough time to communicate so quickly with all the stakeholders so the key thing is to have a very robust partnership with all the stakeholders to understand how is the need changing and as we speak the needs are still changing we all are driven by targets by objectives and everything my recommendation is please do not be surprised if the targets or recommendations change overnight that's the world we live in every industry is going through a startup phase even though an industry might not be in a startup phase or might not be called a startup might not be in series a or series b of funding they might be well beyond series c and hence forth what is more important is how do you see the change how do you respond to the change from your heart or from your mind and how do you react to the change these are things which employees usually look up to the lnd team to say that everything has changed overnight how is the lnd practitioner going to help me to support me in my journey to perform so a lot depends on how does the change imbibe by itself within the lnd practitioner so let the targets change let the strategy change it is all going to change it's it's a given right how do you handhold people and more importantly how do you handhold yourself the emotional state has to be balanced with the mind saying that now this is what i want to drive so in the next 9 to 12 months the hybrid model it's all a function of responding to the environmental changes tomorrow an employee comes and says and this has happened to us in last 3 months that i really cannot work through the internet i need to physically go and meet up with people because that is what my dna is all about right so wearing a mask and sanitizing hands everything that's a given everybody does that right but how do you attune to that mindset saying that you, you are open to change but don't expose yourself to risk because when one person moves out you are exposing not yourself but others also known as customers to you so to balance it out is very important so we are facing situations now wherein we don't want to be comfortable in a current state because this current state is not going to last for long and the demands from the stakeholders especially the investors are really going high i mean if you look at the quantum of investments that india is receiving from or through fiis is immense which talks about lot of scope for the indian set of businesses or mncs also operating in india so how do you respond to that pressures are very high from an lnd point of view every business is looking at lnd specifically saying i have this new requirement i am onboarding you as an lnd now you figure out how you want to do it to the workforce you need anything please come back and tell me i have faith in your entire structure team and setup now it is for the lnd team to give and reciprocate that faith and hope so lnd has to partner with the business with the customer has to understand the financial impact of each and every action gone are the days of saying that i have done this lnd program 
gone are the days of just saying that this is my pre and post analysis in other days where lnd says you know i have done let's say 2 hours of structured engagement across a span of 5 working days let it be 20 minutes or 25 minutes per day however however the breakup is with this this is how the needle is moving for the business and for the customer so the business must see this that's very important so i'm not talking about tom toming or bragging about your own self what is more important is for the business to feel it the business will automatically see it in its results so whether it is customer metrics and by the way customer metrics are the most influential metrics whether it is through facebook or through any other social media channel which nobody can manipulate it so easily on a relative basis therefore when the business gets the comfort that these are the only three things which lnd does so keeping it simple right driving it in an accountable manner and more importantly third one is how open and transparent the team is so if i don't know anything as a lnd practitioner i just go to the business and say i have this issue this is what is coming in my mind is this the complete set of looking at a solutioning or is there something more to it this is where the business says okay here is somebody who's trying to be open about it maybe he's got two or three box tick mark we he needs help in another three to four tick mark so can somebody from let's say for example a supply chain or a finance help him out because lnd is no longer lnd per se it is about the entire business in fact in one of the lnd programs one of our uh, middle management uh, you know employees came back and said i do not know how to negotiate with so and so people can you guys help me out so right. is he referring to a negotiation skill or is he referring to the business aspect of negotiation it took us a 3 hour conversation through a similar medium to figure out what is the person is talking the about the guy is an expert in negotiation because that is where the person spent 18 years reaching to that level mm. now to understand the nuances we had to partner with a very different team for the first time called let's say legal and nobody has a legal background so when we got in touch with legal legal knew it everything in and out so we said okay now how do we bring both of them at the same level and that was mm. an immense learning for us i mean think no. about it yeah and an lnd guy who is connecting with the legal team for the business arriving at a simple you know platform it's it's rather challenging to make the to make things simple but this yeah. is what happened and the guy negotiated it so yeah. today lnd is not only being looked at at least from our point of mind is not only looked at as somebody to drive learning programs it is looked at saying can you help me to drive my own solution it's becoming more than just learning and development of the trend. i think yes. great examples karan ji thanks for the specificity yes. i i think I, i need to move on in in just a time but i think two takeaways uh, learning teams themselves have to show that agility and maybe come out of their comfort zones that's one takeaway second a multidisciplinary approach i mean the example that you gave on negotiation skills and and i i go back to what akil said in his in his address in his opening remarks i think very important for us to know the business intimately but i mean we can't sit in an ivory tower and say oh, i am a learning expert you tell me about the business we need to proactively be able to learn that, that business i'm not going to do the customary closing thoughts myself jitban who i'm going to put you on the spot to say that okay so therefore how ready are we as a lnd community as data professionals yeah and in context of india karanji talked about the fact that growth is coming back it was 0.4% because it was a low base people are saying it's going to be 11 13% so clearly there's going to be a lot of demand and and you know the, the maybe it's not as lnd today all of us are having to help the organization prepare the workforce for managing this growth or managing and 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 again in the midst of all this uncertainty how ready are we and if we are not ready what are some two or three mantras you'd like to tell the the audience today in terms of how to get ready chitbanu sure sure uh, uh, sunit and uh, i just wanted to before i share my closing remarks i wanted to very quickly go back to one of the points that ashish made i think there's an important message for the entire community not just the lnd fraternity not just the 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 people practitioners but even the business leaders i think the conviction with which uh, the organization was able to go back to people and give them the assurance that you will not face the brunt at least in the immediate future i can imagine the amount of comfort that must have given and i think this is another way of 
attacking the problem at its core not at the surface so my my you know heartfelt thanks for passing on this message and for me as well uh, you know the realization that attack the problem at, at its core see what's most important for people and solve that first so thanks for that and moving on from there uh, sunita i honestly think it's a journey and, and you know the industry cuts across such length and breadth i do not know if i even have enough visibility to say uh, how ready are we as a community or as an industry but i think it would be safe to say that uh, you know we have progressed and we are somewhere in between and some of my own learnings and what i can pass on as suggestions are i think as follows i think first of all the entire learning and development journey has to be lot more partnership driven between uh, the people and the lnd practitioners uh, and why am i saying that i think it's lot more important for us to get that buy in given that we have paucity of time we have paucity of patience and uh, i think there is tremendous anxiety all over uh, so we need to get a lot more buy in from 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 our audience on what learning needs are we addressing how are those learning needs connected with the business deliverables that they are themselves committed to and hence can we ruthlessly prioritize that rather than having a very broad learning curriculum here are very few you know uh, strains that we will focus on and we will deliver excellent content and excellent programs around it so not just doing that but i think having an equal partnership from our customer groups from our people who are audience to these programs are very very important second important thing for that comes to my mind is i think content is king and this is being realized a lot more in current time there has always been anxiety and and, and some mixed emotions around uh, you know the quality of trainings that get delivered by and large and i think that gets uh, significantly more highlighted in current times we cannot today afford to have anything which is suboptimal because we anyways have so few opportunities so for us as a community and as a team to doubly be reassured and review the quality of content and only go for the best even if it means we have to spend x times more is is a lot more important and i think the last piece that i want to touch here is the angle of technology i think today uh, there are a lot of platforms there are a lot of tools and solutions available but how do we stitch these platforms together and how do we give a seamless learning experience across the life cycle to our employees plays a significant amount of role on what's the overall satisfaction and the roi levels so i think lot more effort is needing needed in 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 st in stitching this together and giving our people one seamless integrated experience through the, through the process i'm sure there are lot many more uh, points but but right now these are two or three important things from some of my recent experiences that come to mind sumit but overall i think with optimism with resilience we will come lot more successful out of this journey that i am absolutely sure of so absolutely chidbaru very succinctly put um, i mean very 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 pertinent points and i think i'm sure the uh, the, the audience listening in uh, our colleagues listening in will will, uh, will benefit from those i i just want to uh, thank all of you clearly uh, the, what the while the pandemic had its social economic health impact there there it has given us uh, a lot of food for thought and a, a lot of learnings and some which will uh, go into the future and clearly what the exciting thing i personally feel picking up strands from all the, the what three of you said is the fact that today uh, we don't have any excuse to say that we are not going to deliver i think we we have all the content we have all the delivery platforms and today the business is actually pulling us and to come on this planning table and and sit there as a trusted advisor to really shape the future with them so thank you very much it's exciting times ahead Uh, I'll probably close the session with those remarks. Thank you so much, Ashish, Chidvanu, and Karanji. It's been lovely, you know, hearing your thoughts. And uh, over to you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so thank much, Mr. Uh, and thank, thank you, you to our panelists for your time and sharing your stories and insights. Thank you very much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving forward to our next panel discussion, which will talk about LMS. choosing the right delivery partner and we have with us a stellar panelist again in this session as well welcoming on screen karmishta mitra chief learning officer access bank mr pankaj khaniwale vice president and head of training future generally we also have on our panel mr nitin thakur lnd head jindal stainless moderating this lovely session is ashima ori managing editor bw legal world So I welcome all of you on screen. Welcome, Ashima. Hi, Kathy. How are you? So nice to see you again. Same here. So I can see that our panelists have also joined in, requesting all our panelists to please uh, switch on your camera and mics. 
warm welcome to all of you. I think I'm not able to see everybody. Uh, oh, I'm able to see. Hi, this uh, is Pankaj Kamdevan. Yeah, hi, Pankaj. I'm able to see Nitin also, but I think I'm not able to see Karmasha yet. Hi. So, um, I think we'll um, uh, wait for Karmasha to join, and in the time being, uh, we would just uh, carry on, um, you know, uh, introducing ourselves and uh, taking the discussion forward. So thanks, Khyati, and uh, a very warm welcome to everybody, the panelists and the audience joining us today for this discussion. I think, um, you know, uh, today we are here to discuss uh, human capital transformation and in the post-COVID era, this becomes even more pertinent because uh, what we've seen in this era is more um, you know, we've been more focused on digital transformations and uh, carrying that forward have been our people at the very center of it. So, um, you know, when we're talking about today's topic is learning management system, we're in the L&D side of things. Um, so uh, just an opening uh, statement to the panelists that, uh, as we all know, companies, they say companies who invest in employee training have 24% higher profit margins than those who do not. It's one of the static, uh, statistics we hear about. Now, the learning landscape is continuously changing. You know, advances in technology have played a huge role and e-learning programs have become a necessity. And as the workforces in many companies become increasingly virtual and globally dispersed, l &D takes center stage um, in building values-based culture and a sense of community. In fact, in the post-COVID times, some important factors of consideration for people are values-based, sustainable enterprises that contribute to the welfare of society. That brings me to another question that, uh, you know, when we're discussing people and things may have you know, not remain the same as before COVID. How are we looking at these systems and what are your industry insights? So I would first go around uh, and ask Nitin if, uh, you know, uh, he would like to, you know, if Nitin, you would like to share with us what's happening in the industry? How have people expectations changed? How is the workforce reacting? And what are your thoughts on these systems in place? I, I think, uh... Everything has changed a lot when we talk about this part of learning and development and in the other areas too. And now it is much easier for the learning and development people to sell a business case. Now it is much easier for people to adapt because now the change has made them feel that they have to adapt, there's no choice. So this is the golden era for, I would say, all those things that we've been talking about more than 15 years now. So I still remember uh, sometime 2016 when we were working on a project on blended learning. I'm talking about 2006, sorry. So this is the golden period and I think it is really good from the perspective of our customers who are going to learn more, who are going to be better and be much, much stronger as a professional in future than what we've been learning and been. Go ahead. Uh, I lost you in between there. Uh, I'm so sorry for I couldn't hear your uh, last sentence. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so Nathan, yeah, uh, you know, like you said, a lot has changed, and maybe even going around and asking Pankaj now that uh, what has been your um, experience? How have things changed? Of course, things have changed uh, at many levels, and uh, something we cannot really um, put into. Uh, you know, any kind of uh, metric right now in the sense, but um, overall, how are you seeing things change in terms of uh, the whole ecosystem? Yeah, thank you, Ashima, <clears throat> and thank you, Nitin. <clears throat> um, as Nitin also put in, that uh, a so, lot has changed. Ashima, and this uh, is... There's a mic. Am I audible? Is my mic on? I mean, uh, it yeah, is on, but audible. are you audible? Yes, yes. You can hear me, right? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, agreed that it is a golden era. There had been mixed responses from the industry. I would say that uh, it's a two-edged sword because we have seen um, initially, uh, you know, a little bit of resistance was there to immediately uh, cope up with the situation and then learning took precedence. I think uh, 
uh, in the first uh, lockdown itself when we saw people you know connected throughout and uh, everyone was talking about only learning because suddenly businesses realized that uh, the business transactions might take a little more time from the customer's side so learning is the area which we can immediately work upon and uh, in fact you all must be knowing that um, on various social platforms uh, the learning or the lnd vendors they were very active you take linkedin you take any other platform and you will find that these people were constantly connected with the customers and they were proposing so many things so many new tools which were being uh, explored and lnd suddenly became a strategic point i am not saying that it wasn't there earlier but uh, the digital learning became a strategic point for companies to utilize that time which was available with the employee uh the commute time majorly in bigger cities was being utilized for uh, learning and development um and the learning and development teams across industries particularly in my industry where things are intangible we are constantly you know trying to have the human touch we were at a loss as an industry we felt that uh, we were constantly you know talking about meeting people using digital platforms only to take appointments and further discussions would be on face to face uh, appointments that scenario was completely gone so people were grappling initially there was a there was a, a feeling of being lost in the game but training came to the help of the people so lnd really had seen a time where um, in fact i am happy to share that uh, the adoption level of our lms increased many many folds which we have not seen it was an unprecedented move people were connected right from the morning on the lms tool and they were also exploring newer ways of connecting with us and learning more and uh, there was a huge response from the from the from the employee side as well as from the intermediaries i also um, uh, trained the intermediaries so there was a huge response although uh there had to be a technical uh, know how shared with the teams so that it becomes more effective the eagerness was felt but uh, that know how was uh, to be taught to be discussed and that is where uh, companies which could do that uh, came out as winners a uh, very uh, great point there pankaj that um, you know generally one would think that uh, you can uh, uh, you know take a horse to the water spot but you can't make them drink it but Absolutely. the fact that you're able to in you know infuse that energy in people to take up that um i'm sorry i'm hearing uh, karmishtha uh, i would just see if karmishtha is joining yeah uh, welcome karmishtha uh, sorry we missed you at the beginning uh, now that you connected i'll come back to you shortly after uh, to, uh, concluding no, my sorry about that little confusion no no Bye. not an issue <laughs> i'll be there right now so uh so yeah pankaj uh, um you know a fair point there that um it's it's nice to see when organizations and people in the organization respond so uh, heartwarmingly to these uh, lessons now um very quickly moving to karmishtha and then uh, you know going around asking the actual question on choosing the right delivery partner karmishtha what has been your uh, experience in the pre and post covid era where uh, how are people interacting with these systems and what are the changes you are seeing yeah hi so i think uh, you know suddenly systems has really sort of definitely taken over our life and the way i really see it that uh, i know how to put it i think you know we used to earlier say work is worship now i would like to possibly feel that uh, you know technology is something uh, that also needs the same kind of attention or maybe devotion from all of us to really make it work make it because it can really make our life simpler more beautiful so that has been personally my discovery it has given us agility it has given us productivity it has given us balance of life and work and it has helped us to innovate and create a lot more 
And, you know, currently I'm also uh, taking my, let's say, team or across teams in the organization on the power of digital technologies. And I'm really building those awareness across functions and businesses, including our own. And you have to see how people are getting energized, how they are uh, feeling creative and innovative, and how they're raring to go and contribute. And to me, you know, the biggest thing is how human beings suddenly are looking at their jobs as not jobs anymore. It is actually a possibility and an opportunity to unleash their creativity, add value, the excitement, the energy is huge. And I believe that's also happening because people feel now um, it also gives them a certain sense of control to do things their way, uh, which was very difficult to do in a non-technology and non-digital era. Mm, you know, you just had to be a 75, 80,000 people bank. Um, it just suddenly feels that we can reach out to everyone and whoever has whichever responsibility they can create a higher impact. So I see this distinction at many levels, at a, at, a, at a heart level, at a head level, at an action level, at a mindset level, at a capability level. It has tremendous impact. That's what I would say. Uh, thanks, Karmish. Actually, uh, that's a, you know, a good revelation that uh, people are now more visible in organizations of those size. And uh, that actually, uh, for uh, leaders, it's, um, you know, uh, an added um, sort of connection now that they weren't uh, seeing before. And I think that is leading um, and, you know, taking it from there that uh, how are now uh, these systems uh, being chosen? How are you now, uh, I'll move to Nitin quickly. And then, uh, you know, Nitin, how are you in your industry now choosing a delivery partner, you know, considering the changes that we've heard across the room? What is it that you're giving precedence to? And in view of what you're hearing from your people, um, there is, a, a, you know, there is a new uh, acceptance of learning and development growth. People are excited to learn more. People are more visible which is why I think uh, they're even more eager to grow. So uh, what are your, um, you know, uh, take, uh, I mean, uh, points there? Sure, Ashima. Uh, so uh, like been added already that there has been a transformation and we can reach out people and learning everywhere and we kind of help them when being lost situation was there. I think that this is an important question, how we select our partners, how do we go expand our hands and legs with technology like Shamishta talked about. So I think I can share a small instance on it. So Sarmishta and I have worked earlier and she'd been my mentor. So this is about 2012. Okay. And I was working with Rockwell Automation as an Asia Pacific head and we had to finalize a psychometric tool. Like you want to finalize today the LMS partners to the knowledge partners and to the EAP partners. It was exactly the same situation. And I reached out to Sharmishta being my mentor those days. I asked her, can you recommend me a tool a psychometric tool that I implement in Asia Pacific. And she said that you have this tool, this tool, this tool, this tool, this does this, this does this, this does this. But you got to go back and do a comparative analysis and find out what suits your organization the best. So I think it is not uh, that which one is better. It is about that comparative analysis, that grid analysis. It's a scientific approach and not uh, just a momentarily approach and l &D people are very well versed when we select big partners, we do it. It's the same thing, but it's complex. Why I say it's complex? Because my search of these partners uh, had to really make me do it differently. I had to reach out my friends in the industry who are working on a similar level in different companies, told them, you must also be doing a research. I'm also doing a research. And with the help of a lot of people, then we were able to put up a strong comparative analysis to understand what part is to be served where? Because we don't have to think that one solution will fit all. We have to think of personalization and there's no limit. Yeah, that is just a beginning. Yeah. Go ahead, and, uh, I, uh, A good point, uh, Nitin, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you're choosing your partners, you have to do a comparative analysis. But, you know, they say that uh, companies, um, you, uh, you know, generally learning strategies are not aligning with these systems and business goals. Uh, that's also at the focus uh, when you're choosing your partner. So 
just to understand your organization a little better, at any given point, how many people are we talking about taking these trainings? And uh, if you could uh, just lead us with some example and numbers so we have a better perspective on things. Sure. So the imagine total number is about 15,000 people and there is some part of which are contract full-time employees, some part of his management cadre and management cadre and in other cadres, there are further categories. And all these categories, all these levels are to be served differently. All these customers have different needs there. So that's how that, that is the scale that we're talking about. And we are a manufacturing organization. And typically in manufacturing, training has an old history, it's compliance, and it relates to man hours, man days, a lot of forms, a lot of submissions. And on the same time, bringing in a new thinking of ensuring a business impact with everything that you're putting in. Because in training, we invest a lot of money and that is pure profit. And penny saved is penny earned. So if I go ahead and spend a thousand, uh, hundred thousand dollars on an intervention, imagine, and it's work doesn't work, rather invest further productive man hours, think about it, how much sales had to be done to get that profit or pat of $100,000. So it is even critical than that. So I'm investing pure profit. So that's the reason I think with that kind of a scale, uh, with that kind of working around technology is, is a bliss. And we always talk about that this is better, that is better. And I love to talk about that. Our fight is with ignorance and that we have to understand it. I'm not talking about ignorance of, uh, of leaders or employees or middle management. It is with everybody, everybody. You meet people all around you. How many of you know, you know who are studying continuously and working continuously, building continuously? There's an ignorance we have to fight and it's just a beginning. Go ahead. Thanks, Nitin. Uh, I hope that fight carries on. Moving to Pankaj. Uh, Pankaj, what are your thoughts on uh, the same question that... Uh, once uh, before we begin, we'd like to know your uh, industry size and the people that you're uh, talking of uh, and uh, with numbers. And then knowing that uh, how are you choosing your delivery partner with that in mind? What are the things that you're looking out for for your people and uh, in these delivery systems? Yeah, as an organization, we have, uh, let's say, 2000 plus employees, but our associates, the intermediaries that we talk about, the channel partners are uh, very, very high in number, uh, let's say 25,000 plus, and they keep adding. So if we tie up with a bank for bank assurance, suddenly there is an uh, upsurge of, um, you know, the number going up by some thousands. So we have to reach out to all of them because uh, as Nitin also mentioned that the fight is with ignorance. So making people aware and then engaging them and then ensuring that the productivity goes up. So that becomes um, the initial challenges. So reaching out to them and uh, as they say in advertising that um, conveying an idea from one point to another is as important, as important as having the idea in the first place. So the technology tool is extremely important because without which we have seen that the reachability is uh, it cannot be achieved in a very short span. And today we are also, you know, racing against time. So the faster you reach out, the better business you can assure. And uh, that is one part when we are choosing the LMS partner, I mean, the, the digital tools. Uh, second is the adoptability. How fast that system can adopt to the environment, to your uh, type of industry, is extremely important. There are many LMSs uh, vendors are available who have expertise in your field. For example, in my field, insurance, there are many uh, people who have expertise and they understand the business very well. Uh, third thing is the scalability because every now and then you have to scale up your uh, systems. So how fast and how easily, seamlessly that can happen so we have to look at that scalability part uh, in detail and we have to constantly look out for partners who actually deliver that. So our vision cannot be for a year or two years or three years. It has to be even longer. Although I understand that technology changes so fast that we can't have a horizon of more than three years. But still, uh, that has to be in mind how fast you're going to grow uh, as an organization. And industry is also, I mean, the regulator is absolutely 
pro digitization everything is being um, you know uh, nudged and prompted by the regulator also that you know how important it is for the customers uh, that the insurers are completely digitized and they reach out to uh, the customers in the shortest span and how um, how easy it is for them to understand our terms and conditions because we are in a very strict legal industry and um, reading the policy wording puts you to sleep i mean it is i am sure none of us have read the policy wordings completely not even our refrigerator instructor booklets so so policy wordings are um, very difficult for a common man to understand inside the company we are working on a project to simplify the language yeah we call it b1 language as the european um, nomenclature so we are working on that to simplify the uh, language of insurance also and to reach out to the customers so that the customers don't get lost into the fine print yeah. and it is very important for us because um, you must have heard people talking about insurance industry having a lot of uh, fine print and some hidden clauses and then when a claim occurs they try to you know show you all that um, hidden yeah. clauses they come up but that's not the case it is all there but the only point is that it is not understood by the user and it is not understood by the policy holder so this technology will help out uh, in reaching the users very fast making it simple and also very engaging because we have seen that the video based uh, uh, learning has actually engaged people so well and we can do a lot which the print cannot do which uh, maybe even when we are discussing in a classroom also we require these tools to help us actually show this the last thing i would also like to mention is the integration because the system the lms has to integrate with your internal systems so well that it throws up uh, in real time all the data analytics and everything that is consumable and is used for a better uh, you know user experience so um, that is all uh, which, which we look at the lms partner Uh, thanks for sharing that pankaj quite an in depth uh, on uh, you know uh, point of view and that it, uh, then what i'm hearing is scalability agility all of that obviously comes along when you're choosing a delivery partner moving to sharmashtha now uh, uh, what i you know uh, we understand now that those are the things that uh, anyone would be wanting for their organization and knowing uh, the scale of your uh, Uh, organization would you just uh, also um, you know share with us what are the other kind of managing uh, sorry learn uh, lms uh, learning management systems that you have uh, what is it let's say i was floating an rfp what is it that i want you know from these systems and how are you choosing that yeah so you know i think uh, choosing the right lms in my last i would say five years experience um, ashima is possibly one of the toughest job and why is that because there are lots of promises you know which which everyone one makes but uh, and and i think everyone the vendors or the partners they're very large some of them and they really created some very good products but i have realized it always tends to fall short of the organizational expectation so what many organizations who have scale now have started doing you know let's say if we take the example of accenture etc they've actually gone ahead and created their own elements because they have the tech support they have the digital support they have the money to invest they've really gone ahead and, and some of the best experts so they've gone ahead and created an elements so you know ideally that possibly is an ideal solution but affordability is not going to be easy mm-hmm. so we have to make choices so uh, i recall you know my md wrote to us and this was my second or third experience with lms so 8 years 12 years back in in when i was with op we actually created our own system and i still believe that was the best one so far so in my earlier company before access we again you know had a little bit of challenge but anyways coming here again i got the same question from md and i'm like now here it comes he says is the current lms good enough should we not buy a new one so with little bit of prudence that i have so far so i discussed with him and then explained to him that boss whatever you buy it's going to fall short 
so it is important to look at lms as a as a system which can support all the basic functionalities don't expect too much but be prepared but buy an lms which is agile enough to allow you to layer it a little bit so today i'm putting in a data layer so that i can use ai and data science because we're a large organization we have to and you know get that right and then also uh, you know a content and a tech platform so that i can offer people the experience so lxp the learning experience is becoming important the data science is becoming very important to be leveraged to lms and i'm saying just use it as that lms to be leveraged that means you have to add those layers otherwise you create your own system if you if you really want the whole world in one lms or be prepared to add on uh thanks sharmisha actually pointing out uh, the fact that um, you know if you're going to customize it uh, have it in house and if you're going to outsource it you're going to have to uh, have uh, certain challenges with meeting your own expectations uh, i think it would be fair at this point to look at uh, some of the challenges or the you know uh, pain points uh, that you are facing uh, i'll take this across the room to start again with nitin uh nitin if uh, you had to state one problem that you face uh like sharmista mentioned it's about uh, falling short of that one thing or maybe two what would be your experience um and what is it that you you know then want to um eliminate going forward sure uh, so sharmista also said one very beautiful thing that technology technology will keep changing you will keep adding on and and that's what it is it is we are thinking about our customer so earlier the intention maybe many years was just that we train them and compliance should be managed or we train them some skills should be learned and slowly we kept increasing we talked about behaviors leadership and we are going fast but now the reality we are realizing that everybody has unique needs and then they will be engaged when they can really feel that it is value adding to their career they are enjoying and they can expand whether it is through innovative ideas whether it is extending the jobs and things like that so today my problem is solved by probably my category it would be that it is it ai enabled would it match my employees job description to the best practices in the whole world and give them would it be able to give them a precise learning path in a year would be able to give them choices to understand that how they need to take the mentorship how they need to take the projects so i'm not thinking that give me online learning i'm thinking i can it give my employee online projects guidance also mm. so that's the day i'm thinking and a year down the line or two years down the line i can promise you i'll not be thinking this i'll be thinking something else mm-hmm. and again maybe there would be some new technologies coming so like shamista said that she has been doing this with five organization so i can easily say that she would have done 10 times this exercise of getting collecting and knowledge and everything and i can assure that every time she would have done it her answers and choices would have changed because her inputs were changing today is the time to understand that our customers are our employees and all that they want is their career great work environment and all the those things that put them in the highest potential state to work Yeah. and it is our job as an hr to provide that whether it is the great work environment whether it is rewards whether it is learning and learning is such a beautiful thing that it creates certain chemicals in your brain that you can't stop being happy yeah. if you learned bicycle or you learned the car you can remember you when did you learn the driving a car what is the feeling of that freedom imagine the same freedom a kids get when the kid would learn to walk instead of le- instead of walking the kid would run because of the joy of learning <laughs> what so, a thought seriously that's <laughs> all that i think is there go ahead please yeah i mean uh, learning is a beautiful experience and uh, i think um, it couldn't have been said better so thanks uh, for sharing that nitin yeah so now. the challenge i think are continuously changing today's challenge is i need to help my customers with the with a career and development yes. and it has to be solved for example my problem had been from almost last last 8 or 10 years i can easily say and that is that how do we get our employees that counseling that what is good for their career can i do something where managers are dedicated enough to spend that hour and tell them that what should be that one year learning path unique fruits at all no there's review happening there's 360 degree happening 
but today technology can solve it and i think that's the obstacle we are solving today and it will keep coming the obstacles will keep coming and it changes with time and i think you're very prepared for those obstacles so moving to uh, pankaj uh, pankaj what are the obstacles that you are seeing in your uh, line of view and um what is it uh, that you would uh, what would be your defining problems you know statement right now uh yeah if we talk of the challenges i feel that you know uh, the challenges are there from the user perspective quite a lot because we when we are uh, the lnd people and the technology people when we feel that we have created a fantastic product and it is going to you know um be at, quickly taken over by the users and they they going to like it very much it doesn't happen that way. so the adaptability is a problem it's a challenge how people perceive it is more important than how the maker the producer perceives it so technology platform can be wonderful uh, there are uh, there are lmss which are like netflix in lnd so they are uh, so seamless and so you know beautifully designed but how does the user look at uh, any lnd uh, lms so as nitin very well articulated saying that learning is a joy i completely agree that joy the learner has to feel through this technology and the user also has to feel that it itself the learning coming to know something today is a joy and that message has to be communicated well with the with any lms partner so i think that the first challenge is adaptability adaptability because not many users immediately go on the platform and they start appreciating it and continue using it it could be you know there could be a spurt in usage and then it goes down until and unless you do something beyond it so continuity is extremely important in this the second challenge and uh, i feel that uh, the technology partners should also um, appreciate that it is not just the medium that is so important it is the message which which has to be extremely important and the message should not be considered as secondary it has to be equally important if not more but then the packaging should not be given so much prominence that the message is blurred into that whole process and the user gets a uh, hook to the uh, to the packaging rather than the message uh thanks pankaj yes sir uh that's a great outlook to have uh, the uh, you know um all that uh, shines is glitter and gold and but uh, you are looking you're losing you can't lose sight of the message itself uh sharmesh coming to you uh what would you have to say about some of these internal and external factors that we've now heard uh, you know across the room uh what has been your experience in terms of what's plaguing the uh ecosystem right now and what are the things that uh going forward you'd probably like to sound some of these tech partners of that um you know this is what we don't want in our uh systems so i think what we definitely uh <clears throat> do not wish to do is um uh, you know requiring to guide them what exactly we need so for example i think the tech partners uh should not, their job should not end in just creating a good lms you know today for example content management to lms is a very very important area of focus uh then reporting how do you really manage reporting so that you can really hyper personalize learning you can support the business with the right information and take the right decisions becomes again very very important how do you really do the uh, you know not only the content management but the content authoring uh, by subject matter experts hello so how do you really hello. spruce up hello. you know hello and now there's another new world which has come hello. up hello hello i'm so sorry we have uh, yeah please carry on children yeah and now uh, there's a new world which has come up which is the world of digital learning right and the world of digital learning not only about uh digital classrooms right our lms is just can't hold all those things right so today in our bank we have to we are now integrating microsoft teams with the lms but mm -hmm. our lms so we had to go back and work with them so i think like us while they had to do apis with some of the content providers 
now it is important for them to look at the integration with a zoom or with a microsoft teams or with uh, you know any other uh, platforms which organizations would be using for virtual classroom sessions plus uh, <clears throat> many lms's partners struggle with having a proper mobile app mm -hmm. and the struggle with ios is perennial <laughs> right the apple systems so yeah. how do you really create uh you know the lag between a mobile app and a web based app is still very large right and they've not been able to crack the code most of them now this is a very very because our world is becoming mobile yeah. and you are still in the web era how is it going to work so so that agility those changes and as i the mobile based the the how do you hold the integration with partners then lord all of us are going to move into i think with nitin and pankaj both talked about um, you know and hi nitin so nice to see you here uh, wonderful so uh, yeah yeah so uh, you know digital content is going to be the order of the day so we are uh, looking at digital assets creating our own we are looking at social learning platforms we are looking at mentoring coaching platforms you know are happening at the click of a button there are multiple dimensions you know which are coming up so how do you really make their back end robust enough most of the lmss fail the moment there's pressure uh, they they fail to deliver so they have to really take this four five important elements reporting content management content authoring support integrating with digital learning uh, solutions integrating with digital platforms Uh, all of that lms are a huge opportunity you know to become a one stop digital solution you should be able to run your webcast uh, mm -hmm. through your lms solutions but i think we are not thinking big enough uh, the partners have a very large opportunity to think big and uh, grow well thank you for uh, you know shining light on those gaps shamita i am uh, very certain that uh, we'll be able to through this uh, dialogue uh, bring those uh, things forward for our uh, tech partners to take note of and uh, thank you so much uh, panelists for joining us today and sharing your wonderful thoughts and experiences uh, we hope uh, learning continues and we all keep experiencing the joy of learning as nitin said so on that note thank you so much for joining us today and uh, so grateful for your time Thank you. Thanks, Ashima. Thank Thanks, Nitin. Thanks, Pankaj. So nice Thank to you. Have. Thank you, Ashima. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you, Ashima, for steering that lovely conversation. We've heard some great insights from our panelists, and I hope all of you have noted down the key takeaways from it. We'd love to hear from all of you on which have been your key takeaways from the panel discussion so far. If you have any questions, don't forget to send it to us as well. Moving forward, we are going to dive straight into our next panel discussion, which will talk about adopting immersive education. We have with us on this panel Mr. Niranjan Singh, Managing Director, Nature Minds. We also have Srinivas Ladwa, CHRO Reliance Nippon. We have on the panel Shabin Aram, L&D Head, TVS Credit. Also on the panel is Ashish Kapoor, Talent Lead, ENY. Moderating this session would be Mr. Ruhail Amin, Senior Editor, BW Business World. Once again, reminding all of you to join in the online conversation. and uh, tell us which are your key takeaways if you have any questions for our panelists or speakers don't forget to send that to us as well moving forward let's talk about adopting immersive technology and let's bring our panelist on screen a very warm welcome to all of you Thank so you i can. believe uh, our moderator is uh, going to be here in a bit So give us a moment I will be right back with you. So welcome all of you and uh, Shabin may I request you to 
just take the lead here if you don't mind and uh, start a conversation about the topic which we have here which is adopting immersive education and uh, ruhel will be joining us in few seconds itself sure um i mean i think there's no doubt about the fact that uh, immersive learning conversation uh, education or learning is uh, the way to go but you know uh, being a practical business person and having moved out from line and come into training and flip flop between roles i think the first thing as any lnd person we have to really answer two questions one what's the objective what's the outcome that i'm trying to achieve and two what's the best way to do it because you know sometimes technology becomes a little bit like a new toy or oh, is the new gadget the new new uh new technology oh this is fantastic and you know just like any other person we may get carried away the the but the most important thing is to do that which is right for your audience and right for your company and right for achieving the learning outcome so that's uh, that's that that's what i think that is important from the learning perspective lovely lovely to hear that um ashish would you like to throw some light on the topic i'm sorry you're on mute right now thanks kathy i think uh... Uh, i agree with what shabin was saying and i think uh, the business perspective is as as important as probably uh, something that is coming in from a, a lnd professional uh, it's a very vast topic and i think uh, it's also fairly fairly new i think uh, to begin with i would only want to say that we need we need to remember that learning is a choice you know it's it's not something that uh, uh, you know you put down throat of someone and i think the pandemic and the entire year has given us uh, the entire occurrences you know resulting the pandemic has really shifted the role of a of a trainer from a teacher to a facilitator i think that's uh, that's what is changing and and i feel uh, you know what we are focusing as an organization uh, now is a knowing and doing gap you know between the knowing and doing you know because it's earlier it used to be fairly simple a presentation skill training probably would uh, a trainer would come in and say okay you know these are the four things i would tell this to the individual and the individual know, will know about it but is the individual really doing it you know and i think uh, with the with the immersive learning coming into picture i think that gap is definitely being filled in maybe we'll talk more about it uh, you know uh, while we are there on the session but i think primarily it's about filling the knowing and doing gap for wonderful me. wonderful just before i come to you we have our moderator who's joined in so ruhel would you like to please take the proceedings forward no. uh thank you so much i'm so sorry i i got a little uh, late on the session i was just trying to do the tech part you know the new new thing uh, that we're coming to terms with uh i just want to go uh, in the first uh, i mean i i i heard what you said mr kapoor i i want to go to miss narang with my first question uh, uh what are the broad uh, you know first i want to begin with the broad learnings uh, from the last year if i may just put a little context to this conversation uh just, just give me a little sense of uh, what have been the key takeaways for you uh number 1 adapt number 2 adapt and number 3 adapt uh right. measure and keep adapting as you go along i think that's the that's the biggest learning for us in the last uh, 8 to 12 months mm-hmm. okay okay mr sridamas a question to you the same question i think uh i would say uh, and i'm speaking in context with my industry and uh, how right how human touch was a very critical element of it and how it had to migrate from that to a technology was very significant uh, so exactly it would be adapt but it was uh, a radical adoption in in that sense and people had to accept it as way of life or uh, yeah you know we we didn't know how the business could be conducted uh, for 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 this period so adapting right. and adopting technology uh, was right. was a lifeline for uh, lifeline for us uh, across right. not just learning but i would say business uh, fundamentally right right uh, uh mr kapoor if you can hear me uh, i just want to uh, come to you with this often uh, dealt with question that uh, you know the types of content that we find in lnd uh, you know often uh, uh, how uh, how quickly they need revision because you know uh, the scenario around us is changing so fast we are living in a 
very fast paced world i mean we can't wait for another six months even six months a long period to 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 kind of make a change how often do you revisit what all do you take into account while building a new content uh, for for lnd uh, want to understand your views on this sure sure rohel and i think uh, i would also go back with what uh, shini was just mentioning uh, you know of course uh, adapting is 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 something which has become a norm uh more importantly i think now we have to revisit the entire concept of how do you curate a program you know where does the need flow in from and i think earlier uh, rohel my thought was that why we need revis- revisiting something time and again was because it was done fairly in isolation you know we thought a program is good and therefore we'll put it together and therefore we'll put it across to the business i think with right. the involvement of business now especially uh what i have seen at least and and we have an organization which is about 22000 23000 people big and right. i have seen that involving involving business timely uh when the curation of a program is being done definitely helps us not revisit it at least in the in the next you know probably at least year year and a half you know because of course right. things are dynamic things keep changing but i feel the real need has to come into place which was not happening earlier and right. uh, the fo- the firm is of course uh, most of the firms are paying focus to to that now and i think that is definitely bringing about a change so i would say depends on how much involvement is is coming in from business and eventually you'll have to see you know is it doing your your company and the individuals any benefit if not right. definitely it is time to to revisit and and, and change something about it. right right um uh, uh, mr shavin i want to come to you with the same question uh, how do you look at uh, you know revising and building a more contextual content in lnd uh, what all factors do you take into account how often should that be done for best practices i think the first question is that uh, is it a new requirement or is it an old requirement uh, mm-hmm. so i think the first question let's answer the first one first which is if it's a new requirement and right. i'll give you our own example so at tvs credit mm-hmm. uh, suddenly when the business stopped you can't sell loans you can't collect you can't step right. out your people can't step out you can't call hr can't 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 right. so how do you so the question really was how do you keep the leadership team engaged that was the question that was given to us right and how can we really leverage this time to leapfrog our own learning now we had a couple of mm. options that were available but i think we we just answered the same two questions which i said earlier who helped before you joined which is what are we wanting to accomplish and what's the best way to do it so mm. to, if one was to say no let's send them tech talk so let's do something else it would have been yeah it would have been great but i think we approached it very differently saying they all learn something right because they're leaders can they learn from one another so what we did instead of sending them curated learning and stuff was say okay topic of the next four weeks is even as simple as listening skills bring to the table whatever you have studied whatever you have learned any book any snippet any tech talk any podcast anything that was like an aha moment for you and let's share and you'll be surprised in 3 months i think we covered four topics dealing with ambiguity listening and the richness with which people left and the behavioral shift that some of the leaders were able to make because i, mean, I wasn't standing up in training there was no formal trainer training there really was no trainer everybody right. was a trainer and everybody was a learner and i think the fact that we uh, that we did it like this made a big difference to us now let's right. answer the second right. question which is mm-hmm. existing existing requirement so we all mm-hmm. we, have, we have a battery of about 8 and a half thousand people who go knocking on customers doors and say pay up because you haven't paid you haven't paid up your loan no mm-hmm. i mean yeah we had some learning content but you know everything has shifted here you have covid you can't go and knock hardly on the hard on the customers account so how do you really collect from them so what we did was we told everybody we sent an sms mm-hmm. message to all our collectors saying right. anybody who has a great interaction with a customer tell the customer mm-hmm. i'm going to record this call mm-hmm. so they all audio recorded and sent us that now that became learning material for everyone else so that right. that says you say what's the outcome i want i want contemporary learning what's the best way right. to accomplish it are there are so many people out there who are doing a brilliant job how can i really bring that in together so i think if we approach everything from those very two simple basic questions what do i want to accomplish and what's the best way to do it 
And yes, under that best way to do it, people who are driving learning have to keep themselves abreast with the latest technologies, the latest methodologies, talk to you know visionaries in the field of leading to see what are the various opportune options that I have available. And then I pick and right. choose the one that's most relevant for the outcome. So that's my answer to your question, Rahe. Right, right. Let, let me uh, go back uh, to me, Mr. Srinivas. Uh, so last uh, 12 months have been a dream run for every, everybody who thought about digital, who was talking about digital. They got enough space and everything and more. And uh, tell me, and we always wanted and believed that it is immersive. It is the next thing to do. Has it also broken some uh, uh, misconceptions, I would, if I may use the word, you know, about digital? I mean, in the sense, when you say about immersive, uh, has it been, has it created that immersiveness in your view? Uh, what has been your uh, observation on this? Absolutely. So thank you for the question. Uh, I think, um, well, the way I see this is uh, leadership got a root shock about uh, some processes not being enabled in an environment just like COVID or any other. Right. It, it basically triggered many of us as leaders to think about situations, not just the past, but in the future, uh, of how do we uh, reduce the risk and reliance on the non-technology elements. Uh, or the other way to put it is, how do we increase the reliance on technology to eliminate some of the risks that, that, that uh, these situations like COVID create? And this COVID could be one scenario. There could be many other disruptions that could come our way. So right. it basically created a space for, I would say, digital entrepreneurs to experiment and bring to table various technologies, uh, including immersive technology, which was being experimented even before. So I don't think uh, it started after or uh, after the COVID thing. It was there much 2007, 2010. I know it, it started and it accelerated the process for us. So right. how do you use these technology tools to enable learning? And for us, uh, you know, we hired thousands of people every month and uh, they are not from the insurance world. They need to be taught about how to, how, how they understand the insurance product and then essentially pitch that insurance product into the market. Now, how do you train them effectively when you're, they are sitting thousands of kilometers away from, from you and the unit, which was the branch uh, mm -hmm. where the training really happened was not, not right. functional. Right. So, COVID was just one scenario. The second is, is there an opportunity to actually create a paradigm shift on training or on learning, I would say, not training, learning so that these right. individuals are able to build those skills more effectively at a much higher pace uh, and that is potentially possible. I wouldn't say it's definitive at the moment as we are experimenting at a much accelerated pace through these immersive uh, learning technologies. Essentially, right. all it is saying is that it's bringing in technology, it's bringing in data science, it's bringing in uh, learning theories, uh, and it's basically saying that a brain stimuli uh, of, of many, many things uh, beyond what is taught in a classroom is much better. And there is a theory that if you're really doing the muscle reflexes of certain types repeatedly in a VR environment, it tends to right. have a much longer muscle memory or a uh, neuron memory. So I think these experiments have started. I think there is a big future out there, especially in some of the ind uh, industries. Let's take medical sciences, surgery, uh, you know, uh, pilots, uh, right. even, even the Walmarts of the world, et cetera, where some of the skill that needs repetitive practice in a safe environment. Uh, this is going to be the uh, the way uh, where people will be trained in a safe environment where there's no loss, uh, both financial as well as life. Uh, right. There are experiments that are happening where these technologies could actually help build uh, soft skills uh, over, over a period of time and uh, whether it is when I when I say soft skills, I also mean selling skills or collection skills, etc. Where 
in these virtual environments you can actually talk to or talk to a customer you can create a simulation around that and right. uh, reinforce certain ways in which you respond uh, to to the external stimuli and that theory says in some of the research that has been done in institutions like stanford and all that there is a higher higher learning and some of the models have predicted a better success with with the uh-huh. uh, with we are in 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 the space right uh mr uh, i want to just come to you mr ashish that you come with a different perspective here with a i would call it a 70000 feet perspective in dealing with a cross section of organizations uh, in the last 12 months uh, what has been your uh, kind of assessment of the adoption of immersive uh, technologies by companies as far as lnd is concerned sure i mean uh, and and you're right it's uh, it's a massive uh, field out there i mean in the sense uh, uh, you can call it about uh, i mean we we ar vr mr now something of of a different sort er is coming into place i mean uh, uh, it's obviously it's it's fairly costly i think that's the first and foremost thing any organization that is thinking about it should realize that you know the cost impact is something that you have to first measure uh yes the experience that it brings in is really really different and and really immersive but uh, you know and and i think everybody understands you know uh, what virtual reality is what augmented reality is mixed reality yes is is probably uh, more beneficial because it brings the best of both practices that's what uh, it essentially does um we tried our onboarding uh, for some time you know using uh, uh, um, uh, augmented reality virtual reality you know headsets and and i and i think we saw the difference that it brought in it was a pilot of course we saw the difference that it brought in because people were then you know all of us would realize that onboarding probably is not the the most intuitive the, the most engaging thing that an employee goes through but you know uh, uh, what we realized was that people are actually going review, uh, you know looking at policies uh, reviewing things they were moving hands in the air of course you know when you look at it from outside but uh when they were wearing those vr headsets they were actually trying to see okay this is how my office is going to look in you know you can actually give them a virtual tour sitting at one place of how the office is going to be i think these are some of the things which uh, of course like i said the cost impact has to be evaluated so for an organization you know which has their own in house uh, development team i think that's the most important piece because it's not the not the uh, physical assets which would which right. would uh, bring the cost up it's actually the development so if you have something uh, you know where you can develop some of these uh, 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 tools and technologies you know to actually use on those vr headsets that's i think the is the key but i i really think uh, it is where the future is heading no doubt uh, uh, and with the pandemic i think that also shows how do you how do you engage somebody sitting at home uh, you know and i always feel uh, uh, shini shini was was talking about some of these studies from stanford i think uh, uh, harvard was doing a study recently that whatever solution that you have a cohesive solution will always be better solution than a solution that comes out from an individual so uh, right. that's what you know learning has become nowadays uh, where where i mean i'm a foodie so i always give these analogies with food you know i call it a sandwich approach again and uh, you know the facilitators now are are the breads you know so so you have a bread and then you have this collective wisdom and and shared uh experiences of people coming in as potatoes and cucumbers and tomatoes you know being lined up on that bread and everybody is learning from each other there and then of course right. the other bread which is the facilitator again is also trying to steer it in the right direction you know keep it controlled keep it in the right track so we don't do, don't go off track so i think uh, with the technology coming into place you know of course uh, there's no no replacement for a physical uh, one on one discussion and sessions you you know in a classroom but i think uh, the immersive technology is definitely helping us uh, go that route and and bring some of those experiences right. uh, probably in a more optimum way uh, that's that's what i feel great uh, mr shabin to you uh, my next question uh, what should an organization consider when looking to adopt mixed reality learning opportunities what would you say uh, i'm going to sound like a broken record and take a page out of ashish's book and what he said um one what are you looking to do two what's the best way to do it and if ar vr is the right cost then so be it but you know if i look at topics there are things which are lost 
for example, lost civilizations, the history of the company, things which you can't take the person back to, but you really want to immerse them in it. Great mm -hmm. place for AR, great place for virtual reality. It, things which like for children, for example, and I'm, I'm not keeping it only restricted to uh, adult learning. I'm saying learning per se. Uh, mm -hmm. A child is trying to understand the concept of 3D. Very difficult to understand unless you can give them that sort of feeling of, oh, this is what 3D means. You know, that aha light bulb moment. Um, so, so for some of these things where it's a, impossible to do it. Right. But it makes sense to do it. Then you should use ARVR. So that's one practical right. insight. The second one is that I, I really believe that, you know, sometimes we go over the hill. Uh, in terms of we don't assess the cost impact because it's like a fancy gadget. It's a new toy. Everybody else is doing it. My CEO will come and tell me, oh, I saw this VR, you know, being done. I saw this AR. Why are you not doing it? Sometimes I have to push back and say, no, 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 boss, you know how much it costs. Uh, so then he'll be like, okay, yeah, but, you know, we should do something in that space. So sometimes right. as an L&D head, I'll talk, we also have to manage budgets. So I think one stuff which is very difficult to understand unless it's AR, VR, two, which is lost, which can't be explained without that. But I think, mm. you know, we shouldn't take the word immersive as narrow that it has to be digital immersive. Right. I think that's why a very critical it, point. Yes. Yeah. Why can it not be immersive immersive? For example, if I have to tell somebody, listen, you have to go and sell a tractor loan. Okay. And the person has never seen a tractor, never been in the mud, never been out in the field. They are, let's say, from a tier B uh, you know, tier two town, they've studied, they've been educated, but haven't really tilled the field, haven't felt the soil, haven't smelled right. that wet and dry smell. They're never going to be able to sell unless I can send them there. And then borrowing what Ashi said, that sandwich approach, I really like what he said, you know, there's that experience that you create, but guess what? The experience alone is not going to give the learning. The experience will give the experience. For the learning, you need somebody to set the context and say, listen, when you go there, here are 15 things I want you to look at. Right. When they come back, you ask them, what are the 15 things you did learn? How do you think you can apply this back at work? So those mm. conversations are what make immersive learning become learning rather than just being immersive. And I think that right. would apply to whether it is digital or otherwise. So I think digital models are great. I think we should look right. at where physical model is the best because we have to be cost sensitive. And, you know, next two years, let's forget it. Everybody's going to be cost sensitive. You know, people are not right. going to give you expansive budgets. There was time when you had it. Now you don't. So how can we create that same immersive experience? Um, does it necessarily have to be digital? What's the most cost effective way to do it? But the operative word is it must be effective. So that's right. my right. take on what you said. Right. Uh, Mr. Srinivas, you want to add to it? I think I like this uh, definition of like, you know, not narrowing down. I mean, the, the, what she spoke, uh, immersiveness. I think it should be, uh, you know, uh, it should not matter whether it's physical or virtual. Would you like to add to it before I ask my next question to you? No, absolutely. I think uh, uh, that has uh, always been, been a, a, a great way that... Uh, uh, you know, she mentioned about, say, a tractor uh, selling executives going out there, or it's an insurance executive who is uh, chaperoned by a manager to go out there and say, look, this is how you sell. So you demonstrate that, you help them pitch that and, and create that learning uh, while you're on the job. So in, in our language, we call it the joint field work, uh, where people uh, actually spend time, uh, but they are in a protected environment because the manager or their supervisor is along you know, along with them. It's it's a it's 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 a more uh, regulated industry. So you one has to be very careful in terms of how you sell, what you sell, and selling could be right. a serious issue. But absolutely, I agree. And and I think immersive learning uh, is, is is has been there in the past. Uh, it has right. seen its uh, results. It's one of the most effective ways in which uh, you, uh, people learn. Uh, I think right. it's slowly and gradually transforming into a digital. Uh, footprint as well. Uh, there will always be a balance between uh, the digital and the physical world. Uh, and then right. cost point is very right. important. Uh, okay, I want to begin my next round of questions. We have another uh, 15 minutes to go. So I have uh, a lot of questions. And I want to go to the maximum. Uh, starting with you, Mr. Srinivas, on that note that, you know, gamification has been used as a tool for engagement, immersive 
if I may call it, non-agnostic at the same time. Uh, how has gamification contributed to an organization's learning methodologies in your way? Is it being used to uh, this leverage properly or not? Are there some areas which need to be addressed? Your view on that? So gamification has been used. I think the LMS uh, tools that are now the digital platforms which are there, uh, they use a lot of the gamification to make uh, make it more interesting and uh, make it a little bit more uh, uh, you know, active and reactive and engaging for, for an individual who is playing it. Some, so you have some games and you're trying to achieve an objective and then that makes it much more real or uh, a, a sort of a competition or some sort of a game for the person. And that's probably the word gamification. Uh, having said that, I think uh, that is just an enabler in my view. Uh, it, you can make it exciting. You can make it uh, a little bit more uh, uh, interesting. Uh, but the core of learning needs to be viewed from, from whether the person has learned uh, the skill, the dexterity, the skill, or the, the fluency on, on what he needs to do or, 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 or sell or what, whatever skill that you're talking about. Uh, it's, I, in my own personal experience has been mixed about it. Uh, so I would say uh, it is it is a good, interesting way of doing things, uh, but I would still f focus on uh, what what, what uh, Shabin said. Uh, uh, you know, real experiences, uh, physical experiences. So while while we do a mix of uh, the gamification and tools and LMSs, which which help learning, uh, but we do not uh, end at that. Uh, our primary and core is basically those individuals going out in the field and experiencing a sell selling process or a, a collection process or, or whatever those processes are. Right. Uh, Mr. Ashish, if you can hear me. Uh, uh, okay, Mr. Shabin, uh, I want to go to you first then. Okay, okay, he's here. Uh, you, do you want to add to this gamification bit? And also, uh, this is my question, which I'll also come to everyone with is... Uh, you know, there's so much of learning around on the open net. Uh, why would people also go and take this course? That's also my next question, which I'll begin with. But Mr. Ashish, with you first, the gamification bit, and then if you can address my second question. Sure, um, uh, sure, uh, Rahul. I think uh, a very interesting point. I mean, I really am intrigued with the with the gamification concept. I think if you if you think of our generation, and you know, henceforth all the generations that have come in. Gamification, right. uh, I mean, we've all grown up on two things, uh, uh, cartoons and video games, right? I mean, that's been our, our childhood. Now, True. both have a very different aspect to it. So uh, uh, gaming, gamification helps us with gratification, right? Of right. competing, of winning. You know, that's where video games sort of come into play. Uh, right. uh, and also, I think we need to understand that the human beings typically enjoy decision making. And with mm. games, you know, you're able to make those decisions and take ownership. So, you know, going right. left, right, jumping, or even not jumping, you know, taking any of these decisions are decisions that you are taking. And therefore, uh, humans in general like them. So uh, I feel, uh, you know, the combination of these two, uh, the, the optical bit, uh, of course, and the decision making bit, I think this definitely helps in making a lot of things which are not that interesting. So, you know, let's say uh, real, uh, knowing about risk management uh, mm -hmm. or, or uh, IT privacy, you know, some of these things which are just basic when you gamify some of these things, you know. So, so we have a training where, you know, you're competing with a hacker. Uh, uh, so each right question sort of takes you probably to a closer place of making sure that the hacker is caught. Otherwise, the hacker wins. You know, just that right. simple little thing <laughs> of, yeah, you know, just, just making that little change makes people uh, a bit more interested, a bit more intrigued. And that's where I think gamification definitely is contributing in, in the learning methodologies in general. You know, because of these right. two things, which is uh, the, the video game concept and the, and the cartoons concept. So the optical bit and the decision uh, making. Right. Uh, Ryan, uh, sorry, so if you would want to, uh, you know, just repeat the, last, the second part of the question. So my uh, thing was that this open net and content is uh, abundantly available all over uh, 
for for people to learn i mean why should they also come specifically to a solution that you are being offered when they can also kind of find their ways no oh, that's very interesting and i think i'll go back to what i was saying earlier you know the facilitator teacher versus facilitator concept now uh, and the knowing doing gap now how i would suggest that the gap can be filled in is only by one thing which is coaching and uh, the reason is again the same you know in a presentation skill training you would be told four things okay you need to uh, have explicit uh, control on on language uh, the content has to be great you know how do you present yourself in terms of your dressing up and everything that is fairly fairly important so so everybody sitting in that room in that classroom or a virtual room knows that these are the five things you need to do now that's knowing now right. as an individual what do you do uh, or what exactly is that one part of thing that you need to work upon so that you can improve can only come in with the second bit which is coaching the coach is able to then go back and tell an individual okay uh, other things are fine probably you don't work hard enough on the content bit and therefore content is something that you need to work hard on i think that is what i would also correlate to the 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 web you know there is just so much information available that people are often not really sure of how to go and pick what exactly is it it's all about knowing on the web uh, the, the doing bit is missing so all of us know that exercise is great for us you know that's mm. knowing but how many of us do it i think that's the gap that i'm trying to fill in and with coaching the best thing is that you know it's not that difficult the coach doesn't need to know it all the coach just needs to ask the right question and i think that's why i feel more and more people need to be taught how to be a great coach uh, how to ask those right questions and i think that is going to help uh, increase number of coaches that is going to help people learn more and focus on what exactly is it that they need to do right mr shabin would you like to add to it and also for you uh, do you see the lines of hierarchy uh, blurring in the process of creating a culture of immersive learning so yeah lance your last question last because i didn't quite get it uh, okay. but i think i want to circle back to the gamification bit and i completely agree that one can't get sucked into gamification for the sake of gamification first question is what am i trying to accomplish over here what's the learning bite i want to leave many years right. ago i read a research uh, from the us uh, army and the us army has been they are the masters in gamify you know forget about virtual reality ar we are babies in front of them they've been using it for much longer than we did and one insight that stood out for me was that when you gamify there has to be a balance between excitement or reward and learning if you have too much excitement the learning will go down and i think all of us have seen you know we are all used to doing a recap quiz in the morning a two day course right. previous day you have to recap you do a recap quiz nine times mm-hmm. out of 10 the recap is out of the window it is all about how many points did my team win and they mm. argue with you and they'll fight with you because what's happened is that the focus has become so much on the pointification and the winning and the excitement that the learning is not even tertiary so i think we have to keep that at the back of our mind that we have to make sure that it's the right balance and i i like what ashi said which is you know he said the i think he said something about the decision making and that was the second piece that came out in that research that the learning comes in the struggle of the decision making like mm-hmm. that whole thinking of that whole analyzing and then if i get it right i get that little bit of aha and then there's a little bit of tip that comes either from a human or from a bot or from the feedback from the screen something like that so the learning in gamification is going to come from the decision making and so therefore if i want to do an 80 20 rule i would say 80% of it should be on the struggle so that the person remembers and it's a memorable learning for them and yes 20% gratification because i think we all need gratification so that's my two penny bit on gamification the second is on gamification is i think uh we become as adults very caged in a little box we all go for these you know classes which say okay what's the instructional design you have to follow you have to have gamification gamification must have intrinsic and extrinsic rewards but if you go back to play and the theory of play in children did you know there are 17 different types of play that can be used by people mm-hmm. to devise different types of learning for me that when i read that it opened a whole array of things to say guess what if it's about reward fun learning can we really explore in those directions and look at those 17 18 different types of play 
maybe not will be applicable not maybe not many will be applicable but some definitely will give us some new insights and some new areas to work on so right. those two points on gamification make sure you balance energy and excitement and learning and second is make sure you keep learning yourself to see what other different types of play can i use it it isn't always about points and stars and music and thumbs up and those sort of thing um your second question was about uh, why should i learn from uh, why should i learn with an expert not from yeah. uh, very simple there's information and there's misinformation and there's both types of things on the internet and i think adult learners sometimes are not cautious of it and sometimes they are um even if you look at for example simple things like should i drink water while i'm exercising so simple you will find completely different views there will be some who say you want to lose weight don't drink any water some will say you want to lose weight you have to rehydrate your body so you have to drink water now what's the truth the answer is the truth is in between so somewhere you need that moderator that coach that ashish talked about to say what's right for me in my context of this job today my con tomorrow my context may change and in that context something else may be right but in this mm -hmm. context i learned eight things which one is the one most relevant for me what will up my game so that's on the second right. one and and help me understand your third question a little bit better all right so i was asking that uh, do you see the lines of hierarchy uh, blurring in the process of creating a culture of immersive learning absolutely so in tvs credit uh, we run something called cross fertilization of ideas and mm -hmm. even while uh, before i logged into this course uh, we were discussing how to devise a plan for uh, people who are in the finance department and are planning heads right uh, they are quite well all said and done I, i mean i have no no i have no disrespect for finance but finance is finance and they sit in a castle sometimes and they love their models but it's sometimes right. so dissociated from reality and right. sometimes business planning will come up with ideas which is well it's nice it opens our insight our mind to new insight but sometimes it's still dissociated from reality so we said what is the best way to get these people to really understand the business so we are going to mm -hmm. be doing a three day what we call field immersion so the planning right. so the planning head and the business and the financial planning head for the for that particular product will go all the way right down to the sales person how does he say right. half a day in sales and they'll be given a checklist here are 15 things they're supposed to observe then they will go for you know half a day to the collections person then half a day to the sales person's manager half a day to the collections person's manager half a day to the regional manager just immersing themselves in their lives to see how can i as a financial planning head or as a business planning head how can i become more relevant to them what have i missed out in this picture because i was so busy with my black box and my excel that you know my my modeling can become even more effective to them simple things like what's the dashboard i should send to this person early in the morning so that they can be more effective in their first one hour uh, right. today they have a dashboard but is that really being used if it's not being used is it because the person doesn't know about it is it not useful does it doesn't doesn't not have the fields that they're looking for so i think we we really need to look at who can i learn from where can i learn from and then the lnd functions role is to create that box so that that learning can happen they can pick and choose the right elements i can learn from anyone i can learn from anywhere i can learn at any time but then somebody puts the box together and says here's your lovely thali of how to do your job better so that's my answer on the third one in terms of blurring of lines right right uh, mr srinivas i also want to hear your views on uh, you know this uh, breaking of these hierarchies uh, are you also uh, do you agree with what uh, ms shabin said i think uh, absolutely uh, the hierarchical issues uh, have lost a lot of uh, relevance or context in the new world uh, i think anybody can reach out to anybody today uh, anybody can speak to anyone in the so uh, you know the engagements have become uh, two way there is no there is no formal communication there is a mix of formal and informal communication uh, so not not only from an immersive learning perspective i think the organizational hierarchies have shrunk in a very dramatic way in in the new world context not just because of covid but essentially the way businesses need to be run be successful so uh, does the the immersive learning part of it essentially we are looking to 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 extend to ashish's concept of saying coaches now 
how do you for us for example we are about 20 or 1000 people uh, how do you create a large number of coaches who will consistently be able to coach them into a journey now right. that's where probably some of these uh, tools could come come useful and that's where we are piloting one one example i would give you is we have a concept called licensing every uh, advisor and an employee who sells is is required to be licensed now mm-hmm. as an industry for us we have about uh, 5 lakh 10 lakh people who get licensed every year now mm-hmm. can the industry for us or the uh, the regulator create a uh, an environment now i'm using a yeah you could say a vr mr or a vr mr or a augmented reality where the licensing process can be done pretty much sitting out out in our branches or in our offices and we don't rely on traditional methods of going to examination centers and and giving the exams there uh, and and that exam needs a verification follow up and it takes 10 days to get that result etc uh, mm-hmm. and also we are not taking it uh, back in terms of a backward integration to say how do you build modules and learnings in this environment so that the success rates are higher now this is a very core business process for us because right. like more licensing means more revenue and our ability to sell more uh, i think that those spaces is where these concepts uh, i hope will find uh, more relevance the cost dynamics will also change and that's the more important part so when you have an industry forum or a regulatory forum that that drives it the the cost will go down when you're talking about 5 lakh 10 lakh people in a structured environment uh, and and it can be maintained at a at a certain standard because it's it's constantly evolving so i would say absolutely right uh, right a space it With- has space in uh, Right. We have the last less than 10 minutes left. So I want to quickly go uh, with my next round of question. First to you, Mr. Ashish, uh, uh, tell me, how do you uh, define the new normal of L&D? Though you touched upon it earlier as well, but just want to revisit it. And what are you, your predictions, the kind of trends that would be there for the next maybe 2021, 2022? Well, sorry. If if on the first part, if you can just repeat, I I had a slightly uh, difficult time understanding uh, it. Yeah. Uh, what would you define as the new normal of L and D? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And of course, uh, you wanted to know what the what the next few years are going to look like. Absolutely. Okay. Um. Uh, well. Uh. Of course. I think. Uh. The the reason I was so keen to sort of participate in 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 this particular panel. uh uh you know of course uh, not considering uh, one of the reasons was the panelist uh, more importantly but uh there's so much to learn but more importantly immersive learning is is what i feel is uh, something which is changing shape of how uh, we are trying to uh, learn and and i think chain really mentioned it chain really mentioned it well it's not really about adult learning it's learning in all phases of life uh, for anyone and everyone Uh, i also manage the the uh, csr portfolio for 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 the organization and i think that uh, is where we are seeing a huge difference on how virtually now to to do a lot of this and and you know probably going and reaching out to kids uh, who are who are probably from a less than fortunate background making sure they are able to pick up learnings making sure they are able to uh, experience uh, and i think virtual uh, learning and immersive learning is changing the shape there too i feel right. uh, you know immersive learning uh, comes with a couple of benefits uh, it is a combination of visualization of course it's it's uh, there is a lot of productive engagement that comes together right uh, it is about right. creating interest uh, it is of course about improving quality of training uh, it's giving it's giving a lot of hands on experience to people but i think one of the mm-hmm. most important part is it gives the right to fail safely to a participant and i think that's what is very important for immersive learning you know you can you can give it a shot you can again give it a shot and you can keep trying till you really really come to terms you know if if you think about medical profession uh right. and, and immersive learning coming in there i mean imagine the amount of uh the sort of experience that some of these uh, practicing doctors have going to have right. much more experience you know they always used to struggle with not having enough uh uh corpses or whatever to to sort of experiment on and i think now uh you know with virtual uh, immersive learning coming into place you can they can just have their headsets and they can actually use their tools with the augmented reality and actually practice so of course you have seen this in movies but uh, it is coming uh, fairly fairly fast and i think immersive learning definitely is is the way to go 
uh next few years i would also go back to what uh, both shini and uh, shabin mentioned earlier about uh, being adaptive continue to be adaptive cost is a very very important angle i think continue to look at it uh, uh yes uh, the budgets have been shot down or cut down but you know the same amount of money that you are using in 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 procuring those hotels and 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 spaces and uh, you know making sure the entire day's plan and food and lodging and everything is then i think apart now the same money can obviously go into uh, probably making the making sure the experience of individuals uh, uh, sort of go up a notch so i think it's it's more about adapting ourselves also uh, making sure the business adapts and uh, making sure there is enough reverse uh, uh, mentoring learning that always takes place in an organization i think that is really bringing a change for us now i see right. a lot more senior people ready to learn from from their team members you know because they understand that a lot of this digital aspect virtual aspect is not something that comes very naturally to them so they know uh, it's it's much easier to sit back with a team member or subordinate and go through it rather than to try and figure it out on your own i think people are now breaking those barriers like you earlier mentioned and making sure right. that reverse mentoring reverse training learning sort of takes place so right. yeah i think uh, but, uh, that's the way to right. go great uh, mr shabin quickly your thoughts on the way ahead for lnd uh, the broad trends that would define this sure ditto i think uh, ashish i just build on what you said uh, i recently read somewhere that they now take the mri my mri if my head has to be operated they take my mri my ct scans and they make a 3d model of it mm-hmm. with all the stuff inside it also in exactly the place where it is and mm-hmm. this a surgery on my head because my head will be different from your head and the textbook's head was completely different from both our heads they actually operate on that artificial 3d model before they turn and then operate on me and i think that is taking safety to a whole new level so i think in those fields we'll see an explosion of some of these uh, technologies and rightfully so because where it's a question of risk and human life one cannot afford to take any chances Uh, the second thing i think is that obviously we have to you know cost is going to be a very important factor and therefore i think lnd has to wear a different sort of approach i was reading this uh, recent book by david epstein called range uh and it's amazing and he says that the people who solve difficult problems and he says those are difficult problems they are real world problems they are not narrow skills but those people who solve difficult problems are the ones who learn from many domains and so therefore lnd i think has to stop looking at what we learned first and start reading widely to say what can i learn from what discipline and may not have anything to do with learning to make sure that i can be faster i can be better i can be more cost effective and so those are the, you know that's i think the that's i think the new normal for lnd learning itself first before it goes out and start teaching others right right well well said and finally to you mr uh, srinivas your thoughts on it as a chro uh, you know when when i talk to the team and and we talk in the management as well i think uh, uh, in this particular dimension and and, and the co panelists have said some industries are going to take a big leap uh, in this space one so others will follow uh, i guess uh, what i would also add is uh, while some industries will follow they will need to continue to experiment so my advice and my uh, uh, you know suggestion to uh, to my colleagues around ha- has always been in my team to say do some pilots keep experimenting uh, we don't know what clicks and what doesn't click uh, it's it's a very dynamic world uh, the cost models will fall in place at some point of time when we do these experimentations so uh the 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 summary is uh we look at uh, n is equal to 1 when we talk about uh, uh an individual who needs to be trained or who needs uh, inputs uh, so it's curated at n is equal to 1 uh because it is at that level technology needs to play a, a very significant role in being able to do that level of customization keep experimenting find ways and opportunities of trying to save cost by building different business models around it and uh, you know right. that's how right. uh, industries have evolved businesses have evolved all right 
Thank you so much. A lot of uh, talk points uh, that, that we had, some key takeaways uh, right from how uh, immersive needs to be agnostic to what the future holds. Uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, everyone, for joining us, Mr. Ashish, Ms. Shabin, and Mr. Srinivas. Uh, and Ms. Niranjan couldn't join us because of another some uh, technical glitch. But thank you anyways for being on this panel. Uh, hope to see you soon. Pleasure was mine. Thank too. you, Rahel. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists for your time and sharing those insights here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now quickly moving towards our next conversation, which is a fireside chat with B. Thia Garajan, Managing Director, Blue Star, along with Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, BW Business World and Exchange for Media Group. So can we please uh, have a gentleman on screen? And if you have any questions, go ahead and post it in the chat box or the comment box on whichever platform you're watching us. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Batra. It's an honor and pleasure to have you uh, as the jury chair of the BW People Learning and Development Awards. Uh, uh, if I may say that, you know, you're being the jury chair and leading the jury, the winners that we've decided and uh, it is representative of what's happening in the industry. So uh, thank you uh, for doing the jury chair honors. And I'd like to start with you, you know, as a CEO, do you think learning is a continuous inbuilt mechanism? You know, because if you don't learn, you will not be in sync. So what do you do as a CEO to be able to stay ahead of the game, to learn new things? Uh, we'd like to know from you. Um, Dr. Batra, I, first of all, I would like to uh, compliment you and the BW People team for putting together uh, this award uh, jury process in a very professional manner. Uh, I was privileged to be part of that. Uh, I must tell you, in the process, I also learned quite a few things. That as a practicing business manager, listening to my fellow jury members, as well as the nominees, I had the opportunity to pick up quite a lot of things. So the answer lies there. That is, you cannot stop learning at all. In one of our other uh, interviews, I, I had quoted this, uh, if, you know, like uh, it is uh, Mahatma Gandhi's words. That is, uh, you, uh, you, 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 your life should be uh, fashioned in such a manner that uh, you learn continuously as if you are going to live forever. The, uh, therefore, I, I tell all my um, uh, fellow uh, colleagues, uh, employees, acquaintances, or when I go to the colleges for giving lectures, uh, the, uh, what I state is that as a youngster, please go ahead and spend. First of all, do not go ahead and uh, buy some house on a EMI and tie yourself to some kind of a life. Please spend money to go to various places, buy a lot of books and learn. This should never stop. Because that is, that is I, I believe in the principle that uh, everyone has some potential. Everybody is entitled to come up in life. And therefore, we should create an environment where people continue to learn. And today, uh, thanks to the technology, uh, unlike those days when I grew up, that the, there was no internet, uh, you, you know, it is, it's a book and the schools were the only medium. Today, the opportunities are plenty. And uh, I know you, you, you are a voracious reader and you continue to learn. And every time I interact with you, I learn. And I can tell you that in, in the past uh, 15, 20 minutes of my interaction uh, before uh, we started talking, uh, they, they, I learned a few things. Uh, it should be a yeah, continuous process. That is what keeps me energetic. You're being very kind, Mr. Chagrajan. Um, you know, um, it's called intuition. You have the intuition about making the right choices. And then you have the curiosity and by doing and interacting with other people, we do pick up things and your advice to young people is absolutely right. Invest in learning. Uh, 
you know, and books are still the best way because, you know, uh, there is a certain imprint the written word has on your mind and it stays with you. Now, let me shift gears. Uh, we are doing this conversation 11 months into Corona. The future of work looks very different than it was a couple of months back. Today, we have the choice of either being physical or being online. Uh, we are moving in a hybrid economy. What do you think will stay and what do you think will go away? I think everything is going to change and it will continue to evolve. And at the same time, my own experience is many people will not agree. Uh, they, there are a few things, uh, there is endurance. It will continue to coexist, especially in a country like this. That uh, The example I, I, I state is that, look, books are there and uh, you have Kindle and uh, you do have uh, online reading in uh, many other ways. Uh, I don't think uh, books are going to go away. Now I'm coming to the newspaper itself. Uh, people proclaimed that uh, the end of newspaper, but it is not. I, I am sure that newspaper will be there at least for another century. Uh, the, the things have to coexist. The, the, the best of the best who are the uh, digital, um, you know, I, I, my, I, I tell this to my friends actually, the, the uh, digital um, the enterprises, if you look at it, they advertise extensively in uh, television. They are not advertising digital. Uh, you look at the billboards. Uh, many of the billboards are occupied by the digital companies. Why is it so? I think it will coexist. And in that context, what uh, what is going to uh, remain? Uh, I think uh, I'm talking from India's context. I think we will become digitally uh, proficient much more. The uh, enterprises will invest in digital technologies much more. India will play an active role in enabling the world digitally. Already we are doing, I think we will uh, do much more. I think uh, the consumption will be very high. We will be on a very uh, historic economic growth. Uh, and in this cycle, you are going to find it difficult to find the talent. Therefore, uh, that connects back to the uh, BW people, uh, LND Awards itself. Uh, we are going to be on a treadmill to produce talent. And uh, for doing that, also you need digital. Yesterday, uh, we, uh, in, the, in the jury process, we, uh, we saw quite a few digital examples, how people are leveraging digital technologies for uh, importing uh, training to the people and the development at various levels. That is going to continue. Mm. Classroom trainings also will exist. I don't think they are going to do away with it. So you're saying it's not an either or, it's an and, it's a continuum. And at different points of time, maybe we may use both the available options. So the hybrid economy is here to stay. That's what Mr. Tyagrajan is saying. Now, let because it's an LND forum, it's a human resource uh, fraternity that we have today amongst us. I want to ask you, uh, what kind of skills, courses, uh, do you think corporate India needs to invest into? Of course, it depends from industry to industry, sector to sector. But uh, as the CEO of such a large organization, uh, what do you think needs to be done to be able to retool, re-equip your senior uh, leadership and people across the organization for this new uh, hybrid economy? I'm a strong advocate of versatility. The, the leaders have to be versatile. Uh, you should not be a unidimensional leader. Things will continue to evolve. Say, let's say uh, you're a marketing person. Uh, you you should be, um, you should not be an engineering goods only. You should not be FMCG only, I'm specializing. You should not be only the conventional distribution network. You should be a master of uh, e-com as well as conventional distribution. For example, I'm telling you. So therefore, uh, more you become versatile, you will be succeeding. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I am also of the view, uh, because um, HR fraternity will be 
part of this forum. Uh, I think uh, the uh, line managers uh, should be uh, sound in HR as well. HR persons also should be becoming a line managers. So the job rotation and job enrichment is important. And you should be versatile, uh, not specialize yourself. That worked at some point of a time. I think future demands that I, I, I can be, because the jobs are going to be plenty. And in selecting people for those jobs, uh, you, you should be looking for leaders who are versatile. Uh, to me, the foremost thing is that uh, how I adapt myself to new things, therefore, I continuously learn. Fantastic. So you're saying a journalist attitude, I mean, journalist meaning G-E-N-E-R-A-L-I, and picking up uh, skills which make you an all-rounder, versatile, and give you an appreciation of every function of the organization so that we are able to work together as a team. And you rightly said, HR, uh, Leaders need to become functional managers. They need to lead businesses. And there are some, I can think of Mr. Santrup Mishra, who now uh, leads a business for uh, the Aditya Vikram Birla Group. Uh, I, my friend Rahul Taneja, the uh, investment firm for the Ruiyas, you know, they both uh, long stints in HR before they uh, took on this business role. So I fully agree with you that uh, HR managers should try to be CEOs. My last question, you know, how do you think is the relationship between the CEO and the HR head uh, uh, changed in the last few months, especially in, in the Corona times, you know, because it meant resizing the organization, having more conversations with colleagues. So do you think the role of HR, the role of learning development and the role of HR in learning and development function overall gone up in the last 10, 11 months? Um, yes, Dr. Batra, before that, uh, to the last question, I want to add one more input. Uh, like, for example, um, even in addressing the gender diversity, the, uh, you know, the, 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 there are conventional thinking that the a manufacturing job, whether uh, it could be done uh, by a lady. That's, you, you will not come across in India, the head of manufacturing um, there is adequate uh, diversity out there. I, I am of the view that this is one area as a country uh, we should work as the manufacturing is uh, reviving. We should go ahead and produce leaders in those areas as well. It is, it is not, uh, there are, this job certainly can be done by men kind of. So in that context also, there is a lot of work that uh, needs to be done. Therefore, uh, the women leaders also should come forward to uh, think that I will prepare myself for jobs that are going to be scarce, jobs that are going to offer enormous opportunities in the future. So like, like, like for example, I'm saying that you will find in IT, ITS, uh, a lot of women managers are there, they are shining in their field. Banking, financial services, you find. I, I, I am of the view that there will be a lot of manufacturing jobs that will be opening up. And I think they will be equally competent uh, and equally successful in that. So th that, that's a request that I would like to place both uh, the potential employees as well as the HR practitioners, as well as the business leaders. Now, um, in the, the, the I, I, you know, uh, I am of the view, everything should not be looked at uh, from the pandemic point of view. I, I think a pandemic has accelerated certain transformation process. Um, you, uh, what was the conventional uh, HR thing? Then when I started my career in 1979, uh, it is to, the, the large part of the HR job is actually uh, handling the unions. The industrial relations was the very large part. Then it is the question of uh, HR administration. Uh, then it became talent acquisition. That is how you will go in and hire. Now, uh, India is not left behind. That is uh, the, the practices uh, that are happening here are on par with the uh, West. Uh, the best of the countries, we will be able to demonstrate that uh, India as a country has evolved in, in all facets, whether it is learning and development. 
look at uh, compensation benchmarking look at the uh, internal branding uh, employee engagement initiatives uh, it has come a long way. I, I think uh, the HR managers across the country have done a phenomenal job in that. Uh, my compliments to them. And uh, the the uh, even at at the board level recruitments, if you if you look at it, uh, the uh, there the nomination remuneration committees have evolved well. Uh, there are uh, good processes that are put in place even to evaluate uh, the. Uh, a, a working or non-working independent directors board as a whole. So therefore, um, the uh, the the process had be, was set in motion much before the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated that. Now, uh, what what is the what is the uh, what is the relationship uh, or the process? Um, uh, between the CEO and the CHRO. Uh, first of all, uh, compared with uh, the last decade, I think uh, alignment in terms of uh, corporate strategy. The, the Yesterday, uh, we saw quite a few CHROs explaining how they are aligned to the corporate strategy itself. We also learned that the balance scorecard of the C, uh, CEO uh, has a uh, few important elements are HR itself. Most importantly, learning and development was part of the balance scorecard of the CEO itself. Uh, the, the, uh, my frank view is whether uh, the CEOs uh, devote equal amount of time with a CHRO as he would do with the marketing or manufacturing function. Uh, it may differ from people, uh, business to business, there are some businesses which are people uh, intensive businesses, there he may be doing it. And uh, if uh, my my assessment is in terms of succession planning, I think uh, we have to do much more work. Uh, the uh, the CEOs uh, should be making it as an institutionalized process. There are some companies who are doing extremely well. There are many companies not. And that is one area that uh, we should be uh, looking at it. As well. And uh, the uh, the uh, but, but on the whole, uh, the HR professionals and the CXOs have managed uh, the HR issues uh, phenomenally well during the pandemic period. If you look at it, it came all of a sudden. You have to uh, cope with the business demands. You have to cope with the personal demands, aspirations of the people. Uh, I didn't see, uh, you know, a commotion and a dissatisfaction. Everyone uh, worked together, and that is why I think Indian economy could bounce back. And in 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 the journalism itself, uh, I um, I know for sure that it, it is very difficult to be uh, first of all uh, reporting during that period and to hold on to the talent. And I know how the revenues were severely impacted. And I think uh, the media industry itself did extremely well. And the advertising spends were the first one to be cut by many companies. And yeah, right. uh, I, I think we have uh, done well together. Thank you so much. I think the future is even more about collaboration than it is today. It's a collaborative economy, it's a contactless, slash hybrid economy, and it is a compassionate economy. Thank you, Mr. Tyagarajan, for talking to BW Business World and BW People. Uh, thank you for chairing the BW People l and Awards. Uh, the winners that we will see tonight are really representative of the best practices happening across the corporate India. So thank you for uh, choosing the right kind of winners, and uh, really their stories uh, will become inspiration for others. To emulate. Thank you so much, Mr. Tyagarajan, for your words of encouragement. And the future belongs to those who are agile uh, and who are resilient. And you're right that the Indian um, colleagues, uh, the workers, uh, everyone in the corporate uh, sector at all levels showed resilience. The healthcare workers, the government itself was very proactive and uh, I would say very, very responsive to what was needed during COVID. So we must be grateful to the, to the government. We 
you know, I think uh, the government has done a reasonably, I would say more than reasonably a good job to be able to tackle COVID and uh, with the vaccination drive in full progress and Blue Star also playing its role in the vaccination drive. We are grateful to you again for, uh, you know, serving the country uh, apart from doing uh, your business. So thank you so much. Uh, we're grateful to you for your presence and for your comments and remarks. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our jury chair, Mr. B. Thiagarajan and uh, Dr. Anurag Batra for steering that uh, really interesting conversation. I'm sure all our viewers, uh, colleagues uh, have taken a lot of uh, highlights from the talk. Moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, we are going towards our next panel discussion, which will talk about LND assessment tools and measuring performance. On this panel, we have with us Mr. Manoj Sharma, CHRO of Arthi Industries Limited, Mr. Amit Kataria, CHRO Hanu Software, Kaushik Chakraborty, Director of Human Resources, and Anubha Batra, Director TORAH Learning Solutions, Tora Learning Solutions. We also have uh, as our moderator, Mr. Sunil Kumar, President Exchange for Media Group. I'd like to welcome all our panelists and our moderator on screen. A very warm welcome to all of you. And uh, Sunil, I'd like you to take the conversation forward. A very good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone else who's there on the panel. People have joined us uh, as delegates uh, for this session. Uh, thank you for taking time on a Saturday, uh, which could well be a holiday for several people, despite the fact that all of us are working from home but you want to feel the difference that today is Saturday and it's not any other day. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. So what, uh, and, and I'm re really happy that we have got such a diverse set of uh, panelists with us. We have got somebody who, you know, uh, uh, is from a specialty chemical company, which employs over 5,000 people. And of course, is Manoj. Uh, we have somebody who is from a top class um, uh, IT services company. And uh, we have uh, uh, a person from real estate services. And uh, to top it all, we have somebody who's uh, an expert on um, uh, learning solutions, which is uh, Anubha, of course. So uh, Kaushik, Amit, Manoj, welcome. Uh, what, what we can do is, you know, uh, we can hear about you from you so that, uh, you know, whichever way you would want audience to know about, you know, yourself, about um, uh, the place of, uh, learning and development uh, uh, it has in your organization, because I realize these are different. And uh, Anubha, of course, can talk about, can talk about the, the, the vision or the, or, or the view or the strategic importance uh, everyone should attach to LND because uh, she's she a consultant, she's a trainer, right? So uh, we can start uh, alphabetically and uh, maybe Amit, if we can hear from you uh, about your organization, you and, uh, how you look at LND uh, within your setup and in your personal view. Thank you, Amit, over to you. Thank you, Sunil, so nice of you and fellow panelists. Good afternoon, it's a beautiful Saturday, northern part of India where I'm from. It's totally sunny day and it's been long that I was waiting after winters for this season. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, Sunil, so uh, how much time do I have? I, I Usually I go overboard with the no, timing, so I would just want to check. Yeah, <laughs> okay, great. Talk about other things, yeah. Wonderful. So I, I will just take a minute uh, telling me about myself and company and a little bit on it. So name is Amit Kataria. I represent a company called Hanu. We are uh, Microsoft Store Partner globally uh, and uh, around 800 rock stars across the world. Uh, and we've been uh, partner of the years with the Microsoft from the 90,000 partners in the world consecutively from last three, four years. And that speaks uh, uh, the strength we have. And it's, uh, it's almost, uh, we are the Numara you know, in uh, cloud computing ever since seven, eight years when Azure and rest of the clouds were coming into the picture. Hanu as a company stood front uh, and we, we did what we did to become this uh, stature today. In terms of LMS uh, and all uh, uh, the topic related today, what I feel is that uh, your learning and development tools and 
systems you have adopted actually a reflection of your culture or learning culture in the company and that's how we take it as a company very strongly and we believe that uh, you no know, culture of kaizen in ireland is very very important so that's how there are few tools SaaS services we have adopted which we'll discuss later when we go more in detail over to you sunil my minutes are over thanks thank you abhi thank you so much yeah so kashik uh, let's hear it from you uh, uh, how do you pronounce sevels uh, first let me get the pronunciation right is, is sevels correct all right sevels you are on mute uh, kashik i yeah. think you have to unmute yourself so uh, you can tell us about uh, sevels yeah. about you about uh, face of lnd uh, in your organization So I represent this organization called Savills, and uh, you know our industry is called it International Property Consulting, and uh, you know we are a 170 year old organization spread across uh, 72 countries, and we are making our foray in India for the last couple of years. So in 2018 is when I joined this organization with the mandate to build up uh, the HR organization of Savills in India, and uh, so 2019 for me was the year when we built up the team. and uh, 2020 was a year when uh, we were supposed to start working on the development journey uh, but that's when uh, the pandemic happened but that made it all the more interesting for us as an organization uh, uh, you know so i'll come to that in terms of uh, the lnd journey and the tools and uh, you know how important it is uh, at every level of an organization's journey and uh, uh, you know we represent a very interesting journey where uh, right in the beginning you know we had to get into the right kind of intervention and work very differently uh, having faced uh, a very strange situation in the second year of uh, operation in the country uh, but uh, as rightly pointed out by amit uh, you know i think it's uh, the tools the uh, you know the mechanism that an organization uh, need to follow uh, has to be closely linked with the values that the organization represents or wants to propagate and the culture of the organization uh and that's what uh, we are trying to you know do in our uh, in in sales in india uh yeah so that is it from my side as of now uh Thank so you, i think have a chance for the organization yeah so manoj uh, uh, of course we know about rt it's a listed company you do very well on the stock markets but you know beyond that you can talk about yourself and um, you know if you talk about the chemicals that you produce nobody would understand you know what they are you know some of them we one or two we may know which we use in the household but other than that we're not likely to know and partners for that or, or actually we don't need to apologize because they are what you call specialty uh, chemicals so uh, let's hear but but do tell us about uh, arti industries and uh, your role being there thank you so much uh, sunil and uh, good afternoon to all of you uh, Yes, Manoj here, and uh, I look after the HR at corporate affairs, corporate communication, security, and admin function for Arthi Industries. And uh, brief about Arthi. Arthi is about a forty-year-old company, and uh, majors into specialty chemicals and pharma as well. And uh, as a part of my mandate, I joined company about two and a half years back. just to take up the company from the people transformation point of view and so we are undergoing a massive transformation not with respect to people but across all uh, strategic areas and people growth is something uh, very important strategic strategic dimension for us and uh, from the session point of view under people growth we only do two things actually we have kept it very simple either we develop people or either we keep them happy so <laughs> these are the two fundamentals you know we are addressing and uh, <laughs> company is uh, very promising and uh, growing very fast we are onboarding lot of people uh, during pandemic we onboarded close to 1000 people and uh, yes i am lucky be to be a part of this journey and uh, currently we deploy close to 12000 people across various facilities and we are in a continuous growth so those who are stakeholders shareholders they are there thank you thank you manoj that helps anupama you know you you've had a long stint with uh, corporate if i can call them that so you can talk uh, about the, the kind of uh, companies you work for and what you do currently all in a minute okay <laughs> so hi everyone uh, my name is anupama and uh, i yes uh, quite rightly said i have worked uh, in the corporate sector for almost 16 years now 
आई स्टार्टेड माई करियर विद सरप्राइजिंगली मतलब देर इज नो कनेक्शन टू इट बट आई स्टार्टेड माई वर्क विद एज अ डिजाइनर आई वर्क विद कंपनी कॉल मैकविल इन इंडिया एंड देन आई गॉट दी ऑपरचुनिटी टू वर्क एज अ फेसिलिटेटर फॉर आई बी एम um back then it was uh, IBM Daksh yeah. so and then the transition moved on i moved to another company called EXL services i worked with uh, max life insurance so i worked with quite a few companies and i gained a lot of experience um moving while i was moving from one one organization to the other uh, a lot of value adds that these organizations have made in my personal growth and i i thank them like no tomorrow um but while i was working with my last organization excel uh i did see that there was a gap uh, uh that i could have i could cater to and uh, that is what gave birth to my company which is dora learning solutions um our organization it helps um, um help it actually helps companies optimize their human cap- uh, human capital um how we do it is we use um uh we use multiple mediums to uh, provide our services to organizations we are not restricted by a uh, classroom um or content or uh, e learning it doesn't matter to us because we have expertise in all the three uh three verticals um unfortunately when i entered the market i saw that organizations are segregated into uh, classrooms and into e learning providers and i said why why are we doing that um isn't it about uh, passing on a skill a capability developing a capability we should be doing that we should be focusing on that and that's exactly what the organization did so much so our yeah. approach is very yeah. customized and that is all what right. all right thank, thank you so much yeah so now that we know each other and uh, our delegates to have a sense of uh, where uh, you uh, people are going to be coming from now the first aspect you know majorly what we have is how to develop the right lnd assessment tool it can take a maybe a 3 day event or a 5 day event to answer this question uh, uh, or, or you know several issues of uh, harvard business review if you please uh, but we want We, we can't do that we don't have time all we have is about 20 25 minutes and we have got a few more aspects to cover so what i can do is to 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 make it manageable you know we can start with three aspects that should be kept in mind and this could be across industries i hear we uh, needn't think of uh, how, how you do it in your organization and anubha you obviously you know you work with uh, industries across uh, verticals so uh, we can you know three basic things from your experience from your insight uh that you can share about you know uh, uh, uh what's what are the three things to keep in mind when developing the right lnd assessment tool here we are talking about the assessment tool assessing the lnd needs so uh, here we can go anti clockwise and start with manoj uh, manoj um, tell us what are the three things that must be kept in mind when assessing uh, uh, the lnd needs i think in my opinion and experientially speaking uh, uh, the resolved state is very very important what resolved state we would like to see for you know for any lnd intervention so keeping if if you are uh, clear about it and uh, you know, so you can really choose or uh, create uh, the right uh, you know assessment tool so in my opinion i would really like to stick to the result state you know i really don't want to go to number 2 and 3 so the result state is something mm-hmm. very very important for me and that is what is you know everything gets encompassed into that uh, assessment so <laughs> and, uh, that is how we have built in uh, in arti especially that kind of a culture to put it a result state for all interventions and the interventions and then choose uh, mediums and uh, various other aspects related to lnd effectiveness kashik uh i have a very uh, you know di- i mean different way of looking into selection of the lnd tools uh now few things one is uh, you know i have a background of having worked in the foreign banking sector and uh, i come with lnd background you know before i 
you know, as a, I mean, from being an L&D professional, then I got into code HR to start heading HR for organization. So, uh, I, you know, one is uh, there has to be a clearly defined competency framework, you know, in place. Otherwise, you know, just coming up with a, a training calendar or, you know, uh, the different platforms, tools, uh, you know, that, that works. But, you know, in the, in the back end, if you don't have a clearly defined competency framework and which has to be India specific, having worked always on MNCs, a lot of time what happens is you just adapt what is, what is available, you know, at a global level. Yes, yeah, some of it is important. Some of it is need to be done. But to a very large extent, you need to define, you know, the competency framework for your organization in India. Okay, and that calls for a lot of work. You know, it is not something which can happen just like that overnight. You know, so once that gets defined, and then you start working bottoms up. For example, that's what we have done. You know, uh, I mean, it's been a short journey. We became a great place to work within a year. Uh, but few things, you know, which we tried doing. We spent almost a year to try and develop, you know, the competency framework for the organization, which is adapted from the values, which is adapted from the. Uh, you know, the vision and the mission statement defined globally, as well as the India organization that we want to define for ourselves. And then, you know, based on that, uh, for example, this year, we did an exhaustive training need analysis, what you basically call as a development need analysis. Okay, so once you've done that, then you devise, you know, what is it? What is the development agenda of the organization? Now, the tools that you use, I mean, today, for example, we are in a world where obviously, you know, we see how technology needs to be adapted in the new world. So a lot of it is happening on the, uh, you know, on the technology or the virtual platform today, you know, the way we have defined, uh, you know, the journey. So I think that is something important. How do you do the amalgamation of some bit of it has to be classroom, you cannot do away with it. There is some bit of it has to be virtual. And of course, you know, LMS need to be there. And most of the organizations, especially MNCs, global organizations do have a, uh, you know, LMS in place. There also, you know, you need to see what is available globally because a lot of Indian and LMS are, uh, you know, are available today at a much lower cost and it is much more powerful. Okay, so, you know, how do you do those internal selling and internal adaptation? Some of that also need to be brought in. One very important thing that one need to understand, you know, as there's a lot of talk going on in virtual, uh, you know, training. There's a lot of talk going on e-learning. You know, it's a buzzword, it's a buzzword for last eight, 10 years. But what we need to understand is, you know, the human atten attention span has reduced to a very, very large extent. Okay, so how you adapt and what you adapt is something critical to look at in the new world. I'll stop at this point of time at that. And maybe you know, as we progress, we'll have the conversation. Of course. Anubha, uh, you tell us what, what are the things to keep in mind when uh, developing the right kind of uh, L&D assessment tools? Sure. So uh, for, before I do that, I did want to make a mention, like Kaushik said, uh, you know, the attention span has really gone down. Um, uh, when we build a lot of things, we keep that in mind because that is something that we have to keep in mind when we're developing programs or any strategy that we're putting in place. It has to have that perspective in, uh, in mind. So uh, that goes with our hand. When it comes to uh, building the an effective assessment tool, um, you know, uh, quite rightly mentioned by Manoj, I think I, I completely agree with you that we have to look at the end outcome in mind. Uh, if we don't look at the end outcome in mind, we really don't know where we are going. Uh, what is the right approach to take? What, what are the methodologies we should use? So we should use, a, um, you know, we should stand back in the line and then figure a way out. Um, so the, um, what I would recommend to a lot of people is to try something where you can understand, um, uh, you know, how the entire structure is put in place. What is that you're trying to achieve? What is the end outcome in mind? And then when we walk back from the line, the next step or the next logical step is to identify the key capabilities which are required to meet that end outcome. Once we've done that, then it comes down to how the interventions can be uh, built to cater to these capabilities. So if we do this, you know, going back approach, uh, a lot of things get streamlined. Uh, finally, the assessment tools that are created will automatically be in line with the current challenges. Absolutely. Thank you, Anubha. Amit, you, of course, you know, come from IT. I'm sure you have an orientation from there where you need to train people 
you know, know their needs on new technologies, new knowledge that emerges almost like every day. You run one program and you realize six months down the line and your engineers need to know something which they don't. You know, if they don't and your business collapses, you know. Uh, so uh, let's hear your perspective, how it works with uh, you guys. Sure, Sunil, and thanks uh, pretty much Anubha, Kaushik, and Manoj covered uh, the fundamentals of all the assessments in between behind L&D. But let me tell you an interesting story and the experience within Hanu. So four or five years back, typically we were also the same company as Kaushik said, you know, publishing the training calendars, going with the schedules, publishing it, and then again, going back and implementing the way it is. But things suddenly change. As you said, it's a technology company, and we, we consider ourselves at to be forefront of innovations and creativity, whatever we do, be it even HR function. And I'm really very proud of saying that me and team always look for new, new approaches to automate the HR function fully. So four years down the back, uh, we, we completely change our PMS. Uh, we move to OKR. And OKR is something you know, which is very objective. There are only three, four OKRs uh, per uh, rock stars, uh, per employee. And then what we did is we aligned our L&D to resultant of OKR. And how it happens, we will cover later on. But I tell you the how assessment worked for us is we kept only two things in mind, only two. We, we did not want to make it complicated, nothing, no fancy about it. We saw that there are only two things we need. One, the platform and the assessments we wanted to has to be engaged platforms. So whatever needed to be done about that our rocks are engaged in our LNT platforms or the assessment related to it has to be there. Second, we established that what outcomes we need and then we reverse engineered the same thing. So let's say just an example that as of uh, you mentioned that our needs were different. Let's say with one batch of any interventions LND, we need X certification to be done. Let's say example, AZ101. And then we kept in mind that this certification for this group has to be uh, you know, achieved after the training. So what we implemented is that we, we went back, we took the steps, and then we included this in our assessments and delivery modules. How we did it, what model we, did we choose, what platform did we choose, it's a different story altogether when we cover later on. But simply, there were only two things. One, we wanted to be engaged, and then we reverse engineered the outcome-based approach we wanted for our tool as well as the assessments. That's how it went for us, Sunil. Fantastic. I mean, this, this sounds very interesting. So a diverse set of uh, uh, ideas we heard, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, no, so you, 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 know, you assess the L&D needs, you develop the right kind of tools, you did the training, you, you did the development part. Uh, you know, uh, you being the heads of your organization uh, for, for, for this function, uh, so there's no one who's going to kind of, you know, evaluate your own performance. But you, I'm sure, uh, have ways to see whether the tools that you develop were or not, right? It's, 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 of course, you know, in, in long term, it shows in results, business performance, you know, uh, revenues and various things, depending on which organization you are in, you know, in a sales driven organization, it should show in revenues more immediately than somewhere else you know, where the sales are more, you know, organizational and not direct. So uh, we can, you know, start with you, Amit. So how do you assess for your own purposes? Uh, or or in, in, in fact, if, if, if you ever have to tell the board that we tried this and this is how it worked or did not work, I'm sure there are things that don't work because, you know, you, the kind of innovation you're doing, I'm sure there are times when it worked or didn't work. So how do you assess the uh, results uh, that come from any uh, of the activities that you have done. And I'm not talking about one particular intervention. I would say the model you use to assess, Amit. Okay, great. Great question, Sunil. So uh, let me build a context uh, and then probably you will understand what I'm trying to say is that Hanu, for us, it's very important that we have the brightest and the best of talent in the world because those smile is, uh, our size is small around seven, 800 rock stars, but we cater to the Fortune 10 companies of the world. And for us, this is the USP because the talent Hanu has, nobody else has in the world by virtue is, there are two things. We run a program called Hanu Azar Academy. And that is a program where we hire brightest of the campuses very early on. And they are trained in the batches of 20 in dedicated one month program. And that's called Hanu Azar Academy. And you understand when this pandemic hit, before that it was all classroom program, you know, there were manual interventions trained over there. But as soon as it came, you know, we were forced to do it virtually and digitalized, right? So what it happens, the need to have this LND program more flexible in nature became the need of time. So what we did is we developed and we were already working before the pandemic hit us 
in tool development where it was a application which is in control of all the activities we want to do. And the success of it, Sunil, depend on it, the kind of training you are doing. So there are multiple certification, as I said. My delivery team has a different departments, be it uh, you know, platform, platform as a services, infra as a services, or maybe you can say uh, you know, desktop services, and many other things which virtually run in parallel. And every training is very, very different. So we, what we did is we, we kept this certification in mind that this is what the modules are. We divided them, and each content development, there was a person responsible for it and we made a unified platform which just took the content and made it gamified and that I, I want to tell you that gamification worked like anything so it it what it did is all the participants earlier I observed in the classroom at least the attention span cannot go away because you are in front of your trainer and you know, your peers are here you are in constant pressure to perform and there are assignments but in a virtual world nobody knows right so you go away you are behind the screen you are doing or not doing but then the ultimate key was that you feel engaged about it. So we developed a service as software as a services platform, which is our proprietary software. We, we made the content available depending on the outcome we wanted in terms of certification. And what we did is not only the technical training, the content was basically measured or developed, keeping in mind the cultural familiarization of Hanu, cultural uh, uh, familiarization with the clients, as well as business etiquettes, whatever you want to do, and rest of the things which make you engage. So what we did is instead of just moving, okay, this is the module, go away, this is the lab, we turned into games. And what happened, all the 20 participants who are going with this, they were competing internally on this platform to become number one. And in a way, all were participating like never before in order to achieve that number one spot. Plus, there were financial rewards. There were things which, you know, make you more pampered about the program and many other things. It worked for us. During the pandemic time from March 2020, uh, Sunil, we hired more than 350 people. We trained them and there are lateral hires, this and that. But for us, it really worked phenomenal. And I'm glad that we experimented. And as an IT company, we are satisfied with the outcome of this platform, which is proprietary software for to us. Over to you, Sunil. You, so Anubha, you tell us across industries, across verticals, how to measure results how to measure whether a certain intervention, a program has worked or not? Um, very, this is, this is actually, actually the most critical question for every organization. Uh, L&D, unfortunately, in many organizations is looked upon as uh, less of a value add, more of an, uh, you know, an okay. investment, and uh, God knows where the results are coming from. Um, and l and as a business needs to make an effort to, uh, you know, to work towards becoming a value addition rather than uh, uh, an investment, right? So a value add is when the whole l and perspective will change for a lot of companies. Um, and this primarily will come from when you're able to assess the value add that you bring to the table, uh, in terms of skills development, in terms of performance. And uh, when we talk about these things, the first and the foremost thing is we need to, I'll use the word again, go back in line. So we have to figure out um, where did we start from? What were the problems that we were seeing? Uh, what were the challenges that we were seeing? And be able to map that. Once we've been, we've been able to map that, uh, our approach, what we do, what we find out, uh, what we actually do, the actions that we take, all will come here at this point. And then this, this is the point where we figure out where we were and where have we reached. And the performance matrices is the, you know, have to be common between these two points. That is the critical way of identifying, um, assessing, all the l and tools, all the l and programs, all the l and initiatives. Thank you, Anubha. Uh, that helps. Kaushik, coming to you. Um, so uh, you, you, you said you work across uh, uh, industries, uh, some of them um, uh, which work across the world, uh, you know, in, in, in many countries. So, uh, and you said you headed l and at uh, several of these places. So you would have, uh, if I can say, rare kind of insights into uh, how to measure, how to assess the results from any uh, L&D activity, of course, in a 
a, 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 a conference like this, it can only be brief. As I said, it, it can be a wide uh, a body of knowledge. But uh, if you have to say, sum it up, you know, like I, I'll, I'll give these three or four, five things, or, or these two things to assess the results. Kaushik, you're on mute. Yeah. Firstly, uh, you know what Anubha said, uh, value add versus investment. I'd rather say, you know, most organizations don't even look at it as a investment. They look at it as a cost. Okay, investment I'm is surprised cost. really. Yeah. And uh, so the first good, yeah. that comes out is what is the return on ROI, or you know what do you intend to do. Okay, so I think you know it's, now my approach and my communication always has been with business that you know there is there is no direct hundred percent quantifiable way of measuring. You know, the result, you know, firstly, I think that's something which we need to really understand. You know, you might just, uh, you know, keep talking about it, but that's the, that's the first factor. Now, but there are various ways of, uh, you know, through which you can uh, see whether the, you know, in what direction are you getting a result out of the different intervention that you're doing. Now, results are visible in many ways. Okay, one is, uh, you know, the accretion rate, uh, you know, is a clear reflection. Uh, you have annual surveys that happen in most progressive organizations. Okay, what exactly is the outcome of those surveys? And there is always uh, clearly, uh, you know, you have questions around the development uh, journey in an organization. You know, what are the scores out there? And of course, you have training score, you have intervention score, you know, you, you do different kinds of uh, feedback mechanism, which is there in place. But, you know, more than anything else, to me, you know, some of these annual surveys, the retention rates, uh, you know, uh, uh, those are the elements, you know, which in a very funny way actually gives you the right kind of answer. And to me, uh, one more thing is, you know, in what direction the revenue, I mean, you, you rarely you come across an organization, you know, whose revenue graph is on a downslide and, you know, they do a lot of work around people development. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I actually don't have a single example or, you know, of, of that nature. So I mean, it's, a, it's a direct, uh, uh, you know, there is a direct relationship, you know, it's directly proportional in terms of the investment that you make on people and the return that we will give you, you know, through uh, uh, revenues and uh, productivity. I think, you know, that is also something, you know, you need to show a correlation between the two. Yeah. Thank, uh, you. Thank you, Kaushik. Yeah. So Manoj, now you obviously have, you know, diverse set of people for a large organization like yours. You've got engineers, you've got floor workers, you've got people who are in sales, you've got, you know, people who maintain these facilities since they're large factories, you know. So uh, the needs obviously are like diverse, right? Now, uh, you obviously need to assess, you know, uh, the results for differently for different set of people. So from you, I can, you know, let's take the benefit of your being there, coming from a, you know, place where the needs are uh, fairly uh, heterogeneous, if I can call them that. So do you have a benchmark scale or you think, no, each one has to be assessed differently for different set of skills, for different set of people, for different length of service, for uh, you know, different uh, changes that you're trying to bring about. Let, let's hear you know, how to handle when there's such diverse uh, need for l and Excellent. I think uh, uh, just to bring a perspective, I think for manufacturing, L&D results and its uh, relation with the total or overall business success is, is very, very important. So let me, let me create this for uh, all the viewers, is both the hard results and the soft results are very important. And, uh, and when we deal with the heterogeneous group, like uh, Sunil mentioned in the, you know, especially in the manufacturing, you deal with variety of people and also you know people inside the organization and even outside the organization so uh, there the efforts are different so two important aspect uh, uh, you know i can talk about one is the skill part and the style part you know so when we think of skill what are what are the new skill set required for future radio organization so the acquisition of those skill set is very important so that you need to diagnose in a very very scientific manner at at what level of job families or what category of people 
what kind of skill set is needed both uh, i would say technically functionally and behaviorally you know so uh, we you know like in case of arthi we have a very uh, you know core business processes in place and trainings in place with respect to technical aspect of the job behavioral aspect of the job and the functional aspect of the job so that a deeper level of understanding and it's like it's not something created by human resource uh, coordinators or leaders it's purely coming largely from the business so and so that is one aspect second the style part of it within the style part of it the challenge is what ecosystem you are developing as a culture you know that whole environment which need to be you know again future ready because from the point of view how your leadership is supporting or owning or this accountability of developing people is extremely important second how they themselves are getting ready for the uh, new challenges or ready for the you know what organization is trying to uh, you know achieve in the future with respect to various things so if if i really you know have to integrate these two some aspects open up for us one is we need to understand the whole business model if you understand uh, the business model then the result part becomes very very clear to you and i really always uh, mention this clarity brings capability at the workplace and the more you bring this clarity in the eyes of the stakeholder whosoever it is whether it is workman to contract labor or to the top cxos clarity is something is always you know if you bring that then the capability of them in the game is very high and second the results are very very uh, co, you know high to achieve result could be in the form of uh, the new skill set acquisition the competencies which you have assessed for your people you know is where are they with respect to its you know uh, development so that is true third is the culture you which you want to bring in at the workplace how you are experiencing it in the form of you know whether people are having those conversation because everything is in the language sunil at the end of it absolutely everything is in the language so are people using that language in their conversation i may be sitting in mumbai but i exist in the hearts and minds of the people in wapi or anywhere in the world so everything is in the language and in that experience we create for them and that is where if you if you really segregate that uh, from the style and the skill point of view and bring that focus and rigor and clarity then the result is definitely you can de- very powerfully correlate with the business outcomes and i have invariably seen you know it becomes a integral part of overall people strategy who really promotes or facilitates your transformation thank you so yeah. I, i mean i can go on and on no, on no, this, yeah, but i really want to hold myself I and huge I, insight yeah coming from you know i i'm actually i have two more aspects which i want to cover but i as i can see i have only five minutes but i think i'll take the risk of uh, foregoing the last one which is about the future of uh, lnd uh, in the entire uh, hr business uh, so but i'll ask the penalty met one which is you know uh, i i see all uh, hr people to be uh, at some level social scientists they need to understand how society works they need to understand how people are because it's about people right it's not without reason that it became human resources so we are talking about human resources we are talking about talent which comes from society you know and people do go back to society they work with you for eight hours sometimes longer but eventually they go back and they bring what they have so i i think i'll do this quick round if you can call it rapid fire even that's fine but you know i we can start with manoj this time manoj what are the three or two or three things you know where this one or two thing comes this tickles work in a, i'm i'm a, i'm an editorial person and you realize when you say three things that you must know four things they work editorially so we're very used to that we're very addicted to this three things and the five things that work okay i'll i'll confess the uh, uh, i'm with that. you completely yeah right so 
I'm sure you do that training. Okay, guys, three things to keep in mind when doing this. That's remembered. So three societal changes that we must keep in mind. You know, things like people are very much more of worried about health, the conscious of health. People have far greater aspiration, economic and social. These are just examples. But you could tell me your three changes that you've observed in the last four to five or 10 years that are very important when, and that will be important whether recruiting, whether you know, rewarding, whether training. So tell us, Manoj, three things that you've observed in society that have changed. Which so must I think uh, the first and foremost I would go is you now people is really working for their purpose in life. Fantastic. So, so that is something very fundamentally changed for people. You know, they follow their purpose. So I would say purpose. Second is the adoption of uh, digital, uh, you know, skills is something is very universally, you know, people have put in their time and energy into that and they are actually, you know, surprised, pleasantly surprised. So the ad adoption is the second. And third is people, especially, you know, the younger generation or the Gen Z or Gen Y, you know, we talked about the millennials we talked about, they are disrupting big time. So these are the three three things disrupting, yeah. and that is like uh, you know bringing a lot of element of transformation and change. Kaushik, let's hear your uh, insights into what are the things societally uh, that have changed. Kaushik, you're on mute. Uh, you, you may need to unmute, please. Well, I think uh, you know few things which uh, clearly has uh, seen a huge amount of. Uh, change. One is uh, technology embracement. I mean, which is something very near to what Manoj said. And you're talking about personal technology. People adopting yeah, personal technology. It is, it is changing and uh, people who are able to embrace technology, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, are the ones, you know, who have done well. I mean, uh, you know, we have seen them coming up of the internet uh, world, you know, in late 80s and early 90s. A lot of people actually fizzled out, you know, who was not able to embrace. And this has continued, uh, you know, over a period of time. Uh, so you will see uh, that happening in the L&D world. One more thing that I believe is going to uh, play a key role is uh, my micro learning as well as uh, gamification. I think that area is going to see a lot of uh, change. Uh, uh, AI is going to play a very important role, which is uh, going to, uh, you know, every, every learning experience and every learning intervention will be, uh, uh, you know, will be linked with uh, artificial intelligence people will be given that input which is needed to that particular specific to that individual. I think you know, there will be a lot of uh, work around that area. Uh, so that's something you know, which I uh, clearly see. And uh, of course, disruption uh, is the key word and we, we will continue to see a lot of disruption uh, in, in this uh, arena as well. So yeah, sure, thank you. So Anubha, so behaviorally, in terms of values, lifestyle, uh, three things that you see with, you know, you work with human beings, which you've seen, uh, which like they, we must keep in mind when dealing with humans of today. Oh, so the first thing that I have observed and I'm going to talk about generations. Uh, generation uh, Z, Generation Y, we've seen that these set of people um, are very fearless. They have no problem in admitting their mistakes. They have no problem in, um, in wanting to know more. And I have seen that as a pattern in uh, even millennials and beyond. We don't uh, easily you know, accept that we don't know something. Uh, we don't uh, we don't have something so we will just acknowledge yes for everything and that is the be the most beautiful change that is showing socially because I think uh, the first and the foremost step to learning is to acknowledge that you don't know something and only then is when you move to the next step that is knowing what you don't know so that is one big change that is happening uh, the second thing that I've seen is that there has been a huge generation gap in organizations. There's very young people, very 
I'm sorry, I'm short of words, yeah. but older people. <laughs> so we have these people and um, <laughs> our sincere apologies. But, uh, you know, the older set of people are learning newer things from these uh, new kids on the block. And, um, um, you know, that, 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 <laughs> yeah, and that 360 degree learning is, is, is going to take uh, headways for organizations, is going to give headways to organizations. So these two important aspects, I think, has really changed the uh, social uh, you know, the social understanding of... I mean, you work with young Tur- people, so you don't have those issues like generation. <laughs> I, Sunil, I don't have that. even... No, 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 Sunil. I don't have <laughs> any... any uh, Anubha must have made many followers today from the X generation and Y. I don't want to be in that game. But yes, for me, it's it, it's okay. L- l- let me come back to it. That I, I come solely, you know, mostly from the IT background and the things, as Anubha was saying, I will just, you know, uh, augment that. One thing I see in the change is that Kaizen, the continuous learning has become a part of generation because in but our field, yeah, yeah. if you are away just a few months from technology, you are just thrown away. I've seen people with 25, 30 years in experience working hard, learning new things in contrast to the guys coming from the campus, no new and old, but all I take is a talent. So talent, if you are not updated or you have kept yourself innovated, you are thrown out of the basket immediately. And that's how I seen it. One important change that a project manager is working hard as the new folk from the campus is learning new language, new technology, new tool, because they are competing with each other. Second thing, I don't have, unfortunately, third, but only two. As Mm. Anuba said about generation Y, X, and how it goes, my point is a little bit on the same line that, no, I seen that my father's grandfathers, they were kind of working from the bread and butter. For them working and having those Numba style of work is about gaining X amount of money so they can take care of family. But what I've seen now, the newer generation or the people who are coming to market, they are more over aspirational workers. For them, the passion for the work and the kind of work they love matters, not the money they are getting. And that's, I think, even during the tenure of 20 years, I'm in industry, I've seen that rapid and drastic change. Because mm-hmm. remember people 20 years back, we were interviewing, it's, it, it was never about, okay, work you are getting. It was more about, okay, this is the money I'm getting end of the day, and probably whatever work you want to give me, I'm okay. And now it's drastically different. Mm-hmm. The first question we as HR get is what kind of work we are getting, what role it is, what the job responsibilities are, what, what my career progression looks like, and a lot of other things. So these are the two things, Sunil, I see I have changed totally from the time I started, from the time we are today in this job market. And that's how I perceive this whole the transition and all my fellow panelists uh, as said. It's, it's, it's beautiful to see anyways, but yes, these are the two few observations I had. Uh, can I just so add one uh, thing? Uh, yeah, you know, the age myth, actually, and uh, uh, because, you know, there's a lot of uh, talks about Gen Zen and how they're technologically, you know, much more advanced than, you know, the other generation, which is actually not true. Okay, if, you know, I've worked with organizations where we actually try and see, and a part of our DNA agenda is to have more generations in place. And we want to see that Four generations are there, uh, you know, in a, in a room when uh, you know when any 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 congregation happens. Okay, now for example, in our organization, we have seen you know we have uh, things like workplace, you know, which is like a Facebook, um, you know, within an organization. The adaptation level in Gen Zen has been far lower than the Gen X. Okay, so a lot of the learning intervention that happened, you know, on the live stream platform, uh, you know, during pandemic, we actually saw much more investment from uh, the Gen X. Uh, 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 rather than the Gen Zen. So, you know, there has been a lot of such this thing because today anybody knows that if I want to survive, I need to adapt technology. Okay, and technology is equally available to people today. And th- this has been there for last uh, almost eight to 10 years. So, you know, that gap has reduced a lot in terms of Gen Zen being able to adapt technology, you know, better than Gen, Gen X. So I think than anything else. That's been my experience. Okay. Oh, absolutely. I- I'm glad I asked this last question and 
for, uh, you know, uh, let's sacrifice the last one, which was going to be the future of uh, uh, LND, which I'm sure will get uh, answered through the day. And uh, with a panel like this, uh, one could have really gone on for God knows how many more hours. But then I've been told, uh, I've been told in the chat box that time to wrap, time to wrap. So I will. Uh, and, and of course, I, I really need to thank Manoj, Kaushik, Amit, Anubha for this wonderful session. It was truly uh, enlightening for me. And I'm sure it was the same for the delegates who joined us. Uh, uh, hope to uh, meet you people soon, another time, at another platform. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. So nice. Thank you. What do you, Kathy? Thank you, everybody, other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunil, and to all our panelists for that wonderful conversation. I'm sure all our viewers have taken some key takeaways from it. Moving straight into our next panel discussion, which will talk about learning and development and the future of trainers. I'd like to welcome our panelists on screen. Neelu Jain, founder and director of Chrysalis Training and Consultancy, LLP. Vikas Tandon, head of LND Dalmia Bharat Group. Sonika Aron, founder and managing partner, Marching Sheep and Vipul Rathor, Chief Learning Officer, Central Learning. Moderating this session is Sugand Behel, Senior Correspondent, BW People and BW Business World. I'd like to welcome all our panelists and moderator on screen. A very warm welcome to all of you. Hi, Kathy. How are you? Doing very well. How are you doing? I'm fine. Brilliant. Lovely to have all of you here. So, uh, Sugand, I'd leave the screen over to you. Sure. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the event. I mean, hope you might be having a really good time listening to all our power packed panels. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to now like begin this session. Um, I would like to say that, you know, nowadays L&D professionals, they're adorning many hats to continue to gain responsibilities beyond the traditional role of deploying training programs. You know, in the new normal world now, these professionals are taking a more strategic and proactive role in planning and developing training modules for the upcoming candidates, which of course are aligned with the business goals, helping improve the performances. I'd like to start with Mr. Tandon. You know, what do you think are some of the emerging trends which trainers should practice and profess in their sessions now that they'll be planning? Good afternoon all. A uh, very well valid question in today's context, you know. Uh, last couple of years, I've seen a lot of changes, uh, uh, not only in the corporate world, but in the uh, arena of learning and development. Couple mm -hmm. of things uh, uh, from my experience I share. Uh, first thing is embarrassing technology. Uh, last couple of years, I've seen the way uh, imparting learning has changed. Uh, the kind of interaction now required using the blended techniques, uh, apart from classroom techniques, you know, uh, we need to have the virtual techniques and we need to have an engagement through virtual techniques with the part participant. That is an important trend which has emerged in last one and a half years time. And that is not only during the program when we are facilitating uh, the content, but over a period of time so that all the participants can retain and apply actually uh, whatever is being told during the program. Another thing which uh, again related with uh, the uh, part of technology is bringing some sort of gamification, uh, which brings some sort of sense for the participants that what is there for me, like using you know technologies like Mentimeter and other thing wherein uh, the facilitators uh, take a pulse of what is happening in the moment. That is, I think, something very important. And then take the sessions forward using that particular thing. Uh, one another thing uh, uh, which is very important here is now the trainers are becoming facilitators. You know, rather than doing these standalone training programs, now we need to facilitate the interventions. Training becomes one of the you know components of that intervention. So understanding, and that is specifically from the perspective since I work in an organization, so we have our internal setup. So when we engage our external partners, so when they are getting into our sort of intervention, uh, we need to treat them and they need to treat uh, the internal stakeholders as they are the stakeholders in the organization and then lead that. So these are the three things I feel, you know, which have changed in last 
a couple of years and uh, we in the lnd world need to embrace that of course and i truly uh, i mean agree with your point yes now the term is no more a trainer it's more of a facilitator now you know coming back to another aspect when you're talking about this concept of facilitating changes as a trainer as a facilitator i mean my question goes to neelu what new aspects should the facilitators you know embed in the new programs and how differently do they need to act in the new normal world now right thank you so much a uh, lovely question as pace is changing as things are changing and you know all this while all this years we've been talking about the wuka world now we've lived it through and uh, the changes that were supposed to happen few years down the line have started happening right now so for trainers we keep talking about this world called agile and agility for trainers it's extremely important for them themselves to be agile look at what's trending look at what's new and try and adapt so a couple of things that uh, you know trainers can do in the fraternity some things new that they can pick up is one trying to address um, through whatever program they are keeping they have to address a different multi dimensional audience type they have so i was listening to the other panels we were talking about the different generations it's extremely important for us to keep our programs centered to each of these generations that we are catering to so be it you know the millennials today be the uh, generation that has been there baby boomers and all of these generations have to be catered to so a mix of program a blended learning program mix of technology um keep even for that matter designing presentations now that we've switched to virtual technology and the virtual mode of delivery it's so important to see a visually presentable slide and keeping the least amount of information that is there keeping it really engaging so experiential learning using technology blending it um you know engaging all sort of workforce has become extremely important and i think one more point that is uh, relevant for the trainers to pick up today is the gap between learning to performance these days organizations are more into whatever they have picked up as fine but what's the translation of learning you know this has been an ongoing debate in lnd to talk about roi but now the organizations really want to see what is the impact of that learning on the actual job role so that is something that we also have to keep thinking about and the need to self development never ends so from upskilling cross skilling you know that keeps continuing so that's from my side but you know this this uh, this topic arises me to an, another important question now that you know the term facilitator has come in the performance metrics has also changed for employees now when you train the upcoming candidates anybody can answer mr rathor can answer this now when we are coming up with this concept that you know new hirings are taking place performance metrics is changing how do you think you can differentiate yourself i mean your previous training models to what you will be coming up with now um so i'm mean, absolutely excellent question again and good afternoon and thank you welcome to sort of hello to all of the panelists so so if i so again if i understand your question right it is about you know how can training sort of <laughs> or lnd track the right metrics or kind of identify which is the right performance and that's a that has been an age old problem those of us who have been in the area would you know it's we often track metrics that you know the business doesn't truly really care about right so for years uh, training you know we have been looking at smiley sheets and you know patting ourselves on the back with you know hey yeah i got 4.9 and all of that so obviously that is all aside and people have been saying for years that smiley sheets are you know have outlived their purpose um so yeah uh, coming back to your question i think the the answer lies in in picking up the metrics that the business truly cares about now obviously it's 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 easier said than done in terms of implementation but you know there is really no other way to look at this so if i am training for sales um if i am you know if if i am training sales professionals um then i can have a few metrics which are you know which which capture the learner feedback did they feel the trainer did their job did they feel the materials were relevant but at the same time i have to have a few sort of performance metrics that talk about when they went back to their job um, was there actual needle movement in their performance you know did their you know did their performance improve <clears throat> did they sell more sell better if the training was for key account management did their customer satisfaction scores improve you know if the training was for um, leading people better did the satisfaction of their teams improve so all of these things have to be brought in 
uh, I say it's easier said than done because, of course, it's one thing to pick a metric, but it's quite another to then show the effect. And and what's tougher is then isolate the effect to the training, right? So let's say it's many things happened in a professional's life, um, one of which was the training event. Uh, so they went back, They maybe they were happy, they, were, they got a reward, incentive, all of that. So the results went up. It may not really directly be because of uh, the training. So again, there are methods to, to isolate and to attribute um, what percentage of the performance improvement was indeed due to training. And you know, one can always debate, was it 60%, 40%? But I think as far as getting business agreement on, you know, did you really see uh, an improvement in the performance of your team members after they came? I think at least we can get to a yes or no, um, fairly you know, unequivocally. Uh, so that is, so it's a short answer to your question, you know, mm -hmm. we should pick metrics that the business truly cares about. If we are training managers to be better managers, we should have one of the data points as, as a drop in um, a voluntary attrition in their teams. Uh, so things like that. But I think, uh, I'm not saying we should dump all of the smiley sheets and all that, you know, it's important to, for us to know, we capture the immediate reaction of learners. But at the same time, we should really start thinking about um, what are the, you know, what's the data point that the business truly cares about, um, mm -hmm. you know, because eventually it's all about the business impact. Of course. And, you know, uh, human mind, I, as I always say, works on motivation. So yes, the concept of smiley sheets and all might look a bit old school and redundant, but then yes, it does work. So mm -hmm. when you say that there are certain metrics that we've always kept up, do you think there should be a module wherein the trainers should also have mentors who can train them as to how do they need to devise the new training modules now? Sure. Question for me. Uh, you ask. Um, yeah, anyone can. Um, yeah, Sonica sorry, can, can answer. It. Go ahead. So, go ahead. Um, let's hear from Sonica and then I can chime in. If you want. Yeah. So, um, so then I actually, um, firstly, thank you for having me here. Uh, I come from a very uh, different school from thought when it comes uh, to l and uh, I actually ascribe to the thought that uh, l and professionals are actually facilitators of change for any organization. So I am actually absolutely against uh, off-the-shelf programs and mm -hmm. um, against uh, the very school of thought that you go in for a training certification and you get certified as a trainer and you get a set of PPTs and you stand up and say that I'm a trainer, right? So that is not what l &D professionals are all about. So I personally feel that, you know, and, and let's look at it from the context of what happened the last year, you know. Uh, suddenly, uh, everything that, was, that everybody was getting trained on became redundant uh, because nobody was prepared for what happened in 2020. And the kind of competencies that will be required now in 2021 for organizations, for leaders, for individuals to succeed in 2021 and beyond are going to be very, very different to deal with the VUCA world. And truly, this is the year that l and can truly facilitate that change, whether l and within the organizations or l and outside the organizations as change participants, as change partners. Right. And for that, no amount of training of trainers is going to help. What will help is partnering with organizations and understanding that what is it that they need, doing a thorough diagnostic of what is the change that they want to drive, what are the behaviors that they want to build. So, you know, uh, early on when the pandemic struck, we reached out to a lot of industry leaders. We, re we did a lot of panel discussions. We did a lot of industry research. And we said, what is it that you need in these times to help you with business continuity, business recovery, and so on and so forth? And we mm -hmm. came with a host of topics saying that, you know, this is what we need. And we completely mm -hmm. revamped our portfolio. And none of those programs were in our portfolio pre-COVID. And what we also realized that you might have, uh, you might have in the same company, I might be running the same session, but one batch's requirements might be completely different from the other. 
very mm-hmm. recently we conducted a program on emotional resilience and psychological safety for a, for about 200 managers across the company and trust me i had to change my tack for almost every batch because they had different questions they had different requirements and as a facilitator i cannot go in with my own preconceived notions i cannot go attached with my own program i cannot be attached to my own ppt for instance mm-hmm. i have to go in with a facilitative mindset saying that this is what these people need these are the behaviors that i need to help them with these are the problems that i need to help them with and what vipul very rightly said how do i help them with what they were dealing with before what were their metrics before and what would be their metrics afterwards metrics now. right so i personally believe that we as lnd if in 2020 for very valid reasons all lnd budgets were put on hold in 2021 i think we have a huge opportunity to make change having said that it would be very focused because budgets would be tight but we will need to help them identify what is it that will help them drive business continuity and recovery and help them drive that i hope i have answered your question indeed indeed in a very <laughs> analytical manner and yes it's good to know that you know you have a different set of thought process that you're coming up with and you actually have points to you know uh, prove it that you know why do you have a different set of thought process behind it now this leads to another uh, query i would say uh lnd leaders do they do you think that you know ai can complement your tasks going ahead because we have number of technologies coming in like emotion ai and other ai applications of course so do you think that you know it can complement the task that you've been given and in the way that you're designing your modules now mr tan can answer that so very valid thing and uh, you know i i just share an example here uh, i was going through an article wherein uh, uh, they talked about how the participant experience learners experience gets changed when the facilitator gets input uh, using the ai tool uh, they uh, you know analyze 50 Uh, feedback forms scoring were very high 90 to 95 percent but the ai tool told that none of them are going to implement it because they have not placed their action plan the way it was required as per the intervention design of the intervention so this talks about this gives a very strategic input to the facilitator that even though the score is very very high the score is you know 90 95 percent aha moment when people are going that the actual thing which vipul and sonika also talked about you know touching and uh, impacting the matrix is not going to happen there on that so it so so just using this particular example here when we get these kind of you know uh, met, uh, uh, inputs available to us using this thing now we can customize it dependent on what kind of learners we are going to get in and what is going to benefit them in terms of their you know actual implementation of that learning so their ai is going to play a major role uh, going forward um do you want to add anything to this rathor sir um certainly um uh, so i so obviously i'm no expert on ai but one of the most uh, illuminating conversations i have had recently about ai and obviously we obviously we i mean i'm, I'm no techy very few a few lnd professionals are but i think it's interesting to hear about ai as you know there is specific or narrow ai which is really does very specific functionality and which is which is what we often see uh, and you know there's no escaping that so all of us use learning management systems in our organizations and you know the typical if i have gone through a marketing course then i get recommendations around marketing and so that's a very very specific use of ai and that is what something we are seeing in in a variety of applications including learning management systems and it's you know it's quite universal and then there is general or general ai which is really that's sort of um, that has artificial intelligence at its core and that is obviously left best to experts um, to create so of course you know general creating a system with general ai obviously needs more investment and uh, and skill but as lnd leaders i think 
as far as narrow or specific AI examples are, it, they're all around us. So, um, you know, of course we can use it to our advantage. We can, we can look at data around what kind of courses are seeing better completion rates by learners. Um, you know, if people are dropping out, is there a trend around when are they dropping out? And then, and then around what time of day do people like to learn? Is there a specific trend there? Um, how, you know, at what certain point in their careers are people going for a certain type of courses? So again, all of these are things that we can use to, to our advantage, not just to understand uh, learning needs, but also to sort of figure out how to best meet them, which is the best medium to reach learners. If video is finding greater acceptance, then let's say, you know, standard click, mm -hmm. click through courses, then how can we integrate that better? Um, the typical duration of courses, what type of subjects are seeing greater. So again, all of that is something that uh, AI can really enrich. Um, and, uh, you know, of course it's all around us. So all of the learning management systems that we use today are already walking down the path of AI. So, you know, it's up to sort of the learning community to embrace it and, and adopt. So. But then, uh, you know, uh, as technology has its own pros and cons, everybody would agree. Uh, talking about the reliability and acceptability of such applications, Niluma, what is your take on the same that how much can we rely on certain applications when it comes to choosing a candidate or when it comes to screening a candidate? Maybe is, is there a possibility that, you know, maybe there is one strong aspect of a candidate which the application is not able to capture. And, you know, as a, as a recruiter, you might miss that. Right. So uh, a great question indeed. We are talking about AI and uh, that happens to be the truth in the near future. The way I look at machine learning or VR or AR or any sort of artificial intelligence that it passes through three stages. One is to, of course, understand. The second is to respond. And the third is to engage. Now, currently, the way we are working, either we are blending, uh, you know, AI in terms of recruitment or AI in terms of LMS, we are more using it on an understanding stage to pick up the fact, to pick up the data, to pick up algorithms. Now, the validation of it depends on the credibility. So, uh, you know, I've worked with organizations where they're trying to put in AI into, uh, you know, using bots to screen. And as we know, a lot of screening happens, resume screening happens through multiple bots. Uh, what happens is if those, here comes the importance of keywords. Mm -hmm. People are as fast as, you know, machines are learning, people are also trying to learn. So when machines are putting in algorithms, uh, individuals are also learning how to bypass those algorithms. So I know of, uh, you know, agencies of companies who are actually helping individuals to um, create an ATS free resume so that, you know, they can, they can pass through the application tracking system and they can get through it. Now, how much of validity does that system have? If I've learned how to pass through it, I may not have the skill sets, but probably I just have the piece of paper where everything is constructed properly. Exactly. Uh, so the validity of it, that is why, you know, with every, every bot, with every uh, AI driven software, we also have a human intervention as of now. Mm -hmm. So even if it gets uh, filtered out through the artificial intelligence, we have a human intervention who checks whether the person who's gone through it is credible enough or not. So that is how I'm viewing AI. It may not be a standalone solution. It can be a, a facilitator, it can help us, but it requires human intervention for sure, unless and until we have years of credibility built and we know that it's working absolutely fine. Exactly. Also, uh, you know, me as a candidate, if I'm going through a screening process, you know, what is your take on the same? Do I also need to have a hang of how the system is going to assess me? Is there a certain way that me as a candidate would will have to learn while going for screening tests for um, in, in different organizations? Sorry, who was this for? Um, Mom, you can also answer that. No, I, I, I wanted to address the AI piece from an LND perspective. So, um, for, for, for hiring, anybody else can, uh, you know, uh, uh, take uh, this. Anybody who, I mean, who thinks that, you know, they can actually shed in some light on this, can actually take it up. Rathor sir can take it up. I can, I'm sure Vikas will probably want to add a point as well. But if your question is, as a, as a candidate, mm -hmm. what do I have to do differently if I'm being assessed by exactly, an AI? Exactly, sir. 
so I, if the ai really works ideally you should not have to do anything different right that is the whole okay. point right the uh, you know you should i mean as a user or as a you know as a candidate i should get the same experience that i would if there was an actual mm-hmm. person uh, speaking so i mean i go to my you know you'll be logged into our bank website and i don't know if the i know for sure that the, the chatbot whatever his or her name is is not a human but they can still figure out so my short answer in an ideal world you should have a fairly seamless recruitment experience um but of course um you know of course it's you know you have to be aware that the questions that are coming are from a from a system so i think you know you just have to ensure the basics right i mean what you will miss is um you know in terms of the, this you know to giving the right kind of input you can't sort of you know if there is a question you have to give sort of the direct kind of input be mm-hmm. more clear and direct with your answers uh do not try to game the system um, you know try to sort of uh, kind of work within the sort of railroad tracks that are laid out um and most of all if it's an assessment uh, kind of a engine where you you know if you're supposed to keep your camera on and all of that stuff uh don't sort of uh, give the system a chance to suspect you or uh, you know so i guess as as most of us used to say in the in the advisory world you know it's not just important to be uh to be fair and to be to be correct but it's also important mm-hmm. to appear to be to be correct so, so think of both those things that your conduct is is uh, is right but it should also appear to be right um that's my sense because anything you want to add you have uh, beautifully narrated that particular thing the only thing i want to say is that from the uh, candidate perspective the only thing is embracing the embracing the technology nothing else if we have a fear of uh, technology then uh, nothing will work no i completely agree it was just a very spontaneous question that came in as a candidate but then yes uh, it's good to hear that you know for us also it's a very seamless process even if you know ai takes over so you know next in uh, i can have sonika ma'am yes ma'am please so uh, you know uh, technology very interestingly um, has both pros and cons okay so technology has one loophole which is garbage in garbage out now when an organization implements technology for whatever purpose whether it is for uh, you know gathering employee engagement or whether it is for selection or whether it is for training need analysis it needs to be very cognizant of the fact that it has to implement it very very thoroughly and whatever data inputs that they are trying to gather they are gathered very very appropriately now let me give you an example uh, several mm-hmm. of your um, home delivery apps in their customer service uh, uh, you know apps have chatbots and trust me they give you a terrible terrible uh, customer experience now that is an example of using chatbots with a very bad customer experience and if you are going to use technology with employees and you are going to spend money and that is the kind of output you are going to get for let's say employee engagement you are going to get for training need analysis you are going to get for the kind of employees you want to interview you have wasted your money mm-hmm. right so from that perspective uh be very very mindful while deploying technology having said that technology if implemented very very accurately thoughtfully with complete checks and balances can be a big help so when we do our interventions we spend mm-hmm. a lot of time so when we design our interventions i think mm-hmm. 70% of our time goes in understanding that what is really the need of the client and then curating the intervention now if there is technology within the organization which can help us crunch that time both for the organization and for us that effort comes down effort means money mm-hmm. both for the organization and for us right so i believe that there is there is merit in technology but right now we have not reached a level where we are fully prepared where garbage is not going in okay right because in the garb of not putting in correct information 
or like Neelu pointed out, people uh, trying to circumvent the kind of information that is going in, what we are getting out is also not accurate. And if what we are getting out is not accurate, our decision-making is not accurate, which means we are spending double time to validate then what's the point? Yeah? Very so, happily. <laughs> so, so that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much for your views, ma'am. Uh, moving on to my next set of questions. How to, you know, find a sweet spot between management requirement, employee engagement and the evolving technology? It's, I mean, as, as a candidate, I would say, or as an audience, I would say it's, it's a very important question as to how to balance out all these three aspects. Because, sir, you can go ahead with it. Yeah. So I think very uh, apt question on this. So I give an example of our organization. So we are totally shed away, you know, from the traditional TNI process, wherein we used to go and ask what kind of training needs you have on this. We don't do this kind of thing. What we ask the leaders here is, what are your objectives? And to achieve your objectives, what kind of changes you want to see in the organization, in the immediate future, intermediate future, and in the long-term future on that? What are your you know, long-term vision for the organization, for your teams? Uh, on this particular thing. So we get input using these things wherein uh, the leaders, the management, they do not look from what is not there. They look from what they expect and how it is going to enable that particular thing. So this is the first thing. And second thing is that uh, when we engage uh, with the participants, with the larger audience uh, there, we also try to gauge uh, what is their expectation and what kind of role they are going to play in the larger aspect of, uh, you know, these visions and these goals in this particular thing on there. So now what happens here is that we, when we match these two requirements and then we go that, okay, uh, these are the interventions which are going to play their role and bring that kind of enablement in the organization so that we achieve the final goals in this particular thing. Now, what happens in this particular thing? Uh, from the uh, you know, employee, from the talent perspective, it is not a standalone training program. It is something which is going to give a new dimension to that particular person and brings uh, an awareness that how that person is going to uh, play a role in the organization growth journey. From the management perspective also, uh, the larger goal and their contribution and their role also becomes very, very clear in that because it is not the standalone, you know, facilitation of a program, but their active participation throughout the intervention plays an important role uh, in this thing. So, so balancing uh, 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 between the expectation as well as their active participation throughout the intervention mm -hmm. uh, is something uh, which we, uh, you know, ensure that. Uh, in our organization and we found fantastic results out of it. High degree of engagement okay. of the people wherein the learning is not as uh, something which has been stick on them. So people aspire to be a part of, you know, these interventions and technology definitely plays an important role in, uh, you know, uh, managing all these uh, uh, thing and uh, uh, it uh, actually enhances the you know user experience as well as uh, bring uh, fantastic results on ground. This is the way I see, uh, uh, you know, answering your question. No, I mean, your vision and the way that you're dealing within your organization seems perfect, actually, I would say. I would quickly like to have takeaways from all of you for the audience to know as to what is there to look for them in, in times to come in future and what should they be actually ready with. So I can begin with Rathor, sir. Sure, thanks. So I think, um, you know, a few quick thoughts on if you're saying specifically, you know, learning, learning facilitators, trainers, uh, as we used to call them or call them, you know, what are some of the things they should really watch for? So um, one thing we've already talked about that trainers should see their roles, you know, as facilitators more and more, uh, you know, you, you know, we'll find that we are not necessarily in formal training sessions, but more and more in smaller groups uh, and actually facilitating uh, a real um, sort of task or change or a project. Mm -hmm. So of course, this mindset shift from just training delivery or stand-up delivery to, to facilitation. 
but i think there are there are a few skills that uh, that learning professionals should should look to sort of um, to hone uh, and and most of all learning delivery professionals or trainers and so some of these are um, you know are around improving research skills so you know being able to research quality information put it together uh, being able to organize um, especially as more and more training happens in a virtual environment um, you know we all know that a trainer has to have personal charisma and the ability to connect but right. are you able to translate that in a virtual environment is is super important as well um, being able to adopt i think some of our panelists talked about um, you know like the last year being completely unprecedented um, uh, for lnd and for businesses in general so how are how is a learning professional able to adopt to the unexpected um, and i think the rest of the skills are what we can call digital skills uh, so you know with video being as important or sort of as prevalent as it is it now i think learning professionals can be more comfortable creating and editing video Uh, rather than always be dependent on others so i think that's a good skill to develop mm-hmm. um we have to you know all companies make a lot of investment in you know in acquiring learning management systems and platforms so you know to get the value out of them it's important that um, learning professionals understand the system and get the most out of it understand how the insights work uh, and lastly uh, you know use social media uh, as an advantage as well or as something to engage Uh, with learners and really understand sort of where the learners really are and be on the same page with with them so those are some of the thoughts um you know that come to me uh, love to hear from others as well beautifully curated sir thank you uh, neelu ma'am from your end right it's it's so heartening to hear from uh, mr rathor brilliant points put across and uh, all the other panelists as well mr tandon and uh, sonika uh, if if i look at it the function learning and development i think these are the two words that actually define the function as well as the people who are into it it's a constant journey of going on learning as well as developing uh, so of course uh, like sir also said you know the research has to be there acquiring new concepts learning what's trending that is one part of it because unless we don't have knowledge we can't translate that into skills and uh, you know show it into action so that is one part of it learning knowledge building uh learning as well as adapting technology that is the second mm-hmm. part which has already been beautifully covered something else that i would like to say is uh, keeping the program centered to skills instead of roles so uh, you know not focusing on what role is the person in rather what skills does a person require to excel in that particular role the second point that i would like to share is uh, keeping the program bite sized gone are the days you know when we used to have 8 hours full fledged training of course it's catching back but the trend is still very slow so during that course during that duration most effective learning with the best of engagement that is a challenge that we all have as facilitators and in the lnd environment so here also comes the knowledge bit translating that bit into action making it really engaging for our participants and of course just not a you know a touch and a go away there has to be mapping as to once the knowledge is translated where is the action what's happening on the performance so the same concepts that used to apply all these year in lnd still apply however the dimensions the way we are looking at it the pace uh, the way we will map it is going to change for sure so these are I'm, some of the i'm, I'm sure the it. lnd trainers they will actually be benefit from from the takeaways that you people are giving in thank you so Sonica, much sonika ma'am what's your take on the same yeah so uh, for me i think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is um we will need to come up with relevant content and uh, uh, you know what is it that people will need to succeed in 2021 so i think uh, uh, engaging with our clients mm-hmm. trying to understand what is it that they need and coming up with contextualized uh, interventions is something that we as lnd uh facilitators need to really do uh and for that a uh, uh, significant client outreach networking is something we need to do proactively that's number one secondly in our sessions we need to keep the participant at the core rather than you know keeping uh, what is it that i want to deliver what is my ppt what is what is it that i want to drive i think we uh, learning to keep the participant engagement during the virtual intervention 
how is it that i'm keeping them then engaged during those 2 hours or 4 hours whatever is the duration of your intervention because your virtual intervention trust me cannot last more than 4 hours mm-hmm. right True. so how do you keep them engaged and hooked on to your session during those 4 hours and what are the number of messages that you are driving on the, in those 4 hours exactly. like nilu said that keep them bite sized so in those bite sized ses- sessions how many messages are you giving them you can't bombard them with too much exactly right so that's the second one the third one is contextualization you might be working in one industry so you might be an expert let's say in in infrastructure or you might be an expert in manufacturing or fmcg but every company is different within the same company sales will be different from supply chain will be different from hr so contextualization of every session will be very important so remember to contextualize it because today you are dealing with very very discerning audience you are not um, uh, you know one stroke does not meet all folks or work for all folks so yeah. you know even in this session uh, every audience will have a very unique need very so, true yeah so people are very discerning today you lose the uh, the the you know i just now saw one one of your part, uh, audience just dropped off so uh, you know you don't uh, you, you're not engaging to one audience you lose uh, their interest so so keep uh, that context that's right? a big challenge that's i i agree challenge. yeah so 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 that for me are the key, uh, key takeaways for lnd and trust me 2021 is us because um, uh, most organizations need to upskill uh, and reskill to succeed in 2021 that actually need that's actually the need of the hour i would say yes it, it's very important mr tanan what's your takeaway for the same so beautifully curated by vipul nilu and sonika the only point i want to emphasize here for the fellow uh, you know uh, uh, learning professional learning and development professional is that learning only happens when the behavior changes so we all need to put a lot of efforts on understanding what are the key behaviors for any of the interventions which we are leading on and mm-hmm. how to ensure that we are able to bring some sort of uh, impact on the behavior because results will be the resultant wherein the objective is change of behavior so that right. is the, uh, the one thing i just wanted to highlight thank you so much panelists thank you so much for the beautiful insight i am sure uh, our viewers must have taken amazing takeaways you know from this session and they would actually be you know noting down quite a number of points i also heard quite a you know new 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 points i would say and in a way i would say that how our lnd professionals you know actually putting in strenuous efforts to devise such amazing models that they'll be coming up with so thank you so much thank you so much for engaging our audience thank you thank you for having us thank Over you to you kathy it was an absolute pleasure being here thank you so gant for moderating it so beautifully thank you so much ma'am thank you right thank you so much it was a pleasure thank being you. with all of you thank you thank you bye bye you once again to all our panelists and thank you sugan for steering this very interesting conversation here for us ladies and gentlemen coming up next is the leadership development insights that is going to be from our speaker but before that let me remind all of you we have awards following up this summit so do tune in and stay with us while we take you through the leadership development insights by ruchira choudhury author leadership coach and founder of true north consulting talking to her would be ruhel amin senior editor bw business world i would uh, like to invite both of you on screen by requesting you to switch on your video and uh, mic please thank you uh, our next speaker today is uh, ms ruchira choudhury who straddles the corporate and academic worlds she coaches business leaders is an adjunct faculty at several top uh, tier business schools and runs a boutique consulting firm focused on orga- organizational strategy solutions ms choudhury has coached mid to c level business leaders across the middle east 
North Africa, China, India, and Singapore in industries ranging from oil and gas, financial services, government, automotive parts, healthcare, insurance, law, manufacturing, medical devices, and technology. Uh, and we are here to talk about her book, Coaching the Secret Code uh, to Uncommon Leadership, published by Penguin Random House. Thank you so much, Ms. Chaudhary, for joining us. It's my pleasure entirely. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is, since this is an event about people, about leadership, uh, I just want to go back and ask you, what triggered you to write this book in the first place? Thank you. Well, I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself and then we dive into the book per se. Let me show it to the audience. This is what it looks like. Uh, right, absolutely. Sort of spaghetti that sort of unbinds <laughs> itself. Yeah. But right. uh, so, so what, what triggered uh, the writing process, so how I wrote the book, is an interesting journey. Um, mm -hmm. I was leaving a large financial services organization. I used to live in Singapore. Uh, I was there for the last 14 years, moved to India only recently. And right. I was going, I was at this very uh, interesting juncture in my corporate life. Um, right. I was quite, I think, disillusioned by the toxic culture. And um, I really wasn't enjoying myself, I think, for the lack of a better word. And I got approached by my alma mater, the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business, where I studied and I also teach as adjunct faculty. And they were looking for an executive coach. And they said, oh, come on board and you know, coach the, the, we do a CEO program, why don't you join us? And I was a bit taken aback because though I've always been told by clients that uh, you know, I, I'm good at counseling, uh, when they speak to me, they get a lot of clarity. I didn't see myself as a coach, which brings me back to the question, what is coaching, right? We have all these images of uh, coaching being amorphous and fluid, not tangible, et cetera. So it was, I had to do a lot of soul searching and said, oh, I'm not a coach. I don't know what coaching is. So as an experiment, I joined this program for the, it's called the ADP program at the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business. And I realized that while I was certified in all these instruments, et cetera, I never explored coaching as, uh, as my mainstay. But when I went back to my alma mater and I started uh, coaching these leaders, it was quite a fulfilling experience because I could marry the classroom learnings very seamlessly with their work realities. And I think at the very basic level, I was, you know, like the cover of the book, I was helping them untangle knots in their head. I was helping make patterns out of these knots. And as I got into the coaching sphere, I realized it was a deeply, deeply fulfilling experience. And I started doing it in many other business schools. And a lot of people started saying, it's time that you started writing about your ideas. I had a professor who's been a great mentor to me. He's mentioned in the book, he talks about it. My spouse who has been fantastic, you know, as a great supporter, he's been saying right about it, but I didn't see myself being that writer. There was lots, you know, all of us have things in our head. I didn't see myself doing it, but then of course, uh, serendipity, Singapore You're to right. India and got this opportunity to write for the Mint, a column uh, on leader as coach, uh, which uh, was very, very successful. A lot of people said, oh, this is exactly what my life is about. This is what my boss is about. And so Penguin saw that column. And as the rest, as they say, is history. They said, can you, you know, convert that column into a book? So the book happened. Yeah. And needless to say, I feel very passionately about the topic. And I have been in organizations, like I said, where there's a complete vacuum of coaching. And I've also been very blessed to have bosses, managers, clients who morphed into fantastic coaches. So, you know, I saw the contrast. And I think it's an important message that uh, the book helped me right. get out to the world. So I was looking at the cover. I mean, I've seen the book as well. So it has a very metaphoric uh, knot, you know. Can you, <laughs> yeah. how was it like, yeah. one of the biggest uh, uh, tough uh, challenges for authors is to decide on the cover and everything. Oh man, it took forever. I can't tell you how long we work. And to be fair, we got some, we had a fantastic uh, graphic designer. I had some, I had a great team. They all helped. I had this, uh, you know, a gentleman helping me with my editing and the graphics. And we would all sort of brainstorm and say, it really needs to be a great cover. And what the cover does is pretty much, uh, I think, personify what I said to you. Mm -hmm. Untangling, going higher and shining brighter. And then it we goes up. To, yeah, yeah, it goes up because uh, in the erstwhile scenario, it was just, you know, uh, entangling. And we said, that's not enough. Right. Coaching just doesn't help you untangle. It takes right. you higher. It makes you a better version of yourself. And you shine right. brighter. 
when you make others shy. right right so uh, tell me uh, we have seen a certain kind of leadership emerge uh, uh, with the right of rise of uh, the market driven economy that we call it you know there's a certain kind of you know i mean the market aggressive every brand is aggressive they want a greater market share but in all of that a certain kind of leadership has come up uh, and there is a lack of human first approach it seems uh, uh, my question is how do we bring back that human first approach to leadership i think uh, the word i used you're using the word human approach i call it empathy and i think there's a strong case for empathy coaching has always been important but it has never been more important than it is today given our turbulent times the pandemic has truly changed the rules of the game right i think we need to go back and revisit what uh, how we define leadership traditionally because we've always been taught that a leader needs to have all the answers a leader needs to tell people what to do and therein lies the problem we are constantly being prescriptive rather than collaborate now what's happened is the world as we knew it has changed dramatically right it's there is what we call the vuca world there's a lot of complexity there's dispersed information there is uncertainty and no individual can have all the right answers and this is the time where you need to give people in your organization a voice you need to bring them together you need to bring them together and you also need to understand their reality so let's take the pandemic for example right um a lot of people uh, there was a research done by hpr and they said that 34% of employees feel that their managers don't trust them what that means is they're constantly calling on them checking in on them now my point is you have to appreciate that not everybody is in the same boat we are all in the same pandemic storm but our boats are very different Perfect. some of us have spotty internet connections we have young children our life stages are different so there is something to be said about the word you said you know being more human you have to cut people some slack of course you have to be cognizant that they don't slack off we are all here to achieve something to achieve our business objectives but that doesn't mean that we can't do that while taking people along in the journey while appreciating their individual reality while giving them a chance to speak their mind to bring them together in this sort of uh, you know in this crisis right. and i think some of the best leadership and coaching has emerged in these times right right so in your uh, interactions with uh, you know a lot of uh, corporate leaders uh, tell me what are the three uh, critical challenges that uh, they need to address to build thriving organizations uh, i think um, of course there are many challenges uh, uh, you know leadership is a huge responsibility it's not just about saying hey you have to you have to look at the people problem of course it's a lot you have to do if you were to just look at that uh, the balance scorecard which came into vogue about a decade or so earlier you have to ensure that you meet your numbers your revenue targets you have to ensure that there's governance there's your organization functions uh, that you uh, have great customer orientation that there's that you have internal systems and processes and of course at the heart of all of that is your people that you take them along in the journey so if i were to just distill it to two or three key things i think one of the biggest things is you have to ensure that uh you build a resilient workforce a workforce that can bounce back and leap forward and doesn't fall into the pits of depression which is something that has come to the fore in the pandemic the second piece is time and again and service and more service tell us that employees don't always trust their leadership so i think focusing on building those reservoirs of trust is very important so resilience trust part we talked about empathy and i think the fourth pillar for me would be decision making principle which is giving people a voice i think these are the four pillars if a good leader can truly embody them then you are what i call an uncommon leader in my right you know i mean in all the business uh, uh, education that is around and the academy and all i think they have been also stereotyped in the sense that absolutely. they have to be no nonsense yeah. uh, they have to be obsessed with command and control uh, absolutely how how i mean is uh, is the larger picture uh, is it's beyond organizations also where they come from i think they also talked that this is the leader this is what embodies a leader i think is where is the problem actually according to you i think the problem is a little more deep rooted 
so we go through business school we go through school and college and we're always told that the best and the brightest shines the brightest and this best and the brightest becomes this class monitor and then uh, at work we become you know uh, captains of that ship and we just to, we just it's just assumed that because we're such stellar yeah. performers today we will automatically become stellar leaders which as we know is not always the case because often these traits are in conflict with each other right so that's one part of the story uh, the other part of the story is that we we truly need to appreciate that leadership is is about taking others along in the journey it's about as you said the command and control style and it is a stereotype it continues to exist uh, I'll, i'll tell you what i will do i will quote kiran majumdar sure she starts she mm-hmm. starts a forward of my book very eloquent right. I, i was completely taken in she says i'm often asked about my leadership style and i turn around and say leadership is not about controlling it's about empower i think people need to be problem solvers not task doers right and while we keep saying that oh the command and control days are over it's collaborative style of leadership it has culturally seeped so deep into our dna that it goes back to what i said earlier it's about shining brighter it's being the best that you can be it's always telling people what to do it's giving them the answers because we feel uncomfortable if we don't have answers right and this new evolved style of leadership is about asking not telling it's it's surrendering a large degree of your control to the individual and saying what do you think how do you think we can make it happen it's not an easy task it doesn't come naturally to us we were never taught to do this so the answer long winded answer to your question is it's it's too deep rooted it exists but rather than fight, fight uh, fighting the stereotype of command and control i think we should try and talk about the alternative business model that does exist which is you can be a successful leader and you can do that while making your people successful you can elevate others as you elevate yourself and your organizations the two are not mutually exclusive right uh, tell me a little bit about the book i mean uh, some of the, the the process of it and and some of your favorite chapters in it you know if you can and and what would you tell uh, people who are listening to us you know uh, some incidents that really moved you while you were writing the book if if you could share anything of that sort okay so we we are not far from women's day so it's i think <laughs> i'm also been very very uh, blessed to have two women leaders on the cover of my book and these two women leaders are both in the forbes uh, most influential women uh, in the right. globe today so in the world today so obviously so let me uh, sort of talk about the, my favorite chapter i had to fight a little bit to include it in the book i have to say it's mm-hmm. called uh, enabling women leaders right and i've described how the coaching process per se should be identical it doesn't matter what gender you are but as a leader as someone who's who is focused on uh, making your people shine making them a better version of themselves do focus on a certain factors more than others when you're coaching a woman leader and i've tried to talk about the confidence factor because at the heart of everything we keep doubting ourselves no matter how successful we are no matter uh, you know how far and wide we've come we still keep questioning are we good enough to do it we constantly feel feeling guilty if we are not the ones uh, in control of the household chores it's so deep rooted in fact uh, there's an example in the chapter um, and shell sandberg has talked about it she said she talked to me about it on the phone but she it's also in uh, in a couple of her books so she talks about how when she got the offer for facebook uh, she was given a number and she said she was so excited to be able to work uh, uh, in an organization like facebook that she was she just couldn't believe her luck and uh, she said fantastic i'll go for it but she came back home and she was i think she was having this conversation with her uh, spouse who's no longer uh, and her brother in law who said to her shall you could get much more and she said uh, what if he doesn't agree and what if mark is not okay and so apparently he sort of uh, you know he looks at her and said shall seriously if you were a man would you accept it you could do so much better and sort of the whole thing puts it in in perspective because we are very happy to accept this because we feel this is what we deserve because 
the conditioning is so deep rooted so deep right True. it doesn't matter if you're a Sheryl Sandberg or if it's a Ruchita or if you're a super successful star or not such a successful star we're constantly mm. doubting ourselves when we get fantastic projects we tell ourselves oh can I deliver it will I be able to do it so I think that bit is my favorite because I've experienced it firsthand I a lot of the women leaders I've spoken to have experienced it and it doesn't matter right. You know what role right. you occupy, or how senior you are, or not. Right. So, so today organizations are focused on uh, training and coaching their employees. Uh, how can they make it better, according to you? I mean, how can it become more effective, uh, uh, in your view? So, I think the essence of my book is. Uh, I know we're doing this for an L and D conference, but I, I, the point I think I try to drive home is that. Coaching, developing, building the next line of leaders is every leader's responsibility. It's not something you outsource to human resources or L&D teams. They have a fantastic part to play. They can tag team with you. They can be the people that support you. But the, the, and they can support you in helping you craft bespoke or individualized learning journeys for your people. But the buck stops with you, right? It's your team. It's your people. And you are squarely responsible for their development. Uh, right. So. That's the bit, I think, that is the essence in the book. It is, you right. can't be a successful leader without being a coach and an enabler. And please work closely with your L&D teams and your HR teams to make that a reality in your organization. Right. My final question is, uh, what is the future of uh, business leadership like? You know, uh, do we see bosses becoming buddies? Uh, what is it like, you know, in your view? Okay, so I've written a book. It's not going to change the world. <laughs> and there's a lot of literature around it. But having said that, I think there's a growing acknowledgement. Uh, you know, we are taking baby steps towards it. It's not happening tomorrow. But I think there's a growing acknowledgement that, that it's no longer about telling people what to do. It's about asking them. It's about partnering with them, collaborating with them. Uh, and it's not just because... Uh, the world is telling you, it's because as I said earlier, no leader can have all the answers. The world's become a very complicated, very complex, very, very digitized space. No one individual has all the knowledge and the information. So it is in everybody's interest to harness the collective intelligence of their teams to work together and, and to truly take home that uh, recognition that when you shine the light on others, you just shine brighter. When you elevate others, you go higher. And I think that's what I've tried to talk about in the book. And from all the feedback Brilliant. I receive, uh, I think it resonates Brilliant. with a lot of people. Well, I surely hope it does. Well, well said, and I would request everyone to look at this uh, and buy the copy of uh, the book. It's called Coaching the Secret Code to Uncommon Leadership uh, by Penguin Random House. Thank you, Ms. Chaudhary, for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chira and Ruhail, for that really intriguing conversation. Now, before we move forward, here is a quick big announcement that I'd like to make for all of you out here. We are coming up uh, that it is evident that the role of HR is changing and many industries have undergone tremendous change due to the evolving technology, new employment regulations, and younger, more diverse workforce. Today's organizations have to deal with environmental pressures, rapid technology change, also the tougher competition that's happening, generating a need for the human resource function to help navigate through these transitions to increase its real and perceived value. BW Business World HR Excellence Awards 2020 is here to recognize this very excellence, identify and bring to front the prominence of these best kept secrets and celebrate the very best amongst us. Those who bear the torch of excellence in the HR landscape of India and by far are the guardians of India's finest people practices. Coming up soon next month is the HR Practices HR Excellence Summit and Awards. I'd like uh, all of you to join us in this uh, you know, endeavor. And also, if you would like to be part of the awards and would like to give out your entries, the nominations uh, entries are now open. So you can be part of the HR Excellence Awards 2021. We urge all of you to be a part of this summit and awards. Thank you very much. We will move now towards our next uh, online agenda.
We're going to now talk about learning and development and leadership. In this panel, we have with us Praveen Menon, CPO India's First Life, Anjali Raghuvanshi, CPO Randstad India, Professor Nathan Subramanian, Director, Institute of Public Enterprise. Suman Rudra, Head, Talent and Organization Development at Larson & Chobo. And moderating this session is Ruhail Amin, Senior Editor, BW Business World. Thank you so much, uh, Khyati. Uh, uh, thank you and uh, welcome our uh, esteemed panelists for this discussion. Uh, I hope everybody, I can't uh, see, I think everybody is here. Okay, all right, yes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to start uh, my first question uh, straight away and I want to go to uh, uh, Mr. Menon uh, to start with. Uh, so tell me, we have seen all, we have seen the conversation since morning and there's so many learnings that are out there. But I want to start by asking that what are some of the operational challenges that CLOs or CHROs face uh, and how to effectively tackle them, uh, especially given the last 11 months context. Okay, uh, thank you, Royal. Uh, you know, good afternoon to everybody, including the uh, esteemed panel members. And now uh, it's, a, it's a very, very valid question. And this question actually, uh, you know, not just now, but you could hear this question probably even a decade back. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, basic issues that uh, any CHRO or uh, a CLO today faces would be the fact that the organization would be asking that what is the return on investments on your uh, learning and training programs. Now, it's a very, very valid question to ask, uh, right. but uh, the answer is not so uh, simpler or so easier. Uh, right. The first of the, firstly, you know, one needs to really think about the fact that what is the time frame that one is looking at. Uh, any training, any learning program, of course, it doesn't give you quick wins. It takes right. time to give you return on investments. And, right. uh, uh, you know, and as an organization, as a learning culture, uh, you know, one needs to accept the fact that the so-called ROI uh, would come to you at a, uh, maybe at a later stage. So that's one of the challenges to define what is the ROI. The second challenge, what I feel is the fact that uh, there is a differentiation between a training program and a capability development program, isn't it? Uh, yeah. A training program is required for everybody to do their current job well. And a capability development program, according to me, would be building up the individual to kind of do their job in a dynamic environment, which is unforeseen today. Mm -hmm. So the question is that how do you balance this out? Uh, especially because of the fact that one has seen uh, this is let's assume we are moving towards a post COVID world mm -hmm. and uh, the business dynamics have completely changed in last about nine or 10 months. Everybody before COVID always used to anticipate that the new age business would be very, very different. Uh, but uh, as we speak, we are seeing it, you know, right, right now, currently, uh, you know, uh, the very fact that you and me are uh, in a virtual medium discussing is mm -hmm. a very, very different model that we are talking about possibly a year back. Uh, we, we would not have anticipated something like this happening on a regular basis. Uh, and so when I talk about capability development, if I am kind of building my you know team, my employees to mm -hmm. take on future, the future is changing at, at a much faster pace. So how do you align these both saying that, you know, the, the, the programs that I deliver and this, you know, speed of change that is happening around you, is there an alignment there? So that would be my second issue. One of right. the third issue that I see is that how do you build resilience in people and processes? Every right. time there is again a discussion that is happening saying that the processes that has got established possibly will not hold good in the future. It, it needs a constant change. Change is inevitable. It is constant. And, uh, and then how do you build up people? So these are some of the challenges. Now, the other question, Royal of yours is saying that, okay, if these are the challenges. How do you kind of uh, make sure that you overcome these, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and that is something which, you know, every one of us constantly keep thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the aspects is that, you know, what I feel is that learning cannot be an event. Uh, it has to be happening on a daily basis. Uh, right. You know, it has to get integrated as a part of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, gone are those days of employees actually working for nine to five. The requirement of the business is such that, 
you end up having longer hours right. so the idea is that okay if you were to provide some kind of a learning journey or an architecture to an individual can it right. be uh, you know at his time at his pace at mm-hmm. as per his requirement so that's why the concepts of bit size learning the concepts of uh, you know uh, mobile learning through an app based application the concepts of what is required is what is going to be offered uh, etc are some of the things which uh, we feel will uh, cater and address to some of these needs and i think the world over is actually moving towards it uh, we see a massive change in the way uh, learning and uh, you know uh, capability development programs are uh, being uh, rolled out in india uh, i think uh, according to me next about couple of years i think we'll be pioneers in many of these uh, world will be doing a catching up job with us and uh, you know so those would be some of the responses to your question from my side away you very well elaborated i think you have uh, pinpointed the pain points if i may call it uh, i want to come to you uh, mr raghuvanshi and ask you the same question and uh, what kind of understanding uh, is there from your perspective as far as uh, the operational challenges are concerned and the best ways to address them so wh- what is the rand stand view on that thank you and uh, yes i would agree to a lot of things praveen said uh, you know before me as well i think the biggest challenge uh, i would say for us is to how do you really create impact for business right that's a question that constantly you are haunted uh, with whether you like it or you don't and and that's always about okay if you have done an intervention if you've done a program how has it really impacted the lives of people the organization business outcome i think that's now challenge number 1 the second again uh, coming to the way today learning uh, and the platforms that have like you know as praveen also mentioned today we are in virtual mode and everything is happening you know while people are sitting at their homes so there is a kind of fatigue and exhaustion that comes in as well. with too much going their way and only in one format which is virtual so i think that's the second challenge uh, us as function have that how do you really keep your audience engaged despite uh, you know the fact that you know it is going to be like this for quite some time the third thing also i see is in terms of uh, individual ownership in the entire learning journey right it's always said that uh, how how you can take a horse to the river but you can't make the horse drink right so that's the same thing when you work towards creating a learning culture in the organization moving towards a self learning culture uh, you can give a lot of things to people but are people really absorbing and using it the right way and applying it back to work the right way so that's where i think us as fraternity have a lot of work to see how do you create th- those learning journeys how do you Uh, you know link development to a career g- growth or a career stream architecture per se so that people see value and find value in learning constantly and also i think uh, agility is a piece that uh, praveen just brought in to uh, the, the whole piece that there is a lot that's changing constantly in in situation like this how do you what behaviors what competency skills do you train your people on right that is the biggest challenge i think uh, uh, you know uh, the entire world is focusing on how do you make your people more agile and i think that's where also you know us as a function lnd as a function plays a huge role and how do you make your workforce agile and much more open to challenges and changes as you come in so these are uh, you know some of the challenges as as a function as hr as lnd that you uh, face and not everywhere we have an answer but i think uh, what to me works the best is that whenever you get into an intervention a program always set the expectations in the beginning and which means that you know people will always talk about roi but uh, you know you will uh, read 100 articles which says the roi model doesn't really work it's always about the expectation that the business leader is expecting and as long as you can show evidence i think you are there uh, we cannot really prove that yes every penny that you put in actually kind of the way it came out so i think it's about expectation setting it's about also uh, you know leadership talking about these things uh, you know really putting development as an agenda out there because when the leader uh, walks the talk it's much easier and the whole organization kind of rallies around that development is a very important agenda i think these two things definitely help you in kind of coming over to the challenges as we said about really creating impact through your you know your learning and development interventions you are on mute i think rohit sorry yeah 
Um, so, I mean, very well, well, valid points made, uh, setting the expectations, you know, uh, leaders uh, walking the talk. I think those kind of things do address the challenges to a large extent. I want to come to you, uh, Mr. Ruth, uh, uh, such a large organization. And uh, of course, you know, I mean, bringing on board and bringing in that sentiment at, at that mass level. What are the big challenges uh, that, uh, you know, CHROs face primarily according to you? So, um, um, I think according to me, uh, Ruhel, uh, um, you know, in the last one year has kind of tested all, uh, all the limits of, uh, I would say all the functions, including HR. Right. And, um, and I think uh, we have been sufficiently challenged to figure out that uh, how can we assist the business uh, and, and make the business survive and revive, you know, in these times. So right. I would say the HR overall has responded very positively and very, uh, you know, in a very agile and an active manner. So examples of, I think, uh, things like, um, you know, entire focus, and focus of HR uh, moving in the first few months to, you know, uh, health, wellness of the employees. Uh, once that was kind of you know established, then it started moving of how to make the employees still productive while they're uh, you know while they're working from home. Uh, then from there it, it moved to you know how to make their employees life uh, more engaged you know while they're still working from home because you know the loneliness and the isolation was kind of taking a toll after a couple of months. Right. And then when things were kind of reviving and looking bright, I think then it was moving to how, how to help business to revive their productivity and gain back, uh, gain back, you know, the, um, the lost business in, in whatever form. So it was more uh, going back to a drawing board and going back to see, you know, how, how to help the business in maybe in, in, in hiring some of the people or maybe in, in reskilling or re um re retooling some of this uh, employees also a lot of investment in it has happened uh, especially in a company which is not a tech centric organization where not by default everybody was working from home so so a lot of that investment had has happened through tools technologies um, buying of it assets um and and then it's the, the role of hr was to kind of not uh, is to kind of enable you know through uh, some of that through proper training so that you know, utilization of those assets could have gone up, you know. So, so for example, you know, we have, we were always using Facebook at work, uh, but in, in pandemic, the Facebook at work, uh, you know, use kind of, you know, ex in, increase almost like thousand times. Okay. <laughs> so, so I think some of those uh, products we had used, purchased a uh, lot of, uh, you know, some time back, uh, I think showed a lot of relevance in, in, in this, you know, uh, in, in this uh, today's time. So I would say this is the way I think I can, if I can recall pretty last 12 months, the HR has navigated and more or less in today's time, if you can, if you ask me, I think it is definitely, um, you know, looking forward for in 21 and to kind of uh, gain back the market share, the business, you know, and to gain back, uh, also to gain back the employee confidence, you know, in starting to work from home, wherever they have not started and wherever they have started to keep, you know, to keep focus of, you know, all the, precautionary measures but still be more um, still be productive so i would say it's a pretty much very complex game uh, and i would say the goal post keeps on changing at every uh, point of time maybe almost on a monthly basis sometimes in a more frequent uh, and i would say the hr organization in india especially has been able to do both uh, meet both that at the strategic level and also at an operational level uh, that is what my experience is right Great, we are joined by uh, Professor uh, Subramanian. I was waiting for him to join us. Thank you, sir, for being here with us. Uh, I want to direct this question to you as well. Uh, we have heard, you've heard the panelists before you, and uh, I want to also see this, uh, add a little bit of context that last 12 months, 11 months have also added and been a learning for all of us. Um, so overall operational challenges and how last year's bit added to it, you know, I want to understand your views. How can it, those challenges, what are the bigger challenges and what are the remedies for those challenges? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, but firstly, uh, sorry, I think I have lost you there. Well, firstly, I uh, thank you for the welcome. Uh, firstly, I'd like to apologize for the slight delay in uh, logging in. Uh, so uh, I, uh, my apologies there. Uh, so uh, I think in some ways, uh, you know, the uh, I, I was just, uh, 
uh, listening to my esteemed colleagues there, uh, preceding me, I'm the couple of people who talked there, Anjali and uh, Mr. Kumar. So uh, I, think, I think they kind of touched upon some of the things. I think last year, in particular because of COVID and so on, I think that's, uh, at least in the areas that I've seen, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I mean, traditionally we look at learning and development, we've been mostly looking at business performance, value, you know, and does it demonstrate value, productivity improvements, um, and, and so on. Um, but I think in some ways, uh, in the last year, there's been a, a much greater recognition of not necessarily just those performance issues, uh, but also what you might call well-being issues, you know, uh, because of the uh, issues around, uh, as, as Mr. Truman was just saying, for instance, work from home. Um, there's been many, uh, many number of instances. I think there's been typically many organizations in, in, have reported uh, higher levels of, you know, demotivation because of being cut off from among their colleagues and peers and that kind of thing. Um, so I think certainly you see a lot more uh, both uh, uh, conversation as well as uh, as well as. Uh, uh, articles and, and so on, people talking about things and how do we increase employee uh, motivation, how do we increase their, uh, their happiness, happiness if you like, uh, because if you have a happy employee, you have a happy organization, uh, and, uh, and well-being overall. And I think some of that will probably be permanent. I think it's uh, it's kind of increased the awareness in some ways that, okay, business performance, productivity is important. We also got to look at this other side. I think that's certainly one thing. Uh, the other I think, um, um, in some ways, I think, uh, again, I heard uh, Anjali talking about digital versus face-to-face. -face. I mean, that debate was there, I guess, even before COVID. But I think that has kind of magnified that whole thing because people being being at home. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a lot more of the digital that happened. So, uh, you know, trying to draw the balance between, you know, how, uh, how much of digital should one have? Uh, and, and at what point do we say, uh, there is a lot of evidence. In, so, sort of again, you see a number of people talking about the uh, the probably surface of digital in, in, in some senses of the uh, of the learning tools, if you like. Uh, so, is there uh, you know has the pendulum moved too far towards that end? And uh, so, you can see that dialogue happening as you know in terms of just the effectiveness of some of the learning methodologies. Uh, are we to the extent possible? How, how do we draw the balance? Have we swung too far to that end? And to bring back some of that face to face, um, uh, because the learning is not just the it's not just the knowledge as we all know. I mean, it is it's all that interaction and what we learn from each other. But you know, type of dialogue which is generated there when you're together. I guess that I think that's the other thing that's probably come in the last few years. I would say. Right. I think uh, business leaders, HR, I think uh, has been put to test. I mean, whatever. I mean, there was a time when people say this is the most. Uh, um, uh, it's the most convenient job and the best role to have, but I think uh, they have been put to test. Uh, the CHR, CHROs and CLOs uh, have been, I mean, I mean, they have been the front line um, for all the employees and given the emotional uh, turbulence they had. I want to come to you, Mr. Menon, uh, my second question to you. Uh, tell me, what is the ideal way to uh, develop uh, an effective workflow and encourage a conducive uh, learning culture in organizations, according to you. Okay. Uh, if I were to give a response to it, uh, you know, well, uh, there are many pointers to it. Uh, you know, one of that uh, could be that uh, where does the learning ownership actually lie? Uh, does it lie with the learner himself or herself? Does it lie with the manager? Does it lie, lie with the HR function or the training team? Or does it lie with the leadership of the organization? And, uh, you know, and the answer should flow from the top. Uh, as Anjali mentioned, saying that, uh, you know, uh, if uh, leadership is, you have got a bind from the leadership, then it eventually gets cascaded down to every single employee in the company. And uh, thereafter, you have a, uh, a proper uh, learning culture that gets created in the company. Uh, so that is required for an ideal workflow. That would be my point, point one, you know. The second would be that uh, the learning culture should be where there is no fear of failure. Uh, everything else is infrastructure like programs, feedback mechanism. All of those things are required. But the very thought that the, the learning culture should uh, propagate that, uh, you know, don't worry, even if you fail, you fail fast. Okay, So that is something which I think has to get cascaded down to people. So they will become more innovative. They are ready to take on challenges without the fear of failing. 
the third would be uh, you know you know the balance you one has to strike the balance between individual and organizational capability right uh, you know it is important that you have a vision of the organization you should know where the vision where the organization is actually going to grow or go and thereafter uh, synergize individual capability to that it has to talk to each other otherwise the learning or training will become very very siloed uh, you know uh, the fourth is the fact that um, you have to identify performance gaps today uh, if you survive today only then you can talk about future there's no point in talking about future bef uh, before you actually uh, do get your things right today so this also again there needs to be a balancing act and i also as i mentioned previously that learning cannot be just an event right it has to be a daily uh, kind of uh, uh, affair uh, on a daily basis the entire learning culture uh, has to get uh, created and cascaded down to everybody and everybody should be able to experience and consume that and uh, you know otherwise uh, if if it is just a one of a program people typically try and take a time off to attend the program with a view that of course you know there is nothing that needs to be done just attend a program and come back but the moment it becomes a part of the culture on a daily basis then the upskillment that we are talking about uh, will get entrenched into the system and i think that will be beneficial for an employee as well as the organization so these would be some of my responses right right uh, i want to go before i go to mr ratwanji i want to go to mr subramanian uh, once again uh, coming to you uh, uh what is your take on uh, building this ideal uh, workflow and conducive uh, uh, learning culture what are the what can i mean where does also that question which mr menon pointed that where does it start with that start with the leadership does it start with the employee how do you see this uh, conversation um i think i would kind of echo some of the things uh, he mentioned so uh, and i think again i heard uh, anjali mentioned it earlier as well so ultimately uh, you do need a certain buy-in from the top so if, if that isn't there it, it, you know no matter what you do it, it's going to be a hard sell so but that again becomes i guess part of the role of the i mean so we are not saying a you know, buy-in from the top therefore is the is the responsibility of the top but it is very much the um, the responsibility of the uh, i would say uh, the cdo or the chro uh, to get the buy-in Uh, but I mean, we're looking at two levels here. I mean, we had, so so that is that buying. But then equally, and that's where we could say, I think there's a, in some ways you could say it's really a buying at every level. But but you need that you know, sort of push at one level. But then I think as Mr. Manu was saying, you do need the ownership at at every level, but from the users. And if you don't have that, uh, it's not going to work out. Uh, so you need that as well. Uh, but then I guess part of the issue is that the challenge around how do you create that ownership. Now, some of that may come from from the the push from the top, uh, but that by itself is not going to suffice. I think a big part of it will really come when those uh, uh, stakeholders uh, feel and uh, feel that there is relevancy for that. Uh, so I think there you find the responsibility comes squarely back onto the L and D team or uh, CL or the CHLR. So how do you create material which these stakeholders or these people we are saying we want them to own it? but they are not going to own it unless they think yeah and i really like this you know this is this is very relevant to me i think there again um, so there is a you know that that responsibility to say it really kind of therefore in some ways you can see ultimately i mean i think there's no question accountability would have to fall with the uh, the the learning and development team or the chlro or the clo but it's question of how do you make it happen i guess that's what I'm right the ownership question so Uh, so one part is of course the relevancy which means you have to customize things um, i think one of the things you often find which are personal experience you have something you go through which is kind of for a number of people who who engage in that particular learning uh, you know sort of uh, uh, tool or the particular learning process it becomes sometimes a bit of the tick the box exercise uh, and that's when we you know the ownership becomes becomes a bit of a problem so if it is customized uh, when you're trying to understand what exactly are the needs of the different groups of people and customize it to their needs i think you know, your chances of getting that ownership uh, is is higher but then that's one part is the content but equally is the method of delivery uh, right and that is sort of you know become quite important where we say you know from passive to more active engagement make it more fun make it more interesting much more inter interactive uh, that again would ultimately result in, in, in greater ownership so i think it's a combination 
of things that will uh, that will eventually make it successful. Right. Uh, Mr. Raghuvanshi, uh, I mean, now we have a digital first attitude towards uh, all learnings uh, since we're all working from home a lot. Uh, tell me, has it? Uh, how do you make it more immersive? Uh, what is your understanding of uh, uh, creating an ideal workflow? Uh, given that you know uh, we have so much of distraction around, so many we work from home, so many responsibilities to take care of, meet the targets at the same time. How do you, in this complex, uh, can you know make it more effective for uh, your teams? Thank you for that. And I, it was really nice listening to all the viewpoints that came in. I think uh, one thing which is very, very clear to everybody is today is that skilling is important, right? I think uh, earlier there was a lot of focus and energy that used to go in just letting people know how important it is for you to constantly evolve and develop yourself. So with that becoming an uh, easier option, and in fact, there was a survey run sometime post-COVID uh, lockdowns, and people actually rated career progression as their top three priorities among the top three priorities as they were looking uh, their, uh, at their career in a very new way. So it has, it has been established that it's important. I think the challenge that lies at our end is in terms of how do you make that content available? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, uh, ensure that content goes in a form that's easy for people to absorb and understand? And, you know, everybody is uh, running this life, which is like, starting early in the morning till late in the night, people are these days working thanks to the work from home thing. So how do you in between, you know, ensure that the learning as an agenda is not derailed anywhere. And I think that's where it's important that you are using everything, every channel possible today to reach out to your learners. And that's something, uh, you know, I've experienced personally that not one thing, one thing does not work for everyone, right? It's different st strokes for different folks. So for some people, they quickly grab onto a learning management system and they go and pick courses on their own and to some you have to push right so that pull and push mechanism is something you have to constantly play around with get, engage with your audiences and see what's working what's not working and what needs to be changed so while we talk about agility in the rest of the workforce similarly your learning and development teams have to be extremely agile to see what's working with the learners and i completely agree that uh, while uh, as a function the ownership may lie with lnd with hr uh, but i also believe that to a large extent it's important to communicate that self plays a very very big role in this entire thing but then our journey is how do you ensure that self is as engaged and as interested in everything that you are you know providing in the organization so that's where i see uh, you know uh, where we need to work and where a lot lot of work is remaining for us right uh, mr rudra uh, uh, give me a sense of the lnt uh, story in terms of uh, how do you make uh, uh, your learnings, the internal learnings, the workflow, you know, uh, uh, how do you make it more uh, effective, engaging? Uh, how did you uh, uh, tie it through the period, the tough period that, that was there? Also, my additional question is, while uh, there is access to the open net, you know, uh, people do learn on their own. So how can an organization bring in that added value to what they are looking for? Okay, so on the first part, see, for us, um, you know, since uh, uh, my company is largely into the infrastructure business, you know, so, and uh, so, so our work happens uh, not from home, but uh, from, you know, project sites. So definitely when our project sites were closed because of all the restrictions, so people had a lot of time, uh, you know, at home. Uh, and I think... Um, we uh, we also uh, think took this advantage you know from an hr point to understand that at this point of time if something uh, you know we can keep the employees engaged uh, and that was uh, learning and and when i'm saying learning it is learning in different forms be it e learning be it app based learning or be it you know uh, uh, built learning virtual instructor led trainings so I think our, uh, and also collaborating with other agencies. In fact, we started collaborating with even, uh, you know, US business schools like Rosh Michigan, INSEAD, and uh, Harvard. And you might be aware, all of them were offering courses and webinars free, okay? Right. Which never happened in past, okay? So, and since we had already collaboration with them in past, we used to do programs uh, through them. So they offered many of these programs, you know, uh, which were obviously, you know, some some very good programs with the international faculty and 
and all being offered to us we offered to our leaders you know so i think that was a great learning opportunity and i remember in march of in the month of march our training program spiked almost like three times you know so uh, almost like um, 1000 to 1500 people were uh, doing courses in a month right okay. <laughs> so so that was a you know sudden spike which happened and uh, we obviously the spike tapered down in, in in the coming times but i think it exposed our employees a new total avenue of learning and not just uh, exposed but also got used to over a period of time that learning can happen you know online learning can happen sitting at home and um, and 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 you may still be able to do your work and still you know do learning so 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 i think that kind of realization that one doesn't have to always go into a classroom or a lab or a workshop you know to right. to so i think that was the biggest realization secondly i think we would say that uh, learning became the biggest engagement during those times so learning was not learning it was a biggest engagement for an employee to keep you know and uh, you know to keep their link uh, with a group of employees because learning always happens in groups so you are interacting you are discussing you are talking to your colleagues you know at least for the 2 to 1 and a half hours it was a, one of the biggest engagement of getting to know each other you know getting to hear from the other uh, so i think that became one of the biggest engagement and then till today and i think going forward also our digital learning or online learning is going to uh, be a good proportion of our you know uh, of our learning offerings right coming to uh, learning uh, from other sources of um, around in the internet so as i said uh, we have always you know collaborated with some of the best you know uh, uh, in the past and we continue to do so so for example we have uh, collaboration with harvard we do harvard mentors you know a mentor program uh we have all their um, e journals and newsletters and podcasts you know uh, subscribed uh then we also have uh, you know our own uh, you know mobile learning app uh, we have we have tied up with other uh, com- companies like cross knowledge and all who provide us content for e learning so i think what we do is that instead of opening the entire world to them we curate some of this content and source and curate and provide it to the uh, right audience who needs what so for a management level of um, you know uh, i would say um, uh, employees we we provide them certain different content for the rest of the people we provide a different content so there is this you know segmentation and and specification you know for what who needs what is provided so that they are not lost you know in this uh, in this entire thing no, absolutely So that's I think in brief I could say how we can respond. To it. I have uh, we have another uh, 12 minutes, so I want to have another round of questions. Uh, I want to come to you, uh, Mr. Menon. Uh, so in a, a market scenario that is now, you know, where the everybody is trying to bring back the business and uh, ROI is the metric that drives, and you know, everybody tries to thrive on it. In that kind of a mindset, where do you make time for learning? Where do you pitch that look? Learning is very important. How do you bring it and convince the teams that look, learning is also part of it? Yeah. Uh, so absolutely, time is uh, of uh, critical essence. Uh, that's the reason uh, why uh, you know a lot of organizations, including ours, uh, are able to actually provide learning on the go. now as uh, you know suman mentioned uh, that uh, you know there could be uh, various uh, app based uh, you know learning systems uh, which can be directly downloaded onto your smartphones uh, the e content gets uh, getting populated there uh, you know you know it you know you can learn right at the start of the day end of the day on a weekend whenever there is time so you know that could that is one aspect which uh, currently is getting applic- applied everywhere including most of the organizations the second is that uh, the content is the king even now i mean the program has to have it should be rich in its content right i mean content is available over net as you mentioned by ruel but what you take out from there and how you curate a program is of a very very critical essence again so if the content is not good enough uh, you know you will not be able to hold the attention of the audience at all uh right. the other piece would be saying that you know move from just an instruction to an experience kind of a uh, domain uh you know with so many applications coming in uh, with the fact like a netflix or a uh, amazon prime uh, also you know you know their their uh, you know instructional designs uh, is something that one needs to look at 
because it's so easy to log in, easy to have a look at it, etc. So some of your e-learning programs has to also factor in that aspect. Uh, the other would be, you know, because of this lockdown, uh, some of the uh, pieces like kinesthetic aspects of a training program actually has completely gone out of the window. Uh, at times, even that is required. So a lot many times, uh, although we say digital, this is digital medium for us. Because, of course, there are interactions. I'm sitting on this side of the table. You're on the other side of the table. And the panel members are actually talking to us. So it is kind of a, something like a digital. But still, it doesn't take care of the kinesthetic essence of a, of a touch or an engagement in a room, etc. And that is something which uh, people are missing. And everybody is trying to figure out, saying that, okay, how can we do something like that? Okay. Uh, also, the fact that... Uh, Gone are those days of we are only talking about content outline. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, more often than not times today, people talk about learning outcomes and objectives. Right. Uh, it's just not an outline. And also the fact that one has to balance out between awareness and reinforcement. Right. Uh, and these are some of the aspects, if you build it as a part of your, uh, you know, learning roadmap, uh, you know, your design uh, I guess the acceptance of the programs, uh, the entire architecture of the programs becomes much more easier for us to cascade it down to people with, of course, the technological, uh, you know, innovations that has happened, uh, that, you know, everything is available with a click of a button on the move, on the go. Right, right. Very, very, very well put. Uh, I want to go to Mr. Uh, Subramanian at this point. And so tell me, uh, what are the key factors that you take into account uh, while curating the right instructional design. So your audio is on mute, I guess. Okay, uh, so um, I think that would be essentially maybe, uh, given the question you asked, would be essentially building upon, I guess, some of the points Mr. Menon just covered and uh, uh, Mr. Rudra as well. So, uh, so, uh, so I guess some of the factors would be, so yes, uh, Content, very important, obviously, because if content isn't there, then, you know, it, 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 there's no relevancy. Um, but I guess some of the uh, sort of building on that, it is demonstrating that relevancy. Uh, so, yes, it is relevant. We, you know, we have judged that it is relevant, but then how do we actually demonstrate it to the particular stakeholder or the particular employee? And also, how do we communicate it? Uh, so one of the things, I guess, which could uh, help while you're curating your content there is bringing in an element of improvisation where it's not a fixed standalone curation, but it is kind of, it is adapted to suit the needs of a, so you, you, to suit the needs of the particular employee. So they can pick and choose depending on the objectives, what it is that they're looking to accomplish. And then on that basis, so it's sort of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic, flexible curated content, which really evolves to suit the particular need of the need of the particular employee or the stakeholder. Um, so as I'm saying, a yeah, demonstration of that and the communication of that, very important. And how does it get across in, uh, in, in terms which they can then link back to their own objectives? I think that's the other important part, uh, which, which should ideally be reflected in that content which we are getting across when it's curated as to say, okay, what are your objectives? And then some form of mapping of those objectives to the content. That's when they are uh, going back to the point that was earlier made as to that's when they, you know, how do you get them to own the own the entire program of the content. So when they can clearly map that process and they can see this is how it links to my objectives, I think that would be a greater ownership. So I think, and then of course, the points which were covered earlier, while curating, you always want it to be interesting. You don't want it to be, you know, sort of uh, where there's a level of engagement, interactivity, experiential, you want all of that there, there as well. So I think those are some of the things I, I would sort of touch upon when you're looking at uh, making it uh, interesting and relevant to the stakeholders. Uh, Mr. Ruvanshi, to you, two quick questions. One is that how do you make time uh, for uh, learning, you know, make convince employees in a, ROI kind of a driven context. And second is how do you then curate the right instructional design? Yeah. Uh, so I would say uh, two things as I was listening to everyone, uh, which I feel uh, has always worked very well for us is we always look at making every, especially uh, key interventions aspirational in nature. Because if you see as an individual, when you have 20, 30 things around you, you always want to prioritize which you want to pick and choose and which you think will make sense for you, right? So when you know that some intervention of your organization are critical to the success of the organization, you must make them aspirational for individuals. 
individuals. So simple ways of doing that is creating certifications. So people love to have uh, certifications around their name that they've done something. So when you create levels and certifications, people aspire that, okay, let me clear one and then clear two and, you know, gain these. The second thing that we also do is to, you know, kind of uh, bring the sponsorship around these programs, create action learning projects, which has also been uh, something that makes people really look forward to the program that they know that they'll have visibility and exposure to the leaders as part part of these programs. So they look forward to those. The third aspect is really involving manager from the beginning of the program. And this has worked very, very well because many times you put your individuals into a learning course, but the manager is completely away from everything that the individual is experiencing through the program, right? So how do you bring the manager at the say on the same page along with the learner to ensure they both talk the same language and the manager experiences what his or her team member is going through and what's expected of them. I think these have worked wonders in terms of over and above the content in the entire designing of the intervention to ensure that people really take learning seriously and they make the most out of it. Right, right. Uh, Mr. Rudra, um, how, how do organizations stay uh, learning first or uh, then profit first, you know? Um, is there a way to it? I mean, is it doable as well? Yeah, so I think um, learning um, uh, will remain first if learning is able to, uh, uh, I think, appropriately deliver, uh, appropriately, or I think, uh, uh, and with the right uh, data points, uh, you know, make the business and the leaders understand that how the learning is able to help in the growth of the business. I think right. the earlier concept of, uh, you know, typically in learning, there was an earlier concept of mandates, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how many mandates, how many training, how many programs, how many initiatives, it was how, how many, it was too much, it's largely about numbers, you know, how many you want to do. But I think that that entire thing has moved from, you know, how many to who, and basically from man days to man behind the days, okay, <laughs> or woman behind the days. So what I'm trying to drive at is that it's the person who is, who, whom you are trying to develop matters more than all these numbers. Business leaders are not impressed today saying that, you know, we have done 100 programs, we have covered 100% of our employees. They said, okay, the, how does it help me? Okay. But if you tell them that in the last uh, one year, I have produced, uh, you know, I have been able to uh, groom at 20 managers who can take up your next level of leadership, okay, or who can take your business manager role or who can lead your project. Okay. That makes a sense to them. It may be a lesser number, okay, but the number... Uh, it makes a sense for him because he knows that tomorrow if he gets a new business, he's looking for a new guy in a new line of business or in the current, he knows where to look. Right. Okay, he doesn't have to. So I think that that uh, that entire perspective of, you know, the man behind the days or the woman behind the days have to, has to, you know, gain more and more, uh, I think, uh, prominence. And the HR job is going to be this only going forward, you know. Right. Um, in kind of highlighting that, yeah, yeah, we are able to provide, you know, what you require. Last five minutes, and I want to make this uh, super fast, uh, twenty-second answers very quickly. I want to come to you, Mr. Subramanian, uh, first. That what are two big shifts that you would see over the next two years as far as learning and developing that, you know, effective learning in organizations is concerned. Um, I think one is probably a move, a, a move away, I wouldn't say entirely away, but move towards uh, as against your typical KPIs, such as skills and knowledge towards uh, increasing competencies and behavior. I think there's already quite a lot of focus on that. So I right. think I, I see learning methodologies uh, reflecting that. And the second is, uh, I guess, to we talked about this dynamic environment. So preparing people, not necessarily again in terms of skills, but changing their mindset, their attitudes and attitudes towards coping with this dynamic environment and becoming transformational leaders. I think that's the sort of thing you might see increasingly reflected in learning programs. Mr. Menon, quickly, your, your thoughts. Okay, uh, you know, according to me, it should be authentic. Uh, it should build careers, create opportunities, because what is it there for me has to be answered. Uh, you know, that's one. And as uh, Professor said, that agility is critical. Uh, you don't even know that what is uh, the uh, you know environment going to be, uh, you know, in a few years time. Uh, and possibly you will not be able to plan it right, uh, right today. Uh, 
but uh, you know through the programs if you kind of trigger a thought that whenever the dynamic change happens uh, that is a time when you as a professional is ready to take on those dynamics and you will come out with solutions that would be required then uh, is is a must so building people in terms of their agility and make and kind of uh, you know making them ready to take on the dynamics and how only a future will you know tell us but in their mind people should be uh, you know ready today that assuming the fact that a lot of things are going to change in the future and that's how uh, the learning uh, architecture should factor these aspects perfect mr raghuvanshi quickly Yes, I would say um, let's take the I out of ROI and replace it with application. I and it's very important that as a leader we drive in the organization that learning is important, so that even the cynical manager knows that uh, blaming ROI is not going to work, and learning is an agenda that organization must drive. Brilliantly put. And finally, Mr. Rudra, your final thoughts. I think thoughts? Uh, I said it earlier also. So I think it is the the person behind the learning whom we should be concentrating on, and even if they. Uh, progress in his uh, career and life is incremental but that incremental makes a lot of difference to that so even incremental progress we should be you know looking at but very specific to the person you know how we can help him in grow so that that is should be the focus so well i'll just like to sum it up uh, one anecdotal uh, you know line uh, a cfo uh, you know tells an hr head that you know if i invest in uh, training and if the person actually quits and goes uh, what happens so the hr or learning so because it's a learning session Uh, reverts back and uh, says that in case if you uh, don't train them and they stay back then what happens so Perfect. that i would submit up in terms of uh, finding okay, out what is a r and roi uh thank you to the only lady on the panel and gentlemen uh, for this wonderful session um, been great uh, some really key insights into what what learning is like and how organizations can make the most of it uh thank you so much for taking time and joining us today uh over to you kyati Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again to all our panelists for taking out the time and sharing your insights here and thank you Ruhel for steering this interesting conversation. Ladies and gentlemen with that we are moving on to our last panel for the day but uh, don't forget that right after the summit we have the award ceremony that will follow. Moving on to our next panel discussion which will talk about learning and development in 2021 and ahead future trends. I'd like to welcome our panelists on screen, Mr. Shrikant Lonikar, CHRO and a director on board of Pernod Ricard India. I'd also like to welcome Avdesh Dikshit, CHRO Acuity Knowledge Partners, Seema Singh, sure. CHRO India Post Payments Bank, and moderating the session is Aditya Kohli, CHRO Clicks Capital. So, very warm welcome to all of you. And uh, Aditya, I'd leave the screen to you to take the conversation forward. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Kathy. Uh, really appreciate uh, getting the opportunity to talk to a fairly eminent panel. Um, as Kathy uh, introduced everybody, we've got Avdesh, Srikant, and Seema. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, you know, we've got a very interesting topic uh, that we've got uh, for ourselves: learning and the future of learning. Um, and and I think it's really relevant, with especially the pace of change that's going <clears throat> around. Uh, we we are seeing. you know we are seeing technology change at a very rapid pace we are seeing connectivity grow we are seeing workforce changing in the way it is uh, we are seeing technology in the way uh, it is stored in the way it's processed we are look, seeing advent of drone we are seeing advent of uh, uh, ai ml so there is a lot that's happening and and you know to kind of add to it we've also Uh, got covid which has really accelerated everything by multiple factors um you know today if i if i look at it we've almost got a billion uh, phone users in india and and the thinking is almost 50% of india has internet connectivity now what what does the future look like and and i think the big job of this panel today is going to be unpeel uh, the layers a little bit and peek into it it's a little bit of crystal ball gazing it is uh, it is trying to make educated guess uh, using so much of background so much of knowledge that each one of them uh, one of the panelists bring to the table today um i just I, you know i just want to kind of add one more point before i i will open it up for the panel but uh, you know in the past there was a huge amount of focus on buying talent you know if an organization is trying to do something new we would buy talent 
me as well as many of our hr fraternity was uh, guilty of doing that but with the half life of the talent shrinking to less than about 3 years uh, buying just is not really an option anymore we have to kind of think about how do we groom the talent for the future change and and and, and that creates multiple paradigms it creates a big paradigm for our workforce it creates a big paradigm for the organization their stakeholders and it creates a very large paradigm for the professional for the hr and the learning professional so today what we will do is uh, i will open up this question to my panel and uh, let's start with avdesh avdesh why don't you give us a view of how you see the workforce evolving and hence what do you see changing from a workforce perspective especially in looking at learning uh thank you aditya am i audible aditya okay so um first of all uh, thank you business world for putting this together you know i was also listening to the earlier conversation looks like uh, we already have had a lot of conversation about around learning and development already you know throughout the day so i'm not sure if i'm going to add uh, anything new which has already been said but as aditya mentioned uh, let me let me uh, you know share a few thoughts from the perspective of where i stand and when i say i am talking about you know we, what we are experiencing in uh, in our organization and you know then maybe we can build up on that and see you know what uh, you know what else can be contributed by other other uh, you know panel members you know see one thing is one thing is very clear aditya and i'm sure that you know uh, it does not require any kind of you know discussion everyone is talking about it which is that the entire learning or for that matter entire workplace design or the entire workforce practices are going to be extremely hybrid now the question is that you know what percentage of this whole uh, work system design or workplace design or for that matter to what extent what percentage of workforce is going to be operating in a hybrid model and i really don't uh, you know think that learning and development as a function is going to be uh, untouched by the, the 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 movement towards the hybrid what we are surely experiencing is that the percentage of the percentage contribution of online learning you know to the total learning is already changing and as i said it's nothing new that i'm saying now the question is what does it imply for the for the hr function or for the training function and for the workforce uh, in general my belief is that you know my my belief is that if you you know very in a very simple manner if you bifurcate training into uh, you know technical skills and soft skills i would say that technical skills are not going to be impacted as much as you know we would see the impact on soft skills technical skills and when i say technical skills i am including you know functional skills you know coming from a financial services uh, company i can give you example for example financial modeling you know you could learn financial modeling as much in a classroom setting as much possibly you can learn in online setting but just imagine what happens to soft skills they were already you know soft skills were already very hard to acquire and i think they are going to get even harder to acquire uh, in a in a hybrid model so there is going to be a limit to which you can experiment with this entire uh, you know the euphoria around uh, you know learning and development and the entire workplace getting hybrid because there is going to be a limit beyond which you really can't learn uh, soft skill on a on a hybrid model just to give you an example you know how do you uh, you know teach people to collaborate online or for example how do you build teams when uh, the team members have never interacted face to face uh, you know how do you onboard employees you know how do you you know uh, you know include them into the culture of the company when they have really not met the manager or the hr department or their peer group uh, in face to face setting to my mind you know one one large point that probably this panel discussion can you know this panel can discuss is while technical skills and some skills which are hard skills can be taught over online platform what do you do in terms of workforce getting the workforce ready for the for the culture what do you do for workforce to learn from peer to peer interaction which is very important in a in a in a physical setting and what do you do uh, you know when you are faced with the with a challenge where workforce is not able to leverage the power of informal networks uh, you know peer to peer learning and what what kind of challenges it poses to this entire lnd uh, function you know 
my last comment you know uh, you know uh, you know maybe we you know we can you can come back to me again you know once everyone has spo- spoken as my belief is my belief is that as far as workforce is concerned while i'm not as i said i'm repeating myself i'm not worried about the technical side of skill building and what you can acquire financial modeling valuation risk management and all that that can be picked up in online setting but i think one of the biggest challenges for the workforce is going to be feeling very comfortable with the culture of the place feeling very comfortable with the fact that you know on day one i join and there is somebody else i can ask you know what is this company all about you know i can ask somebody oh by the way during the induction program i i couldn't understand what they're talking about you know can you help me and then you go for out for a coffee break and say oh my dear friend you know you join with me together and you know can we you know can we exchange notes as to how do you navigate this company you know so from my perspective i think it you know it's going to be a very very challenging times for uh, people you know in case we are assuming that almost everything is going to be driven by automation ai and almost all form of learning is going to move uh, you know so, to the, to the uh, avdesh i i think uh, thank you for the perspective i think yeah. so you know very, that let me stop there and maybe we can we can we can pick up the subject again you know sure uh, am i audible yes, yeah aditya you are you are sure so uh, so i i think it's it's a very good perspective and uh, and the point about technical skills and behavioral skills and the approach to culture is a very relevant one and i think a lot of the focus would be around how do you create you know if i was reading an article which talked about close to 70% of our workforce in 2025 would be hybrid right now the challenge or if that is a reality going to be a reality the, some of the questions that you posed are very real you know culture uh, if you're not present together how do you how do you how do you cascade the culture and you know we've been taught that culture is a form of storytelling it's rituals it's artifact in the absence of an office how do you do that um so i i'm going to um, you know request uh, seema to kind of give me some thoughts on on the subject uh, and maybe abdesh uh, sorry maybe uh, shikant you can kind of add add to it post that uh, so good afternoon everyone great to be here um i would st- give a brief uh, experience which i had in india post payments bank was little different from what i had for past 30 years in a p- normal public sector bank you know i had a challenge of uh, training my own people that was a workforce of roughly 2000 officers i had a challenge of training the master trainers and i had a challenge of training 250 the th- 1000 people uh, the postmen and the rural postmen called gramin dak sevaks and above all i also had to you know train to some extent the customers the basic customers were the rural people who had to be trained on how to use the digitized mode so it was a very challenging experience and it has been it is still ongoing so challenge was to like officers who were coming from other organizations or maybe coming for the first time they had a as uh, avdesh was telling ki it's okay like more than technology we need to bring a sense of belongingness towards the organization so that you have to they, they take the um, focus of the organization forward but training 250000 people or maybe 300000 people who have been traditionally doing for a typical work of delivering dark or maybe uh doing some kind of banking business also for the department of post but converting them or bringing them an attitudinal change as avdesh was saying to bring them and make them feel that they are bankers so that was a big challenge you know like to train them and this was a big very big training program and this could not have happened without the technology so we identified around 5000 master trainers from within the department of post because department they were from department of post and we did the training for the master trainers uh, you know on the banking regulations and the compliances and the products and processes all these things were taught to the master trainers and then these master trainers went all across the country and they trained these 250000 people and this is now still ongoing because more and more gramin dak sevaks are being uh, recruited by department of post then they cannot unless they are certified 
and they have to be trained and certified only then they can do a banking uh, activity so Seema, can, can i ask a question uh, sorry to kind of interrupt you in the middle can i ask you you know when we look at a uh, you know uh, postman today his role over the last 10 years or 15 years has changed so dramatically he is not only doing one thing now you we've got a bank uh, attached to it so as the role has evolved and how do you see his role evolve in the future and how do you prepare the organization to be able to cope up with that from a learning perspective yeah that's it see when the bank see this is a startup bank the bank got officially launched on 1st of september by honorable prime minister in 2007 18 now you think of it we've come a long way but there's a long journey ahead so we are there is we we're getting a very good response i mean i am amazed to see i i just want to share you one number during the pandemic when people were sitting at homes and were not stepping out the postman and the gramin dak sevaks went and gave door step services to the people at home and you know we've entered into i mean we executed 4 4 crore transactions on aadhar enable payment system to roughly to the value of 10000 crores so Amazing. it's a huge future you know when we were tying up with uh, department of corporate affairs for training uh, institute the secretary the then secretary said ki you know we are entering into a third financial revolution third revolution which is the financial revolution because we will be we 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 can reach to the every corner of the country where the banking services are not there but dakia is there and dakia is a very trusted person yeah so this and once the p and it's it's you know very heartening to see the gramin dak sevaks doing great jobs no, and I some of them you. are very enthusiastic and very keen learners and we've made the training programs in a very very simple manner simple in the sense we we developed a training program which was more video based simulations animation films so that you know and in 13 vernacular languages just to make people understand simple was simplicity was the uh, you know key word for our training content only I, I to Yeah. I I think Seema I'm just going to pick a pick up you know I think I think you put two points out there which are very very interesting as you're looking at the future of learning simplicity and personalization you know you talked about 31 languages this is like incredible personalization uh, thank you Seema uh, Shrikant any perspective from your uh, your experience to add to it thank you Aditya and uh, first of all thanks to uh, business world for inviting me Uh, happy to be here i th- i think you know first and foremost learning is a very noble thing uh, that has to be respected you know it, it, it the moment it becomes something like a transactional thing or something that needs to be measured like a business result then it becomes very tactical and we have seen that many companies in past years they have done so much of training but nothing has significantly changed there you know uh, i'll just uh, refer to the point that avdesh made earlier that a uh, workforce need to be ready for the culture of the organization through training you know and just flipping the point i am i also believe that the culture of the organization should be ready for workforce learning and that that's where i think the responsibility of the management and particularly the human resources professionals that comes into play that how do you build a culture where people will actually love to learn in your organization you know for example at pernorica we we have a approach called listen you know where we say that learn that is most important thing that what you want to learn how you want to learn and then you innovate your own methods and your own scope of learning you know that that is your choice and then we need to provide a support that is required for that learning and then you help people to transform out of that learning and most important thing is about energizing them to use the next generation technology or something that is so easy for people to use so one of the things that we have is a program called ananda under ananda ananda as we all understand by the word is happiness or joy or bliss you know if people are happy for longer periods of time they are likely to be more engaged and if they are more engaged they are likely to be more productive the simple link like that to engage people then you use learning as a plot platform you know and not only learning related to their work but anything and everything that they aspire to learn what is the role of hr here is that 
we should nudge them you know and not handhold them that this is the right thing that you should be learning but if you want to learn something else or not want to learn this it's your choice but what is what the learning should lead to is development of people and development will lead to growth of people that is the clear link there if people grow that is what they aspire for learning will automatically get that kind of a momentum and leverage there that's yeah, my view. actually incredibly well said and it's a great segue into our next uh, uh, next implication so to say right uh, or imperative so to say which is about how do you create that ecosystem and you you talked a little bit about creating that ecosystem uh, which fosters learning for the organization and their employees but in many cases about also uh, the ecosystem uh, that you're connecting with you know i, I remember from my experience uh, you know uh, at a telco before this where a large push was being made to individuals or people who had never connected to the internet before and it was a very daunting task now how do you do a uh, you know one step internet right so it's and and getting people ready to make that first step is a big one you know after that subsequent steps become easy so maybe uh, you know i will go to the next part and maybe uh, you know let's start with seema seema if you can give some insight um into the imperative out here so what you rightly said was how to connect to the people or train people who never had that kind of internet access also so you know this this was a my department of post where you know the model was such that their regular postmen were given handsets by department of post but all almost 1 lakh 80000 people were given Uh, handsets the mobile phones or you can say the micro atms and the biometric devices by our uh, bank and we are also paying them for uh, for the sim card which they are using on a monthly basis but that also has a data in it and which they are accessing for the transactions so when the training was happening the training was little bit of um, theory but most of it was on that handset the it was as i initially also said that it was more of a practical training giving make them because most there were a lot of people and even now they have not ever seen a smartphone or they have not even used they are generally using feature phone if at all they are using a feature phone mm -hmm. so making them familiar to that smartphone or making them use the uh, internet for banking transactions was a very interesting journey and it is it is being done on on an ongoing basis and you will be surprised to know that we've got a self learning portal which is accessible to 300000 people and you know any time because it's a startup bank you products are getting evolved on an almost monthly basis a new product comes and then we need to educate people and train the people who are have to actually implement and get the, these transactions done at the ground level but this self learning portal has become very uh, it's accessible to everybody and people are actually using it so it, it's 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 a fantastic example uh, uh, seema you know i was uh, in a in a cab ride and i will not name which company but there as there are only two uh, big ones around uh, so i was in a in a, in a cab ride and um, this cab Uh, person or the driver says you know give me a five star rating please give me a five star rating and don't give rate me badly uh, obviously we'd kind of gone through a he'd kind of cut across in a manner where it wasn't very uh, very safe i'd say so he he was pleading to me almost to say you know give me a good rating so uh, i smiled to him and i said look if i gave you a bad rating what would happen he says if i got too many bad ratings they'll send me to training uh <laughs> and uh, and you know i i lose a lot because of that but i thought that was such a fantastic on in the work method to get somebody to behave and act it's a, it's a gentle nudge but to behave in the right manner uh, to show the right behavior right so i think i think the nudges of uh, getting a large organization to behave in a certain manner uh, and picking up shrikant's point of creating that learning agility uh, is is probably one of the biggest tasks of leaders in an organization uh, as as you think about the change that's coming through uh, uh, maybe maybe abdesh could you add based on your experience uh, what have you seen 
No, I think uh, both you, Aditya and Srikant uh, touched upon a very important point. In fact, the, the original question that you asked was around, you know, how do you create an ecosystem which is, you know, conducive to learning, you know, and, you know, you know, how do you how do you really uh, do that? You know, see, first and foremost, I think Srikant touched upon this subject. You know, to my mind, I can't imagine a situation where leadership and when I say leadership, I'm talking about the CEO the direct reports and maybe one down you know to the direct reports of the ceo that entire leadership leadership team or extended leadership team is not committed to learning culture and every time see while i'm not going to dilute the fact that you know everything that you do in a capitalist organization or a business organization must be linked to profits and must be linked to the roi that you generate but if you start on that footing, then I think you are getting it wrong in terms of building the right kind of uh, ecosystem. You know, as I said, I'm not saying that you should not be doing it. Ultimately, everything that, you know, we as an organization do, which are for profit, should be towards, you know, increasing the value of the company, you know. So my mind, you know, there are only two things I'll say very quickly. One, as I said, the leadership. Leadership must be committed. Come what may come, you know, even if it is COVID times, non-COVID times, you know, we should be convinced as leaders that learning plays a definite role in terms of creating a right kind of culture, which ultimately is going to pay off. And you don't want to start with the ROI calculation right at the beginning before you have launched that journey. So that is point number one. And secondly, I think I agree with you, Aditya, about the second point you said. Once you have created that, you know, once you have created that intention, then comes the, you know, nuts and bolts of it, you know, the training system and the training learning management system and, you know, technical skills, soft skills and all that. And then finally, you know, uh, what you were talking about this driver is that the pull and push mechanism within the employees where there are certain practices which are going to be pull, which means that you need to create a training modules and training practices which are very experience based and people get excited about it and they enroll. So that's one part of it, which is creating a, a pull part of it. And push part is going to come from the fact that there has to be a nudge, as you rightly said, that there is there should be something in stake for employees if they're not you know, offering themselves for uh, training. I would not go to the extent of penal action you know, to begin with, but obviously you can link it with performance, you can link it with rewards, you can re link it with recognition, you know, like the learning of the, uh, you know, the most learned, you know, the, the department which has shown highest amount of learning and all. So in summary, what I would say is all about leadership culture, the intention of the leadership. Second is about the entire architecture that you create, and I really don't think that you can get it wrong if the leadership intention is right. And then you create pull and push mechanism within employees, and that's how you create an ecosystem, <laughs> which probably will function very well. You know, Avish, really well said. I think I think you encompass encapsulated uh, the key aspects. But maybe I will add one more, and, and I think uh, it's something that I've seen work well in my experience, which is. Uh, a network of influencers, you know, within an organization, you have these people who really stand out. Absolutely. Uh, these, these are the people who are either the, you know, they, they are so, so called hidden stars within the system, but, but the team or the group that they work in really kind of holds them in very high esteem. I think a lot of focus should also be given to identifying this group because what they do is really very quickly emulated by the rest of the organization. And, and that could be a very important group also, as we are thinking about the learning ecosystem. Um, no, well, said, any... Aditya, no, I would agree with that. You know, I think the informal networks and, and, and what you're talking about, you know, having those mentors inside the company and those informal, informal networks, which are inducing and inspiring people. That's very well said, actually. Uh, Shrikant, any, uh, sorry, Seema, yeah, ma please, 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 she can't go ahead. I think to what Adesh was saying is what we did, which is a very small gesture, but what we did was uh, National Skill Development Corporate Council has a scheme of recognizing the prior learning. You know, just to recognize and to build some kind of incentivization culture, we got uh, we got a tie up with them, and when they gave us some uh, uh, videos on which these uh, postmen and Grameen Dark Savers were trained. And then they took a test and those who qualified were given an incentive of 500 rupees, but more than that was given a life insurance cover for accidental insurance cover for two lakhs for three years. So that was a, you know, even to, that was, it was a double pronged thing, culture incentivizing them and also, you know, creating a culture of insurance. 
and we i mean we we also settled one claim uh, just after the he got recognized and he was enrolled and then he, the the postman died and the family got 2 lakh rupees that was you know small gesture but it made, made an impact no, I, I can I can uh, I can significantly see the impact of something like this, uh, and, and you know I think it's 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 about about creating that snowball, right? So as it goes, more and more people get attracted to it. Um, Shrikant, any any comments from your your end as you think about through your career? I I can't agree more with uh, what Avdesh and Sima are saying, uh, you know, Aditya, because <clears throat> whether it is the cohorts in which students study in a system like in the U.S. universities or the Gurukul system that we had in the past, or even most of the companies like us, we have our own internal universities or learning centers where we push people to go stay there for longer periods of time and learn. And these physical environments and these communities that get developed when you learn with people who are interested in similar or same kind of subject, that itself is an environment which is motivating for people. Today, maybe we are limited because of the physical space that we are not having that opportunity, but I'm sure we'll be there soon. <clears throat> but even in given situation also, creating that community digitally and in a distance is possible. But what is important for us is, you know, that what do we focus on? <clears throat> how, do, how do we really push their people? That's what I was talking about the nudge. That one, I spoke about the happiness that keep them happy. Second is learning should lead to excellence. You know, and if we tell people that, <clears throat> excuse me, when you go for learning, you must excel in that. It is not something also ran type of thing. Everybody can excel and we have to trust in their potential and give them that belief that you can do very well in your thing. One of the things at Panorika, what we do is that we also address the factor of kindness or compassion, where we have our own CSR program and this philanthropy volunteering, you know, we train our people how do you go and do that? Now, when you do something selflessly, your mind automatically opens for learning and something that you can internalize based on that, you know, and that makes you ready, that you are ready now to deliver at a higher level in whatever you are expected to deliver. So this whole, you know, the cycle of, you know, happiness, readiness, uh, finesse and kindness, it really works so beautifully well for people. So we, we have this classical 70, 20, 10 kind of a framework for learning now. So only 10% of our learning happens in classrooms. 20% is more like shadowing or doing some kind of projects that makes you ready for that. But 70% is learning from your own experience. Because now I say, for example, I have 10 years experience. And one year goes and then I say, now I have 11 years experience. But the question is, what did that one year do to me? What did I learn from that and how I am applying that learning to my future work? If that question is asked repeatedly by the managers, people will learn every day, you know, but you have to really bring that kind of a signal into their mind, some kind of a flash that we have to provide as leaders. Shrikant, I think exceptionally well said. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things that uh, as, I, as I reflect on the need for leadership today, is this whole element of humility, the whole element of deep care, empathy, um, I, and, and, and just resilience, or maybe becoming anti-fragile as we've kind of seen many leaders struggle with their teams to deal with this pandemic. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to ask each one of you, just one question, right? Uh, and I, I think it's going to be fairly relevant. What is this one thing that you think, if you if you look at your experience, what is this one thing that you think we will need in the learning space for the future? Just one thing, and it's got to be a one-line uh, answer. It's and 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 maybe I can I can kind of start it, start it off so to get you guys thinking about it. I think the one big thing that I feel is really important as we think about the future is how do you get organizations learning ready, right? How do you get people, not organization, how do you get people learning ready? ready? But what are the, you know, from your perspective, what is that one thing that you think uh, as, as HR leaders, we need to get the organization ready for as you're thinking about the future? So whom should I put in spot? Uh, Seema, maybe you? <laughs> so I will say that if I can give a feeling of empowerment to my people, uh, that training will empower them and then, that will make it and that has made a difference and i have used it practically with my officers in the bank 
so empowerment fantastic thank you uh, no i you know i can go next you know i'm very quick you know i you know i wouldn't uh, i would agree with uh, seema if there is one thing you know we can do is how do you get people excited and passionate about learning and it's not easy it's not easy you know you can have push factor and you can have this pull factor you can offer best of the lms and best of the ai automation but ultimately it has to come from within and where people have to say oh no i you know we need to learn every day as we can said so from my perspective how do you inspire and make people you know passionate about the subject is extremely crucial very very crucial thanks shrikan to me uh, aditya and i completely agree with navdesh uh, and seema you know for me very important point is learning must be voluntary people should have a choice and when they are doing it by choice they automatically excel in that so it's not your nominated for a program mm, mm. you self nominate i i want to do this i i i i i i'm going to be slightly uh, ag out here uh, right <laughs> i think what what was interesting is uh, we had four hr leaders who talked about what do you need from learning nobody talked about technology better trainers environment ecosystem <laughs> everything that we've talked about is actually within the years of the employee right it's kind of somewhere in between and you have to excite motivate uh, em- empathize empower to really kind of get the person out there so i think i think that's that's very interesting to kind of think about yes uh, yeah. uh, shrikant i i want to kind of um, move to you um, and talk a little bit about how do you get the hr or the learning function in an organization future ready you know what are the skills what are the kind of capabilities what what do you think is needed as we think about the future and 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 then how do how does the hr organization actually prepare for it so one of the things i think aditya hr must learn to play on the backstage when it comes to learning it's you know maybe not a very good analogy but when you are for example doing a party so there is a contractor who comes and decorates everything and then you go last minute and you take credit for what what a beautiful stage you have made what a beautiful arrangement you have made you only paid the money and uh, somebody else has done that you know the hr is that contractor that you prepare everything and let people take the credit that they have created the environment they have created the community and prepare the organization to recognize learning you know we have come a long way from learning was seen as a something regimentation and people must go through these programs they have to get these certifications done and sometimes for nice to do programs people go and managers when they come back they say okay you had a great holiday let's get back to work you know that culture is behind us now now we need to really transcend to a culture where people go nominate themselves they learn they come back they stand and they say that i can excel in this job because i have learned and that is the best reward that hr can get and recognize people for learning not only for performance you know that every step create recognition mechanism for people and of course the basics of the nuts and bolts has to be there which i talked about in our lesson model that that must be prepared by hr you know uh, shikant what you know you're seeing employee behaviors and people behaviors change and the need to um, you know ingest information which is more bite size which is more uh, uh, relevant contextual how does that uh, come into play from an hr uh, you know from an hr so as an hr leader when you think about uh, learning does that uh, does does that also come into play when you're thinking about uh, the future of learning yeah yeah and all the three factors uh, aditya one is ease of learning that anything that i want to learn it should be easily available to me second is the width of learning that everything that people may be interested in and that is where hr has to apply its mind and say what would be my people interested in thinking out of the box so you wearing the employee hat and thinking that what would they be uh, wanting to do that and third is allowing them to do that you know so my interest is not in a five day program i i'm interested in a five hour program or maybe a 15 minute program you know creating that kind of a environment or maybe you just do a starter kind of a model of 15 minutes that itself will ignite interest for people to join for a five day kind of a program so it's it's easy for us to do that when we start thinking from that point you know but the whole focus should be more on employee not on learning you know that is where the, the difference lies 
Seema, um, you know, when you're, you know, you're, uh, you're looking at learning at such a large scale uh, and so much complexity out there, how do you, uh, you know, how do you, how do you gamify? How do you kind of make it uh, something where people look forward to the learning? You know, obviously those, that culture of kind of sending somebody for a five day holiday uh, and hopefully somebody's going to, you know, dip in a pool of knowledge and come out uh, re-energized. I, th- that's gone away, right? So how do you, how do you almost motivate, energize, you know, maybe gamify uh, learning for, for such a large scale? So uh, what we did was, uh, and we have been doing is we get into a lot of campaign modes. You know, when we, there is a campaign and we, then we acknowledge the winners and then we sometimes call them over to the corporate office. Sometimes they are even, you know, some people are even um, acknowledged and, you know, given prizes by the honorable ministers. So all that, you know, when all that is in the backside by hindsight, but yes, we, when we train people, it is given to them that they are going to, you know, if they do well, if they empower themselves, and if they get into, and otherwise, I says, as I said, my content is all very simple, very, very simple. So that, you know, makes people understand the su- subject or the process or the product so well. And in case there is a problem, my officers, as I told you, we've empowered our all officers in 650 branches as trainers. So these trainers, they are these Grameen Dark Savers will immediately get in touch with my officers in the nearby branches and get themselves empowered and trained on whatever they have. So things, content, vernacular language, gamifications, everything has been introduced in the training content. And then above all is the incentivization. Thank incentivization you. may not be in the form of money, but it is in the form of a lot of rewards and prizes. I, I, I think, uh, you know, more than money, it is uh, the memories that people that, yes. memories that people take away. Uh, Avdesh, uh, you know what, what? What about you? You know when you're thinking about uh, uh, this, how, how how do you look at it? Basis your experience that's been there. Yeah, no. See, I think uh, a lot has been said by Shrikant, but I'll only uh, like to add one more thing. You know, I think I like the fact that uh, you know both uh, Seema and Shrikant are talking about incentives and you know voluntary training. Though, remember Aditya, you know, when we, when we grew up as, you know, HR professionals or HR managers, you know, slowly and slowly we realized that HR was, the real HR was being performed by frontline managers. In fact, I still remind my team by telling them that, you know, we as HR people are not doing as much HR as, you know, people who have got 100 people team, you know, who are, you know, who are doing HR and who are expected to manage the teams and look at their well-being, look at their training and look at, you know, the entire conflict management and everything, you know. I would I would extend the same logic to learning and development and I would say that unless we are able to prepare all our people managers and everybody in the organization to own up learning and HR takes a backseat or the learning de- department takes a backseat and says, we are only facilitator, I don't think you are going to achieve uh, results which are going to be extraordinary. What I'm trying to say is that not only excite and incentivize employees, but incentivize people managers, incentivize people to be faculty. Incenti- for example, we are running a program in our company where you know there's a lot of excitement about internal faculty teaching peers. You know, if you are, if you want to teach somebody financial modeling, you know who a better person can teach financial modeling and teach uh, you know uh, junior people about financial modeling. You know, somebody who has dirtied their hands. Now, how do you incentivize the faculty? How do you incentivize people managers for also being learning champions? I think one, once you create that ecosystem, which is an extension of, you know, the moment you recognize that people management function is actually done by line managers more than HR, I think you have cracked the code as far as learning is concerned, you know. No, I, th- I think very well said. Um, I just want to kind of uh, maybe probably dip into... Uh, the last aspect of the conversation, uh, you know, keeping in mind the time, is technology and learning. There's just so much that's happening. You know, we are, we are seeing so many things around us. But I'd love to kind of get, um, you know, each of your views in terms of what what have you seen uh, is working and what do you think, and maybe you should wear that uh, uh, future hat of yours, you know, 10 years from now, uh, hat of yours, and, and think about what, what technology 
or what bits of technology may be there, may be not there. We are crystal ball gazing, right? So it can be anything uh, that you think would be very, very important as we think about learning of the future. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot out here. Uh, Seema. Be see, because uh, as I was telling, we could not have trained such a big force without technology. So technology was the only enabler for us, you know, the classroom training for a person who has a regular work of six to seven hours delivering that dark is, it's, it's impossible. To bring them into a classroom, leaving the work behind and it's, it's impossible. So all that happened was only because of the technology which was there, which enabled us not only to deliver the training, but also to monitor it. Because that they, that platform also helped us how monitoring the numbers because now numbers were so huge. The, uh, if, unless they were, we had a portal where you know where we could see if a person there was a five day classroom training and otherwise it's an ongoing training process. But who attended the training? And because it was happening at the same time in the country, so we had, I mean, the, we could not have done anything if there was no technology. Okay, so first, you know, so you're saying saying. As we scale, you cannot do that without technology. And anything that we use, technology has to help scale. I think it that's a great to. point. Uh, Shrikant, why don't we go, go with you next? See, te technology will promote more uh, individualized learning options to people. You know, I learn in my own time, at my own place, and at my own pace. Now, the question is, uh, now I give a plethora of training programs available to people just at the click of the button, and then you can go at your pace. How long the motivation will remain to complete that course, you know, whatever duration that course is. That is the fundamental question. So today it's availability and access to learning is not a problem because of the technology available and it will evolve more into becoming it more interesting, interactive, so on and so forth. It's just a matter of tomorrow. It's not too far from where we are today. No, but Shri, the Shri, point I, is, you know, I, I, how do I we think, keep people engaged? No, I, I, I think it's a great point. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I look at my kids. I've got very young kids and I've got to confess, I also love computer games quite a bit. Uh, if you look at it, it is just such an engaging, engrossing environment um, and, and I love the three points that you've talked about, you know, time, place, and pace, uh, and, and, and being intimate, right? Uh, so that it's relevant to you, uh, is, is, is a fabulous way of doing it. And, and today, if I look at uh, computer games, you can sit and spend hours. And the big shift that has happened in computer games over the years is it's just, you know, you are, you are the character and, you know, after a point, you believe you are the one who's living that adventure rather than some some vague person on a screen and and i think that's the that's one of those big uh, big learnings around how do you make it so personalized that you believe you are that character right uh, so time and just and if, if i may build on that aditya you know for just 30 seconds now there are thousands of games available but you will see your kids will pick only a kind of games and they will be hung to maybe a couple of games and they will Play day on day, day in, day out. So this is exactly the point. You know, when you give that volunteerism to people, it's quite likely it can be revolutionary for individuals. For example, when I joined my career in say a supply chain, finance, or HR, and after five years I realized that I'm not doing well here. You know, this learning platform will tell me that now is the time for me to make a switch because this is what my calling is. This was not, I may be prepared chose it at a young age, wrong path, you know, and people will move cross-functionally. It can show new light to people. Yeah, I think about it. You know, your learning system is saying, hey, you know what, 20 years in a career, uh, you you are better off doing something else. Yeah. Maybe you should have been an engineer rather than an HR person. Absolutely. That would be revolutionary. Absolutely. Um, Avdesh, uh, what, what, from your perspective, what technology for the future? So I think I think both Shrikant and Seema have already touched upon it. You know, you know, there there is no denying Aditya that technology can help you scale up. Uh, it can help you solve the problem of you know volume, and it can also solve the problem of customization. You know, you know, customization or personalization. There is no doubt about it. The only the only word of caution that I want to give is that I think we should not go overboard with the role that technology is going to play as far as learning is concerned beyond a point. You know, I do acknowledge the fact that the scale and personalization and gamification is going to lead to some level of uh, engagement, and I would not deny that. But my only my only submission 
is that social learning you know the deep social learning that happens inside the organization is not dependent on technology and unfortunate news is that the kind of uncertainty that we are looking at and the kind of disruption we are facing a lot of that has to be solved by informal networks it has to be solved by social learning that people have through peer 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 to peer group interaction and that power i didn't i really don't know to what extent it is going to be harnessed maybe 5 years 6 years down the line maybe maybe yes so i would remain a little little ex- skeptical about uh, going overboard on technology otherwise all all uh, all well said by both uh, shrikant and seema maybe again i i will try to uh, ruffle up may be be the cat, <laughs> cat among the pigeons uh, let me try to ruffle up you know uh, and 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 i think i look at uh, kids as a very good example of what that future could potentially look like you know they they kind of uh, come with a very different mindset and i and i and i'm seeing a lot of what they learn is shifting from things being pushed to them to them going and seeking it out uh and 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 be it uh, my my kid trying to figure out a way to do something on minecraft uh, going to youtube and other places and sorting it out or or looking at discord and trying to kind of find answers from many different social you know the social ecosystem going to discords and meeting with strangers to kind of get an answer for a question that uh, may not have been available outside and i think that those shifts are uh, are probably going to get uh, Um, you know exp- are going to go exponentially through technology but you're right you know at the end of the day there is a person on one side and there's another person on another side and how they communicate and how how receptively are they listening and how open mindedly are they uh, embracing the knowledge makes makes a learner right so so you know absolutely and and i think uh, avdesh very well said um any last thoughts on on future of learning you know i'm i'm conscious of time we've got another 5 minutes with us any last thoughts uh, maybe i can do a quick round robin uh, you know let's start with seema i've been picking on her quite a bit uh, so any last thoughts on learning for the future thing i have been seeing is initially i have gone through a journey where you know spareables will be spared for trading <laughs> <laughs> i love that now you know the it has been shifted from the performers or maybe uh, even those who actually need the training the things have really transformed and our future is going to be great and people have started uh, taking training as an investment rather than an expenditure as you all said so i feel it's going to be great in future for the trainers and training as well you know i love that quote i th- i think i'm going to use it somewhere spareables will be spared for training i think i think that's that's one big one that i'm going to keep <laughs> with me <laughs> yeah that's a good one <laughs> uh, that's seema uh, uh, shrikant uh, uh, you know what about you what would your thoughts be M- my sense is uh, you know aditya we discussed so much and those are all relevant points you know coming from uh, all the panelists learning should lead to change and change will lead to transformation if this equation is kept in the backdrop learning will become a mainstream activity for any individual because this is a fundamental motivation of human beings that everybody wants to develop and grow nobody is happy with the present state even if they have everything today they know everything they want to know something more they want to learn they want to become better so this change and transformation will come only through learning something that you don't know or you know at base level and you need to know at a higher level this awareness has to be there at the backdrop so technology processes all logistical issues mechanisms everything will be taken care of because there is more than enough coming our way on that but it's the mind of the individual that has to stay on that track of learning that's the most important thing in future thank you uh, avdesh what about a very you? quick one i think uh, shrikant and seema have already touched upon the micro micro aspect of learning which is individual and all my only worry you know to be honest with you aditya is at a more at a macro level if you look at um, you know world economic forum or if you look at even some studies done in the indian context the skill gap or readiness of the workforce is you know the gap is really huge and unfortunate news is that you and you know aditya you would know that almost for 10 de- you know for for a decade we have been discussing this subject so i really hope that at a macro level this whole this whole discussion on learning uh, skilling 
gets much more relevant you know and it gets much more relevant it becomes much more you know prominent and we not only discuss but put some of these things that we are talking about in action and i guess in that context i guess this whole uh, business world uh, learning and development summit is very well you know place to do that you know we are we are staring at a very very complex uh, challenge as far as india is concerned with respect to learning and uh, skilling the workforce for it to get ready for what technology is going to disrupt technology going technology is going to change jobs is going to change the workplace dynamics you know our work system design is going to change newer jobs are going to come so at a macro level i think the challenge is quite huge and i really hope that we as country you know you know live up to this challenge you know. no absolutely and i i i think we have one question uh, that has come up which is quite an interesting one um, and I, you know avdesh this is purely for you uh, okay. and, and and maybe maybe a little bit uh, for shrikant also because i know uh, seema's answer would we be better off without a mo- without modernizing uh, of lnd infrastructure uh, and what would be the pro and con for doing that without we will be better off sorry aditya i missed that would we be better off without modernizing of the lnd infrastructure uh, i think there's a simple answer you know no no you know i don't know uh, you know and i think i think shrikant and seema touched upon the subject you know if you are an organization like example say example tcs i spent a lot of time in tcs if you are a company which is multi locational geographically spread and if you don't modernize your you know training infrastructure which is digital and whether it is classroom there is no way you can scale up even technical skills forget about scaling up social skills which require some element of interaction and peer to peer learning you know so my simple answer to that question is not really my friend you need to modernize and you really need to make you know you go with the wind in terms of adopting the technology thank you uh, shikan a mix of two can be the best combination so uh, avdesh is absolute yes seema is somewhere in the middle uh, come on shikan you 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 are <laughs> deciding what yeah so, you you uh, you are doing being a devil's advocate now <laughs> <laughs> now for me you know if i draw a pyramid like maslow's hierarchy for learning hierarchy this will be the first level this is at the foundation we cannot do without yeah, that yeah 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 this I is what i agree with that the yes. base level everything else comes on top of that and we have already passed that stage so we are nowhere there you know anybody or any organization which aspires learning must thrive in that organization they already have developed that modernization and they are further doing that no absolutely yes, sir, I, i would I agree think, with that yes i think i think very well said um you know we've got one uh, one more question in uh what are what are you what are the changes that you're seeing in your organization as you're planning for this change are you seeing any changes within your organization as such well you know see we are running out of time so i'll be very very try and be very very quick aditya you know one is very simple answer you know you are we are seeing that uh, something that i would have expected to take 4 5 years in terms of adoption of uh, lms system and technology it has been accelerated and that is the way to go forward you will realize that this whole hybrid workplace hybrid learning hybrid work system design has been accelerated surely by 4 5 years you know that is one one big shift that we are seeing and it is no you know i'm not saying something that you are not already uh, reading you know that's one second very important thing i'll tell you which is that we as leadership team have realized that that the people the managers who are interacting in a work from home kind of a setup with large number of people they have to be equipped more to deal with this situation as compared to any other time so in fact there's a lot of focus on what is it that we need to do to equip managers in terms of coaching their teams you know for example people are coming to us and saying oh by the way how do we how do i manage this remote team how do i build culture how do i look at team building when i have not met even 50% of my workforce that you hired last one year so that shift is uh, to my mind is going to be very very challenging to manage uh, for hr professionals thank th- thanks avdesh uh, any any last thoughts from shrikant you or Seema? Yeah. Uh, you know, organizationally, one of the things that we all have seen, you know, there would be hardly any exception, Aditya, at this time, uh, during the lockdown and this remote working uh, environment, that organization and people, they have not got hooked to the online learning. You know, every HR person will tell you the story that we have run hundreds of courses and thousands of people participated and so on and so forth. So th- this is one good thing that we have gained out of this whole Social distancing and uh, remote working. 
but this habit will continue you know and th- then there are so many you know these mooc kind of programs uh, th- those are getting launched in the organizations which again give you a base level certification and then you can build on top of that so th- th- this is becoming a trend now and most employees are very happy to participate in these programs they have learned that we are entering into a new world we don't know the future nobody knows the future so something new is coming for everybody and i need to get ready for that newness you know so that a sense of unsettling that has been very strong in the people at this point in time and this is a very good time to breed learning habits into people you know if we can capture on the movement no oh, absolutely thank you so and one uh, last word which i want to just say is that we did not have that no remote working for us or anybody in the organization but you know the lockdown period for others pushed a lot of learning for the workforce because there were another ch- different challenges i mean which were there to you know give them the doorstep services go to them get the thing make the payments remittances even for the migrant laborers so a lot of learning happened on ground while working because it was a challenge for them to serve the people of the nation at that time and and that's the purpose so you, you know thank you avdesh uh, shrikant seema uh, it's been a wonderful session and really really great insights i i particularly love the thought about empowering passion and volunteerism volunteerism um i i i i'm going to take uh, spareables uh, seema i'm going to unabashedly use it spareables will be spared for training um I, I, and i think uh, the future of learning and i think shrikant you summed it up very nicely where you talked about uh, ease uh, with and uh, and I, and and just the mindset to be able to uh, able to learn would be critical so it's is less about tools and technology it's about mindsets it's about heart and mind kind of getting together to kind of do that so thank you so much uh, really appreciate uh, the session and thank you bw for giving us the opportunity in the session and thank you aditya for coordinating it so well you know i think you you are very insightful thank you so much compliments to you aditya well thank done. you to all of you thank you so much absolutely thank you. thank you so much to our panelists thank you for sparing your time and being here sharing the insights and thank you aditya for moderating it so well and i think uh, summarizing uh, the key highlights for our viewers thank you so much all of you thank you thank you thank you and best wishes for the rest of the proceedings thank you thank you we look forward to seeing you all at the awards as well yes ladies and gentlemen right after this uh, will be the award ceremony for the day before we move on to that we'd like to once again thank all our speakers panelists and everybody who's been part of the lnd summit i would like to now request our viewers to join me in watching the bw business world's journey and legacy forward can we have the audio visual please In the world of business, when you think business, you think BW Business World. Spanning across platforms from print to the fast-growing digital space, from custom events to insightful industry books, BW Business World continues to capture a critical market space. Enjoying over 1.2 million engaged reader base, we have replicated this success in digital with a six-fold growth in the past one year. So who is the BW audience? Our magazine readers are the cream of the crop business professionals spread across industries and niche communities. BW Digital engages with a much larger audience, hailing majorly from India and US. We also reach diverse markets including UK and Saudi Arabia. The BW Print Universe comprises of BW Business World, BW Smart Cities, BW Hotelier, BW Applause, BW Education and BW People. each profiling industry leaders and niche sectoral stories bw digital communities target niche segments like startups cios smart cities defense amongst a range of other fields with the following of millions of unique digital users bw business world is an industry leader in curating a plethora of iprs with multiple industry stakeholders under one roof bw ipr events generate superlative content BW Engage offers bespoke brand solutions across functions with inputs from the award-winning BW editorial team. We design and execute a 360-degree marketing model, resulting in top-of-mind recall and a large BW Engage client patronage. Why engage with us? We have an award-winning editorial team. 
we forecast new scoops and future trends before any of our competitors. We provide 360 degree brand solutions and our clients are always happy with the ROI. This is just a glimpse of our client endorsements. To subscribe to our print patronage, visit subscribe.businessworld.in. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also connect with us on WhatsApp on businessworld.in slash WhatsApp. We'd like you to now take you through the legacy of BW Business World. Can we have the AV, please? Legacy of curated events that enable conversations on policy issues in India. Because of the state of our cities, we have no option but to build smart and resilient cities. Digital India is more for the poor, underprivileged and the deprived. Covering a range of topics, BW Business World events look to create a strong narrative around smart cities, digital India, healthcare, Swachh Bharat, human resource issues, education, banking and finance, among others. The world is fast changing. Best practices are available now on the net. विकास, डेवलपमेंट पूरी राजनीति में ये फोकस बन गया है। BW Business World Events provide a speaking platform to the voices that matter। स्मार्ट से ताल्लुक ये है कि हम जो बेसिक एमिनिटीज हैं, उसको हम चुस्त दुरुस्त करें। You don't have to be a technologist. You need to understand how technology influences the world. Mahatma Gandhi was a great man. He was the leader. Of the freedom struggle. We believe that e governance and IoT will play a very, very important role. BW Business World is an excellent exhibition platform that helps you showcase your services to the right audience. BW Business World's digital transformation went on the fast track in 2020, marrying its legacy of credibility and robust business journalism to a technology first world. Hosting over 250 virtual summits and webinars across its 17 niche business communities with millions engaging with the power packed content like BW Dialogue Series, Festival of Life web series, and custom created webinars and hosting 20 plus virtual summits. Thirty-three million page views on an average, 21 special issues in 2020 hit the stands and multiple IPs scheduled in the coming months, BW has taken a leadership position in the business news segment. To become a part of our legacy, write to us at partner at businessworld.in. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, BW Business World brings out new unique IPs. And now currently it is evident that the role of HR is changing and many industries have undergone tremendous change due to evolving technology, new employment regulations and younger, more diverse workforce. Today's organizations have to deal with environmental pressures, rapid technological change and tougher competition generating a need for the human resource function to help navigate through these transitions to increase its real and perceived value. BW Business World HR Excellence Awards 2020 are here to recognize this very excellence, identifying and bringing to prominence these best kept secrets and celebrate the very best amongst us, those who bear the torch of excellence in the HR landscape of India and by far 
are the guardians of India's finest people practices. It is coming up next month, ladies and gentlemen, the HR Best Practices Summit and Excellence Awards, along with a few more new IPs. I'd like our uh, team to please showcase audiovisual of the upcoming events, please. Can we have the HR Excellence Creative, Amy, put up? While we do that, let me now request all of you to join us in the much awaited award ceremony, BW People's HR Learning and Development Excellence Awards 2020. It aims to celebrate India's top learning and development practices, brands and people. We will celebrate them today to bring forward their best kept secrets and learn from the very best amongst us. Those who bear the torch of excellence in the learning and development landscape of India and by far are the guardians of India's L learning and development practices. So let's kick start this evening by first thanking our partner. As we all know, no event is possible without the support of its partners. We'd like to thank our education partner, Institute of Public Enterprise. You can also watch this award ceremony live on the website, which is www.bwpeople.in. Now let's take a quick look at what our jury has to say. This year, the jury comprised of eminent industry leaders, our jury chair, Mr. B. Thiagarajan, Managing Director, Blue Star Limited. On the jury panel, we had Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, BW Business World and Exchange for Media, Mr. Patnam Dwarkanath, former Chairman, GlaxoSmithKline, Dr. Poonam Segal, former Dean and Professor, IIM Lucknow, Mr. Sinanandan Bhanja Chaudhary, Managing Partner, Executive Access. Mr. Sudhir Mishra, Founder and Managing Partner, Trust Legal. And Mr. Harshwardhan, CEO, CXOE Partners, LLP. We'd like to thank our jury panel and our jury chair. And we'd like to now showcase the jury speak. Can we have the AV, please? Learning and Development Awards witnessed huge participation with nominations from manufacturing, banking and financial services, hospitality and healthcare, IT and ITES sectors. The passion and commitment demonstrated by the HR professionals in these companies are admirable. It was a privilege to have chaired the jury and it was heartening to learn about the great work being done by many companies. In the process, I learned many new things in the area of human resources development. I wish to thank Dr. Anurag Bhatra and the jury members. I also wish to compliment the BW People team for taking this award to a new level. It was indeed an honor and privilege to be a jury member of the Business World L&D Awards. I have thoroughly enjoyed the process. The process was done in a very professional and scientific manner with a robust process. Uh, the uniqueness of this process is that the shortlisted nominees were given opportunity to present the case before the jury uh, and the jury was given opportunity to seek certain clarifications and ask them some questions to get uh, more clarity on the concepts and the approach. 
uh, i wish business world would continue to do such such events in this robust and scientific manner and i wish all those who participated in this awards a, a great success thank you business world awards are highly prestigious backed by india's leading business magazine they recognize the accomplishments of deserving and hard working professionals through strong and fair selection process I am privileged to be a jury member of the Business World Learning and Development Awards and as always am impressed with their process and professional approach. I congratulate Anurag and his team for organizing the awards which are truly poised to become the gold standard in industry awards. Wishing good luck and success to all the nominees. We had an impressive list of nominations for the Business World Learning and Development Awards this year. Overall I must say an outstanding example of excellence and showcasing of best practices across diverse categories. My congratulations to all those who were nominated which itself is a great achievement. And cheers to all the winners. Your work has been truly inspirational. You contributed a, you are contributing a great deal in building a learning culture in your respective organizations i wish you all the best may you scale greater heights god bless for me business world hr leadership award uh, being part of its jury was a very unique experience and uh, i met so many extraordinary hr leaders of the country and in the entire process of jury um, uh, meeting i realized that uh, uh, hr is a very important functionary of any organization of any company and how little we understand their profitability they being the real profit center these were the new learnings which happened in our jury meeting i really feel that business world has gone to the knowledge part of the hr uh, aggregation where hr as a sector is seen as competitive as sales or marketing or finance and given them the platform which uh, always hr deserves Well I must say that being on the jury of the Business World L&D Awards has been a fascinating experience we had some fabulous entries and as you say you know the awards are as good as the entries and I think we had fantastic entries this time it was uh, hotly debated by all of us L&D is a very important function in the corporate world and I must congratulate everybody who's won very well done all the very best well deserved thank you and thank you business world for doing it so so well thank you take care bye can i request our host to give me video access please sorry late ho gaya thank you thank you so much once again to all our jury members and jury chair and as you can see we have with us uh, dr anurag batra chairman and editor in chief bw business world here with us so i'd like uh, you dr batra to say a few words on this inaugural edition a very warm welcome thank, thank you so much khyati uh, as you know that we do everything through the process you saw the jury members and the jury chair uh, talking about the business world process i for, i'm first of all grateful to dr thyagarajan uh, mr b thyagarajan who's the md and ceo of blue star for chairing the jury i am grateful to dr poonam saigal i am grateful to mr p dwarkarnath i am grateful to mr harshwardhan i am grateful to mr sudhir mishra uh, really uh, their contributions uh, made the jury judging process uh, rich for us uh, on the jury and for the presenters on the other side learning and development is such a domain uh, that you know last 11 months have taught us that if we have to be relevant in this post corona business life we have to reinvent ourselves we have to add on new skills and yesterday i was in an event with the, the md of coursera and about seven education leaders and the md of coursera shared two statistics which i like to share here one is that coursera and other platforms like coursera were active in a certain number and he gave a number of 30 universities uh, coursera is now in 3300 universities Uh, second, he said the courses that are being taken 
are about leadership about mindfulness about listening about communication so you know even in the while we were talk about artificial intelligence machine learning all that but you know um, there is a quest to be a better person to equip oneself uh, in a personal growth sense i remember dr poonam segal who have no qualms uh, as in fact i'm grateful that she's there uh, she was my teacher at mdi in 94 96 when i was doing my mba and she was teaching obod those days and i took a, a optional workshop called the personal growth lab which i now look back was possibly the most significant course that i did take there because it was about uh, being the best version of myself building on what um, you know my aspirations are what my skills are what i like doing in some way the personal growth lab was for, about finding the key guy so coming back to learning and development uh, a lot of learning has shifted online uh, you know the focus has become razor sharp because every money that is being spent in lnd is being evaluated so there is a need to retool reassess reequip uh, workforce at every level uh, even the ceos need to go through courses ceos are learning new things the course uh, from a certain foreign university on happiness uh, is been the most downloaded course it's a free course that doesn't matter but the fact is that today there is a need to upgrade yourself corona has made sure that we learn new skills both in terms of compassion and in terms of technology uh, the lnd budgets uh, uh, will go into areas uh, which will provide learning in a hybrid format and uh, as the business environment comes back the lnd budgets will come back in full bloom so i'm sure uh, the journey of you know training development enhancing learning will continue and we at bw people which is business world's community for hr and hr leader celebrates that lnd uh, you know kind of focus i think uh, continuous learners are who do well and learning is not just a from formal process it can be on informal process like coaching mentoring while coaching mentoring is formal it can also be informal uh, so really lnd is something that will continue to be a focus in this very fast change changing world in an evolving world i keep saying we are on a 3c economy a contactless economy a compassionate economy and a collaborative economy and it is becoming a hybrid economy so clearly any business models in lnd that cater to this hybrid economy will only uh, grow stronger so i'd leave it there congratulate all the winners thank all our jury members for being here and making a contribution in terms of making the choices mr sunandan manja choudhury I forgot your name, so let me acknowledge. I know you're here to give away awards. Uh, again, uh, uh, I met Mr. Banja Chaudhary in 1999. He hired me in my job in STA. Uh, so some of the people on the jury, I go back more than 20 years. Uh, Mr. Harshwardhan, I met him just right out of the business school in 96. Uh, Dr. Segal, of course, was my professor at MDI. Uh, and again, Sulandan was my boss. I had no qualms uh, in saying that. So clearly, uh, uh, Mr. P. Dwarkanath. Even when I was in MDI, he was a big figure. He was the head of HR at uh, a very large MNC, and over the years, he has become such a big thought leader and influencer on this ecosystem. And the level of involvement he had in the jury, in terms of qualitative assessments, and you know, really spending time on any entry and every entry was tremendous. So really grateful, Mr. Sudhir Mishra, again brought in his. uh special skills in assessing the uh, jury entry so grateful to all the jury member especially again my gratitude to mr tyagarajan for chairing the jury back to you khyati thank you so much dr batra i would request you to stay here with us while i invite a jury chair mr b tyagarajan managing director blue star limited to join us on stage to commence the award ceremony May I request you, sir, to please uh, switch on your camera and join us on screen. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, my my video uh, may be put on, please. Yes, we'll do that right away. Team, can we have him? A very warm welcome, sir. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin the ceremony. But before we do that, we'd like to remind you one more time: while you take those winning shots, screenshots. uh we would like you to use our hashtag which is bwpeople l and d and 
join us in our online conversation. You can also watch us live on our website, which is www.bwpeople.in. Kicking off the ceremony and felicitating our winners with the first set of awards for the LND service providers. The first category here is the best LND assessment tools. Who wins in this category through this audio visual? And of course, we have our jury chair and Dr. Batra here to fell state our winners. Can we have the AV, please? So I'd like to invite our winner here from Prudential Learning Solutions, Sashi Khant, the CEO of the company, to please join us on screen by switching on your video. Uh, can someone enable my video, please? Absolutely. Team, can we quickly enable the video? Yeah. Very warm welcome and many congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank BW, LND team, and uh, the entire jury uh, for having uh, given this opportunity to present the case and selected us in this category. We're extremely indebted and, uh, uh, to this uh, effect, and I think it, it vindicates what we set out to do as an organization, bringing in accountability and training and, uh, and purpose in the learning and development areas. And I think we've set up a beautiful online system and a lot of tools. I thank each and every member of my team who have stood behind me uh, in this the entire endeavor. We are only in the third year of our operations and this award goes a long way uh, in, in our lives as an entrepreneur after having served 35 years in the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Congratulations, Mr. Sandeep. Thank you, sir. I'm sure uh, this is the uh, start of a many milestones and achievements that you and your company are likely to achieve over the next few months. Absolutely. Yes, we wish you luck. And, uh, Thank you very much. Ecosystem needs more players like you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm sure we will live up to that expectations. Thank you. Congratulations. Keep up your good work. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and many congratulations once again, Mr. Kant, to you and to your whole team there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We accept this humility. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on to our next category of award, which is for the best experiential learning programs. Let's find out who the winner is through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? <laughs> So our big congratulations to TNTC, and I'd like to welcome Emmanuel David, Director HR and Strategic Business Partner, to join us on screen. A very warm welcome and many congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very happy to receive this award. Uh, first and foremost, I want to compliment uh, Dr. Batra and Business World. In this last one year, you have really, you know, reached out to the whole community uh, through various online activities and made a difference. I want to compliment you for that. And as we receive this award, it, which is for experiential learning, which is a tribute to my team, that is both in terms of thought and heart they put together in this online space. And we've conducted several sessions, almost about 800 sessions uh, over the last seven, eight months. It's a tribute to their commitment. I want to thank my team and the sponsorship of my group human resources team. Uh, very grateful for all the support we get. Also the CHROs and the partnership we've had with TCS in some of the things which we've done. Also, there's been a tremendous partnership with both international and national faculty uh, who have partnered with TMTC to make things possible. 
And I think the only thing which is important is learning. As I accept this award, I want to I remember Peter Drucker who says, we now accept the fact that learning is a lifelong process of keeping abreast of change. And the most pressing task is to teach people how to learn. Thank you very much. Mr. Thyagran, first you. Yemi, uh, that's how uh, Mr. Emmanuel David is known, and uh, he. Uh, this is a well-deserved uh, award for you, Yemi. That uh, I know you for more than two decades. In every field, you have uh, demonstrated passion and gone all the way out to commit yourself uh, for the betterment of the L&D industry itself. Uh, I am very proud that uh, you have received this award. Uh, congratulations and all the best to you. Thank you so much, Tyag. Thank you. Appreciate the partnership and friendship. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Mr. David. Thank you for your kind word. And I'm, as you rightly said, learning is, you know, for us also by doing, we learn. And, you know, to stay relevant, you have to continuously evolve. So hopefully at some stage, we'll engage with you uh, about uh, how we can collaborate. So all the best. Congratulations. Most definitely. Thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much, Mr. David, and many congratulations to you and to your whole team at TMTC. With that, ladies and gentlemen, once again, requesting all of you to join our online conversation using a quick hashtag, which is BWPeopleL and D. We request you to put on your winning shots and let us in on the celebration as you do with your team. Moving forward to our next award category, which is for best leadership development program. Let's take a look and find out who the winner is of this category. Can we have the AV please? Once again, a big congratulations here to Preventus. I'd like to welcome the CEO, Mr. Ramakrishna, to join us on screen. A very warm welcome, sir, and many congratulations. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Anurag. Thank you, Mr. Tyagarajan, for the honor. And good evening, everyone. Uh, for a bespoke learning advisory, our biggest testimonial is when our leaders and learners connect back to us and recount their stories of transformation. At the same time, an industry recognition of our beliefs and methodology is an encouragement that keeps challenging us to work with reinforced commitment. This recognition is immensely gratifying for us as Proventus HR and for our belief in immersive, reflective, experience learning. And we thank our client partners who believed in us, our learners who engaged with us and challenged us, and our partners who enabled us. You have made us better. Thank you, BW People team and our gratitude to eminent panel of jurists for this consideration. We stand humbled with this recognition and inspired for excellence in people, process, results, experience learning. Dr. Batroy, your words of encouragement. Congratulations, Mr. Ramakrishna. Continue to do well. Um, and I'm sure the year will be much better than what it was last year. Thank you very much. Mr. Thiagarajan. Mr. Ramakrishna, uh, you are indeed an important stakeholder. Uh, I think uh, in shaping the leadership in India, uh, in the corporate world, you will continue to play an important role. All the best to you. Congratulations to you and your team. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ramakrishna. Many congratulations once again to you and to your whole team. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to our next category of award. I think one of the most important ones here, best learning management system. In this category, let's find out who the winners are. Best learning management system award goes to. Can we have the AV please? <laughs> We already have Mr. Shirtuwari here. May I 
once again announce our winners best learning management system award goes to guiding star digital publishers llp and uh, the special mention goes to suntech business solutions may i invite uh, the ceo of guiding star digital publishers llp mr rohit kumar to join us on screen please hi kathi i can Hello, Mr. Kumar. Very warm welcome and many congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like I'm humbled to receive this award uh, on behalf of our entire team, uh, and as well as on behalf of the uh, lakh plus people who actually use our platform every day, um, and they have taught us a lot. Um, you know, so thank you to Business World for uh, recognizing this. Uh, uh, I, very interestingly, the last event I attended before the lockdown was a Business World uh, L&D Awards, where one of our customers was getting it in, at the Leela Hotel in Gurgaon in March uh, last year. Um, so it's it's indeed an honor. Uh, this award wouldn't be possible without uh, many people in the ecosystem. Obviously, our entire team who supports uh, our customers day in and day in day out, whether it's Saturday, whether it's Sunday, all the time. Uh, our customers, I think, deserve uh, mm -hmm. the a significant part of the credit because they are the ones who drive it. And I'm uh, honored that uh, a few of our customers are actually uh, on, have been on your panels today and some of them may be receiving awards as well. Um, uh, so I, uh, you know, when I started the company, we I came most recently from the publishing background and we had a textbook called Grey's Anatomy, which is a 150 year old medical textbook. And I would get sleepless nights because the book was losing market share to a local book. And we could never know why people were not reading the book unless we went out and asked people. With a, a learning platform, we get to know exactly who's seeing it and who's not able to see it just by looking at analytics. And that was the mission that I set out to over the last 10 years, that how do you ask, answer this problem of why is it useful to somebody or why is it not useful to somebody? So our team's mission remains to make sure that every user is able to complete what they have to, every user able, is able to find the information when they need to. Um, and overall, because of just enabling that, the outcomes that will be manifold for organizations so thank you very much uh, for recognizing this. Thank you to our customers. Thank you to our employees and thank you to all the users. Wonderful. Mr. Thiagarajan, would you like to say a few words? So it is a well-deserved award. Uh, you, are, you have demonstrated transformational leadership in the area in which you're running your enterprise. Uh, this uh, makes us uh, proud as well, because uh, as a country, uh, you have uh, come out with this particular platform and it is uh, deserving even global recognition at some point of time. Keep it up. Congratulations to you and your team members. Thank you. Congratulations, Rohit. I've known Rohit for a while. Uh, as he rightly said, he comes from media and publishing and he's clearly gone into the digital domain and at the end of the day, the media is also about education, learning, development, but he's gone deeply into this and uh, knowing his background and expertise, mm -hmm. uh, he's got it right. So uh, I remember the day he was presenting to the jury and I got a text from him. I said, best of luck, you know, and here he is because really uh, the jury chair is there, the jury members are here and really they decided uh, uh, every winner and, you know, uh, at least uh, four of the jury members were there at any given point of time. Uh, in the morning, we had all of them, but in the afternoon also, there were at least four. At one point, we had five and six. So uh, clearly, this is a process that we use. We're only custodians of the process. And uh, I'm glad companies like yours, Rohit, are were doing really well in the marketplace. And in some way, are the shape of things to come in future are doing well. So congratulations. I'm sure this is the start of uh, a bigger journey uh, and, you know, to more milestones and celebrating them together. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Many congratulations, Mr. Kumar, to you and to your team out there. Many congratulations Thank once again. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let me also invite the Best Learning Management System Special Mention Award 
winner SunTech Business Solutions. I'd like to welcome the Learning and Development Head, Mr. Prakash P. Nair, to please join us on screen. Mr. Nair, may I request you to please switch on your video and join us on screen? A very warm welcome and many congratulations. Thank, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. First of all, may, let me take this opportunity to thank our team first and the eminent jury members for recognizing my organization's effort in this uh, land space. And uh, also thanks for my colleagues in Suntech uh, for this great achievement. I'm sure such recognitions will help us in accelerating our pace of learning and also pace of innovation in the learning and uh, development space. So uh, our uh, congratulations to all other organizations who won uh, prizes and also who participated uh, in such a prestigious uh, recognition program. I'm sure such recognitions will help all of us to uh, spend and uh, 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 get a lot of effort in the L&D space. Thank you, thank you all, and uh, all, all the best. Have a good day. Congratulations, Mr. Nair. Uh, well done. It is well deserved. Uh, keep up the good work. Dr. Batra? Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Nair. All the best. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Nair. And once again, many congratulations to you and to your whole team. All our viewers and team members of the winners, don't forget to join our online conversation. While you put those winning shots up, please tag us using the hashtag VWPeopleLND. We'd love to be part of the celebration online as well. Moving forward to our next category of awards, but before we move there, I'd like to welcome another jury member here on screen. May I request Mr. Patnam Dwarkanath, former chairman GlaxoSmithKline to please join us on screen to do the honors for the next few awards. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, our next award category is going to be yeah. under the BW People L&D Strategy Award. And the first category coming up is the best e-learning strategy. Let's find out who the winner is in this category through this audio visual. Can we have the AV please? <laughs> Yes, our big congratulations to Whirlpool Corporation for taking away the award of best e-learning strategy. May I request Rachna to please join us on screen. Rachna Kumar, the HR head of Whirlpool Corporation. Request that you please switch on your video. Uh, I'm so sorry, Nikita. Yes, Mr. Hi, so this is Rachna and uh, hope you can hear me. Sorry, I'm out of station, but thank you so much. Uh, I really, on behalf of Whirlpool, accept this award with all the humility. This was the first time when we embarked on the journey of e-learning and uh, I just believe that if the intent is positive and great work happens, then magic happens. So thank you so much. I think truly deserved by all the participants who participated in this journey, all the leaders who wanted to invest in their people and the special thanks to LND team in Whirlpool to taking all the pains to make this happen. And thank you so much, Business World. Congratulations. Uh, may I request Mr. Kagarajan to give your words of encouragement? We are proud of your achievement. Uh, keep up the good work. All the best to you and your team. Thank you. Mr. Dwarkanath, would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, I just want to add what the chairman of the jury said. Uh, Rasna, well done. Whirlpool, well done. You reached the award. And this is one of the key awards. E-learning e strategy is the most important. Set the strategy is you'll never be able to implement it. And actually, well done, keep it up, and continue to do the same. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Rachana, congratulations. You all heard from Thank you. Rachana, who is a 
very tall figure in the business world and in the HR community. Mr. Tagra yes. has done a very large opportunity. Uh, so they both uh, have congratulated you and they chose you. You know, they were Mr. Uh, Tagra and the jury chair and Mr. Barkhanath who possibly spent most time on entries and uh, was a very involved jury chair. And, you know, logically discussing every entry. So the winners have gone through a process and uh, uh, congratulations on taking your e-learning journey. I'm sure this journey will get longer and longer with we having a hybrid uh, uh, of working in a hybrid way of uh, moving forward in every direction. So I'm sure this journey will take you to many more. Things. So congratulations. Keep doing well. Thank you. Thanks. Once again, Rachna, many congratulations to you and to your home team out there at Whirlpool Corporation. Many congratulations. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move forward to our next category of award, which is the best technology-based learning and development strategy. Well, technology is taking over our lives, so let's find out who the winner is at best technology-based learning and development strategy award. Let's find out through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? Yes, let's give it up to our winner of Best Technology-Based Learning and Development Strategy Award, ACG Worldwide. I would like to welcome the Learning and Development Head, Ms. Nikita Vasudeva, to join us on screen. Nikita, may I request you to come on screen? Hello, welcome. and thank you for this award. Thank you. I receive it with a lot of gratitude. I uh, truly appreciate uh, organizations who are able to see the value that technology can offer for learning. And uh, at ACG, uh, when we receive this award, this does not only belong to the LND fraternity, but to all the team members from business and change agents from different roles of the organization who have contributed to make technology successful. So thank you for recognizing that contribution. Do you, Claire, do you remember, would you like to say a few words? Mr. Um, congratulations, Nikita. The, uh, it is, this is one of the awards, um, you know, to make a decision is very difficult, right? It is to assess based on the technology-based strategy. Uh, jury members were unanimous in selecting ACG. So all the best to you. Keep up the good work. Just to reinforce what the the chairman of the jury has said, it, if you ask me, this is one of the most critical uh, attributes which require to make the education learning possible, given the context as hybrid as Mr. Batra, Dr. Batra said earlier. And secondly, I think, you know, I, as a member of the jury, I have reviewed it and I'm extremely satisfied the way you have progressed it and your approach and the concept. And we wish you all the best, you and your company, and continue to do the good work. And at the same time, I just would like to add, I need to commend and compliment business world because in my 50 years of HR experience, I have never seen any institution, organization, any, any kind of it, focusing so much of l and on l and so, so much of dissection and the research they have done to figure out, I started wondering what did I learn in l and in all these years? Now, how important it is, how advanced we talk about retention, talent, acquisition, but we never focused on learning, which has proved during pandemic the need of the hour, whether a learning strategy or a technology-based strategy or experimentation. It's a, it's a great experience and a great learning for me. I am sure the chairman of the jury and other jury members also would echo the same sentiments. And uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity, Dr. Batra and your team. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dwarkanath, for such kind words for the team. Dr. Thank Batra? Thank you. Uh, uh, congratulations, Nikita. Keep doing well. All the best. Just want to go. And thank you, Mr. Dwarkanath. You know, Mr. Dwarkanath, I must tell you, you were introduced to me by somebody who's in heaven now. Uh, yeah. And, you know, this is one of his wishes just before he went to heaven. And he yeah. knew me for 25 years. 
years is, uh, was Dr. Pritam Singh, you know. Yes. He was my director at MDI. And yes. I happened to be, uh, subsequently, I got onto the board of MDI thanks to him. And uh, I'm also the chairman of the alumni of MDI thanks to him. And, you know, when I was in the school, in the business school, I've been hearing uh, your name for at least 26 years. 20, this is my 27th year of being associated with MDI. And I can say that, you know, one of the, I've seen the kind of, you know, this is kindness. You saying that you've not seen LND is like, you know, Sachin Tendulkar saying he's not, you know, he learned something about cricket. You know, it's a bit like that. So you're very kind. And uh, the kind of passion you bring to the jury process, to the judging, it makes us to do better. Uh, we do even better than what you've done till now. Uh, but we're really grateful for your patronage, for your time, for your kindness. And I'm, I, I'm grateful uh, that you associated yourself uh, with our initiative. We have a lot to improve, but I promise you we will improve a lot. We do it with high integrity in everything else. We can improve and we will. So congratulations, Nikita. Uh, just wanted to mention that I got to know about Mr. Dwarkanath because I was the head of placements at uh, MDI. And uh, in 95, I was told that, you know, we have to get your organization. You were director HR. Uh, I know you became the chairman of the board at one point, but yes. you were really the director of HR at that time. And of course, Dr. Pritam Singh, even then, had a direct line to you in 96. Because yes. he, he became the director in 95, 96. Not many people know in the first year of MDI, Dr. Abad Ahmed from FMS was the director. Uh, and, you know, really, he had a heart attack. Uh, nothing to do with the students of MDI. But uh, luckily, he survived and he's done well. Uh, but, uh, you know, you were a tall figure then. You continued to stay relevant. So I just wanted to thank you. And Nikita, thank all the best. Congratulations. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vasudeva. Congratulations to you and to your whole team of ACG. Many congratulations. And yes, I'm sure through this conversation, you must have realized that BW people is at the center of all businesses, isn't it? Business with people. And which is why we're moving on to our next category, which is Best Employee Orientation Program Award. Let's find out who wins the Best Employee Orientation Program Award through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? So our big congratulations to Godrej and Boys Manufacturing. I'd like to welcome the Learning and Development Head, Kanchan Sandal, to join us on screen. A very warm welcome to you, Kanchan, and many congratulations. Yeah, hi, Kathy. Thank you so much. We at Godrej are really honored and humbled uh, for receiving this recognition at such a large platform. A special thank you to the BW jury and the entire team members of BW for recognizing our initiative. You know, the core theme of our orientation program is all about connect, converse, collaborate with all the new joinees in the organizations. And I should really, uh, at this point of time, you know, pause and thanks the business leaders of the Goddard team, the business HR leaders of the Goddard team, uh, our PNA head, Ms. Harpreet Kaur, and the entire wonderful team of capability building, because together we've been able to co-create, you know, create this synergy of bringing everybody together and having the shared value across organize the organization. So thank you so much for this opportunity given. And this recognition will only help the entire team to achieve and excel more and more in their processes. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Dr. Batra. Congratulations, Kanchan. And you're right, uh, the functional manager and the HR leaders and business managers play a role in uh, the LND experience uh, being a real one and the right LND initiatives being backed in. And you use the right three words. Collaboration is the key to that. Right, and content is there. So uh, grateful to you uh, uh, for what you do and congratulations. I just say congratulations to you and your team. Uh, you richly deserve it. And the thanks for, for participating is, I'm sure you continue to do this great work which your organization is doing. All the best. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Um, you know, Godridge is synonymous with the employee orientation as well as learning. 
uh, I know uh, Mr. Jamshid Gorge's uh, commitment to education. Uh, you support many uh, educational programs of CII and um, his association with uh, uh, Professor Parla and uh, he, uh, Mr. Godrej himself continues to teach uh, many of us on sustainability and innovation. Uh, so uh, your, your name is synonymous with employee orientation as a company. Continue to do the good work. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kanchan. Many congratulations to you and to your team. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving forward to our next category. If you're already taking those winning shots, then don't forget to hashtag BWPeopleLND to join our online conversation and letting us in on that celebration. Moving forward to our next category, which is Best Employee Upskilling Strategy. Let's find out who the winner is in this category through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? Thank you. Uh, Great congratulations. Firstly, I'd like to announce to all our viewers that the Best Employee Upskilling Strategy Award goes to Clix Capital Private Limited. We have here with us the CHRO, Mr. Aditya Kohli. Many congratulations to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Batra, uh, Dr. Tyagra, Mr. Tyagrajan, and Dwarka, sir. You know, it's a big privilege and an honor uh, to receive this award. Uh, we are a young company who's uh, very highly focused on learning and development, and we've done a lot over the last couple of years. And to be acknowledged by this group uh, means a lot to us. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the leadership team who supported and the employees who kind of participated actively, and most of all, uh, the learning team that we have and the HR team that we have at Click. So, so thank you so much. Mr. Tiagarajan, would you like to start? Congratulations, Mr. Kohli. Uh, fantastic. Uh, keep up the good work. Um, uh, congratulations, Aditya. Uh, I don't have to say I know you very well. And you, wherever you go, you create that sort of uh, rich experiences for, for your employees as well as for the organization. Uh, I wish you and your organization all the best. Please continue to do the good work what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, you know, dare I say, Mr. Kohli, I was there in your presentation, your one of the, you know, uh, in awards presentation or anything in life to be able to communicate in a short period of time what you did and conviction coming through in that is very important for that to succeed. And in your case, you did that because in your presentation, I was there. I, and uh, it was pretty much, uh, you know, there was coherence in what you presented and uh, congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Badra. Congratulations once again, Mr. Kohli, to you and to your whole team at Clix. Many congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, under the Best Employee Upskilling Strategy category of award, we have a special mention jury award as well. Can we have the audiovisual, please? <laughs> So our big congratulations uh, to Access Bank Limited for taking away the special mention award in the best employee upskilling strategy. I'd like to welcome Vice President Learning and Organization Development, Mr. Prashant Bharadwaj, to join us on screen. Many congratulations to you. Thank you, Khyati. Uh, thank you to the entire team of uh, Business World, Dr. Anurag Batra and his team. Uh, the jury chair, Mr. Tyagrajan, uh, Mr. Patnam, the entire uh, jury team that gave us the opportunity. Uh, actually, feeling a lot of gratitude, uh, you know, for being able to receive this award uh, as a validation for what we've been doing. Um, actually, the credit goes to so many people and so many things that came together. Uh, our MD, who's our biggest cheerleader uh, in the entire upskilling agenda, 
uh, our uh, business leaders, what we call as a tripod between uh, learning, HR, and business, all of these coming together and driving the uh, you know skilling and learning agenda. Our partners, uh, you know, learning partners who worked with us tirelessly during this entire one year uh, to drive this entire uh, you know learning journeys that we had launched. So you know, thanks to all of this that came together and our CLO, uh, you know, who really put this team together and kept on rising the bar every time we you know kept. Uh, launching new programs, we kept raising the bar, and uh, you know the entire learning team. Uh, you know this this belongs to the entire team. So thank you very much. Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thiagarajan. Uh, congratulations, um, Mr. Dorganath is there. He he knows that uh, you 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 were uh, you had nominated yourself in various categories. Um, as uh, Dr. Batra mentioned, uh, the process is very stringent. Uh, we wanted to be sure that in which categories what should stand out. And uh, it, our job was made uh, difficult actually because you have done so very well in many areas. This particular area, you definitely deserve the award. Congratulations, keep it up, all the best to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, well done, uh, Prashant and Access Bank. I know your Access Bank very well. And I think, you know, keep the flag flying. You have been doing a great job. It was not an easy time last one year, but how you motivated, engaged your people. I shared from many quarters what you have done. I hear great stories, but you have demonstrated to us in the jury meeting. As Ms. Chagrajan, our jury chair, said, it was a very tough call. But I think this is what we want to say, that we really appreciate your efforts. Please continue to do so. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, Prashant, uh, one thing when we were preparing, you know, uh, is the, again, I would say consistency in what you presented. And again, you being a functional head, you know, I think this is your second organization. You did eight years with your first seven, eight years, and now almost 12 years with Access. And you yes. come up, you're the branch head, you're the head of... So you understand the business functionally very well. For at the end, the learning and development is helping in achieving business objectives. So the tripod you mentioned, or the senior management of the functional manager and the HR and L&D team coming together is really the formula for success. I think that's a formula others can adopt. So congratulations to you, Prashant. Thank, Thank you very much. Congratulations to you and to your whole team. Many congratulations. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to our next category, best innovation in learning and development. I mean, any category or any business cannot move forward without innovation. So let's find out who is winning the best innovation in learning and development category. Let's look at the audiovisual. Can we have the AV please? <laughs> So big congratulations to Aditya Birla Capital for winning the best innovation in learning and development. We have with us the learning and development head, Mr. Atul Mathur. Many congratulations to you. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, <clears throat> really delighted to receive this award on behalf of the entire LNP team of at Aditya Birla Capital. Uh, you know, a big thanks to all my LNP heads, the corporate uh, LNP team. Uh, uh, not to forget the staunch support of our CHRO and all the HR heads. I also want to thank uh, all our business partners and technology partners. One of them got an award today. Really happy to see that. Uh, the award reaffirms our faith and belief that uh, l and like technology uh, is the backbone of any progressive organization. And uh, it's a firm belief that we need to continuously uh, innovate and find new ways of doing business oh. and uh, you know, reaching out to our customers. And I'm really happy to receive this award on behalf of our Dathibala Capital uh, uh, le Learning and Development team. A big thanks to the jury uh, and uh, to Business World uh, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Mathur. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Dwarkana and Mr. Thyagrajan, your words. Uh, I just want to add, sir, congratulations, uh, Mr. Mathur. I mean, I, you, your organization is no, known for l and I've attended many of your organ programs as a training uh, in the, your training center. Uh, but, you know, as you said, l and is the backbone, especially it is the need of the hour, learning, unlearning, relearning, learning agility is the, is the mantra today. It is not the pandemic has just taught us, but is going to continue for a long time. I, it's important. And then the important aspect here is because we've gone through a very rigorous process, as been alluded by the chair, chair of the jury and Dr. Batra. The important aspect which I really appreciated and is it the innovation you have brought in. Everybody has got an L&D practices, but how innovative we are, it's not a question of adoptability, agility, but also you have shown how innovative to make it customer delight. I think you provided it. That's why you were able to engage and, and motivate and energize your people. Please uh, continue to do it. Well done. Congratulations to you and your team. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Batra mentioned that uh, Mr. Dorganath is... Uh, Mr. Dr. Batra, you, you call him Bhishma of LND or uh, Dronacharya of uh, LND? So the, LND, uh, I, would, I would say the way he's developed the people function in the organization that he's led, especially GSK, uh, is, you know, is exemplary. So just LND, I would say people development, LND is a small part of it. And then he ran the board, he chaired the board. So look at where the organization is and look at the people who work with him, where they are, you know, uh, the number of CEOs that kind of came out of his uh, kind of nurturing uh, is amazing. And I, me and Sudandan and Mr. Dwarkana were in a conversation um, a couple of months back. And, you know, uh, we, there was a certain person on the, on the, on the webinar who talked about how Mr. Uh, Dwarkanath counseled him uh, when he was, he had a job at the organization and he was leaving and then the career he took, uh, you know, so clearly he's shaped many people's careers and along the way built a fantastic organization. So really, you can call him, uh, you know, uh, a leader. Sure. You know. He's not yet retired, yeah. Mr. Thagrajan doesn't want you to be active. He wants to call you Bhishma Pita Maki. <laughs> no, I remember Dr. Batra, the very first meeting I mentioned is that I'm a son of a teacher and yeah. my career ambition was to become a professor. At that point of time onwards, I have noticed that one important quality in you, that you respect all your teachers and all those who helped you to come up in life. Uh, there was no meeting in which you won't mention about someone who had helped you and you will say Ram Ram. And uh, that I learned from you. Yeah, yeah. So clearly a lot of people have helped me. That's not, I mean, I told you three of the jury members that go back more than 20 years with them and really they've been kind to me and in some way uh, that has helped me lose hair and save money on shampoo and stuff like that. <laughs> True. Uh, Mr. Mathur, um, I, I must confide that, uh, you know, till that jury meeting date, I wasn't aware uh, L&D would be such an important part of uh, financial services sector. Uh, I have no hesitation in confiding in that. Uh, I thought they are rich people and uh, they get a lot of talent and they need not to train their people. But I stand corrected uh, from your nomination. The amount of work that you have done, uh, you truly deserve this award. Congratulations. Keep it up. Thank you Mr. so much. Mr. Chagrajan, may I just step in and say one thing? It is not just I'm trying to pat your back. or, But I need to say, I think the two qualities Jim Collins said, good to great company, the leadership for level five, is personal humility and you know a will to do well. I think you have demonstrated, I never met you in person, but what you have demonstrated is so much of humility. At the same time, you carried the team. Carrying a jury is also not an easy thing sometimes. You have a different of views and debates we had. But I think the way you, 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 you facilitated it, it shows that you, know, that you are not only humble, but also will to do well you demonstrated. I truly acknowledge that the level five leadership with you. That's how your organization is also progressing well. You're so grounded, so humble. 
very rare to see nowadays mr dwagar thank you very much sir you, i could agree more with you you know um, you know i i have to tell you this you know i'm not patronizing him i only got to know him in the last four odd years well uh, three years i would say and uh, i'll tell you one of them i meet a lot of people and i meet promoters and ceo the largest companies in india uh, the hottest startups and i meet a really eclectic set of people khati khati you knows i'm doing one of these days at least one of these in some sector or the other but mr thagran is genuinely among the most compassionate and kindest people i have met and you know my wife is a very shy person she doesn't go out but i introduced her to mr thagran and and she agreed to come out like i was like i was okay like what happened okay because the way he communicated with my wife is simple there's nothing it just energy gets carried away the you know she is very shy i mean she doesn't really go out and you know i do this for a living so i am doing this every day she, you know like it's a you know she she is doing this for and you know i tell you the only i jo i'm saying this jokingly this part the reason mr thagaraj is like that i you know me and my daughter agree is because he's a virgo uh, because so are we so <laughs> really yeah. the mr Ka- modi is a kind man he's a virgo so really virgos rule the world sir. but that's on a lighter note the rest was fine <laughs> And yeah. Atul, I'm happy in your organization. There's somebody called Atul because they're mostly Ajays in your company. Could <laughs> <laughs> be Atul's also. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor Badra. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Mathur. On that uh, happy note, we'd like to once again congratulate you and your whole team out there for winning the best innovation in L and D award. Many congratulations. Thank you, Tavi. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving forward to our next category, which is learning and development strategy of the year. A big one coming up where we have some joint winners. So let's take a look at who the winners are in the category of learning and development strategy of the year. Can we have the AV, please? <laughs> A big congratulations! Uh, we have with us Mr. Sunit Sinha from KPMG. Very warm welcome and many congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Uh, very good evening to everyone, Dr. Anurag Batra, Mr. Thagarajan, and Mr. Dwarkanath. Uh, Mr. Dwarkanath uh, has been one of the ins- inspirations for uh, many uh, HR leaders like myself uh, for taking on this course uh, uh, and taking on this course in our careers. But anyway, firstly, firstly, let me let me. Uh, uh humbly accept the award on behalf of uh, i mean i'm i'm just representing a, a large team which was behind this who did a lot of hard work you would have uh, i've seen some of them come and present to you the in the in the earliest sessions when the jury was evaluating the uh, uh, our, our our presentation and our submission and specifically want to call out uh, rohin nader and uh, rani beliappa two uh, excellent lnd leaders who work for kpmg in india and they had a team of almost 35 people who worked day and night to put this together and most importantly i think uh, uh, you know i want to compliment and commend bw people for putting together such a platform and recognizing learning and development and giving it the place that it it deserves i mean in a business like ours we are in, a, in the people business we work for clients we are a professional services consulting firm our people are our only assets and and they need to be at the cutting edge day in day out they are, they are so for us learning is like many other industries but for us learning is at absolutely at the core of it we are as good as what we what value we deliver to our clients uh, you know uh, so therefore uh, it, it's not just the people who worked at the award but i would say for all our 27000 people the learners at kpmg in india who actually help us uh, deliver what we deliver uh, i accept this award humbly and very graciously and thank you so much thank you to the jury members thank you to each of you uh, and uh, yeah uh, very excited to have uh, been nominated and have to been and to have won this award this year thank you satyan congratulations congratulations and uh, i would say uh, mr thagarajan but your colleague that you mentioned his his presentation was outstanding i did ask him one or two very tough questions at least i thought they were tough and he gave very honest answers uh, and you know very authentic and real answers and you know he was very good in presenting uh rohin was outstanding so just want to mention that he's part of your team you acknowledge him also so congratulations sunil 
Mr. Sina, congratulations. I, I wasn't there when the presentation was made. Um, even then, I would have recused myself because uh, we do a lot of work with the KPMG. Keep up your good work. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sinha, thank you for your kind words. Firstly, congratulations to you and your team. I was present. And I would have been surprised if KPMG has not been adjusted for this. You know, I think, you know, it is not that we get carried away by what do otherwise, but the way, is, as Dr. Batra said, the way it was presented, very professional, meticulous, and, you know, we didn't have to ask many sure. questions. There was no clarificatory nature which is required. So, hats off. And at the end, at the cost of reputation, I would like to say I'm glad that one person I could influence to take HR. Sure. And if you're one of them, I'm happy. Sure. Uh, Dr. Batra and Mr. Chagrajan, it may not be relevant, but let me say I could influence one person to take HR. I could never influence my son to take HR, but ultimately become HR manager. <laughs> so so I, I can tell you, Mr. Dwarkanath, I was thinking of becoming a diplomat, joined the Indian Foreign Service, but I landed up at XLRI. So I'm on this public platform. I have no, no hesitation in saying that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Again, thank you. And many congratulations to you, Mr. Sinha, and to your whole team out there at KPMG. With that, we're moving forward to announcing the next winner in the category of Learning and Development Strategy of the Year. This big award has another winner. Let's find out who that is through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? Once again, our big congratulations here to Bennett Coleman and Company Limited for taking away the Learning and Development Strategy of the Year Award. We have with us uh, Ms. Gorika Tandon. May I request you to please switch on your video and join us on screen. A very warm welcome and congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Kathy. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm equally humbled uh, to accept this award on behalf of Bennett Coleman. It's uh, very encouraging when you see that there is, uh, there is some good work that's gone in for an organization and that gets recognized at a platform which is, um, which is as, uh, as renowned as a platform that uh, BWS put together. So thank you to the jury. Thank you, Dr. Anurag. Thank you, Dr. Tiagraj uh, Thank you very much. And I think uh, it just um, it, it reinforces our view the fact that uh, learning and development is an important, uh, it's a very important agenda, particularly in a world of today. Uh, and uh, skilling and upskilling is equally important. And uh, for us to create that ecosystem in the organization that appeals to the learner, that uh, they actually come forward and adopt uh, new ways of work as well as uh, adopt new skills with open arms. Uh, so it's really, really nice that uh, we get we get acknowledged for something like this because it just uh, reinforces the faith uh, and the fact that the investments that we are making are uh, in the right direction. So thank you, everybody, uh, for recognizing us uh, here. I'd also want to mention uh, clearly that uh, this is a whole big team that pulls this together. Uh, I have uh, Neha Das and uh, Dhani Mohan, who are part of the team, uh, who've also been able to put this uh, pitch together and uh, showcase some of the good work and the impact that we've created. So I accept this uh, on behalf of them as well. Thank you. Thank you once again. Mr. Thyagarajan, would you like to congratulate? Ms. Tandon, uh, congratulations. Uh, the, the, your efforts are well reflected in the fact that uh, your group reinvents itself from time to time. The end product uh, is a testimony to the work uh, from the HR team you are doing. Uh, well done. Keep it up. I just want to add to what our chair of the jury has said. I think, you know, getting L&D strategy award for an organization which has been in existence for long, for many years, is very tough. You know, because you, you had, of course, the other, mainly print media and other things, but the way, you know, it's been presented, I've seen a lot of passion in the whole team when they presented it. And uh, it is not an easy task, but the way you have done it, in, especially in the last one year, is remarkable. 
and i said it's a great case study i would i would also urge dr batra and business world team some of the things can make it as a sort of a case study and for research couple of things and because you have the rich data with the permission and with the copyrights and so on it will be revealing it's not just the um, start up or the new companies or tech based companies only they can do it but even the brick and mortar who adopt to other levels also can do it it's one of the rare and great examples thank you thank you so much we will be actually honored if we contribute to any of what you said even a little bit of contribution will go a long way we love to thank you Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Tandon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Tandon. To you and to your whole team. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the big award, the Learning and Development Strategy of the Year. We've already seen two winners come up, and now it's time for the jury special mention award in this category. Let's take a look at who takes away the special mention jury award. Can we have the audio visual, please? So big congratulations, of course, to TVS Credit for the special mention award in the category of Learning and Development Strategy of the Year. We have with us the Head of Learning and Development from TVS Credit, Ms. Shabin Narang. A very warm welcome to you and many congratulations. Shabin, if you can hear us. Yes, thank you. We have a bit of connection uh, issue, uh, Shabin. We can hear you now. Would you like to go forward? Yes, absolutely. Right. Okay, thank you. So, Khyati uh, and uh, Mr. Thyagrajan, Dr. Batra, Dr. Dwarkana, uh, Mr. Dwarkana, thank you so much. And um, it's an honor and a privilege. First, it was an honor and a privilege to be called to present to the jury. Then it's an honor and a privilege and extremely humbling because I've been watching the lineup of the winners and uh, we're a small company, we're a South Indian humble company. And for us, uh, winning an award like this is a very big thing. Uh, I must say that uh, what you said, Dr. Batra, in the morning today when you opened the session and you said that L&D doesn't exist for itself. L&D must keep asking itself what are the business outcomes that it is being asked to deliver and constantly measure itself to see whether the business outcomes are being delivered or not. And I think... Um, that resonated so well with me. Thank you for that uh, insight. It made a big difference to me. I want to say thank you to the jury. I want to say thank you to our CEO who says that there are only two things in a finance company, IT and people. And I'm glad that he looks at it that way. I want to say thank you to Ms. Jeshuva, who's our chief people officer, and our very small team of 20, 25 people who manages training for about 15,000 people in the company. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very humbling to be here. Thank you. Mr. Thyagarajan, would you like to start? Uh, Shabin, uh, congratulations. Keep up the good work. Uh, it is pertinent to mention that uh, the, in this category, all the awards have uh, gone to uh, services sector. Uh, not, not uh, I thought there will be some manufacturing sector which will be there. Uh, well done. All the best to you. Thank you, sir. Mm, congratulations to you and to your organization and your team. I just want, you know, you richly deserve this award. I just want to add, please, you know, small is beautiful. And do not worry whether you are from South or North, West or India, because you are an Indian. I think, you know, go with, with confidence and you can achieve ma many more. You know, ultimately what matters is what you deliver. I'm sure that you continue to provide great service to your employees and the organization and to your customers. The rest will, uh, the, the process itself will take care. Wish you and your organization all the best. Thank you for inspiring us, sir. Thank you. Congratulations uh, uh, for winning this, and I'm sure you'll continue to. And you know, when I was uh, 
again i look at every entry that gets shortlisted before it presented to jury your linkedin profile said you know it talked about collaborations you know success through collaboration the partnerships etc so clearly we live in a world where internally and externally we got to collaborate if you do that you can get the best ideas you can get the best content uh, everything else follows so thank you for following this approach and congratulations thank you dr batra we are on honored to be here thank you sir once again ms narang many congratulations to you and to your whole team for this win congratulations thank you, thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on to our next category of award, which is the best L and D for succession planning. Let's find out who the winner is in this category through this audio visual. Can we have the AV, please? So here's another win for Godrej and Boys Manufacturing. They've taken away the award of Best Learning and Development for Succession Planning. May I request uh, Kanchan Sandal, Learning and Development Head, to please join us on screen one more time. Congratulations to you, Kanchan. Thank you, thank you, Kyati, so much. I think it's a very joyful moment, and we are delighted and humbled to receive this recognition from the BW platform. Uh, I, you know, I'm very confident that you know the recognition that we are getting on this platform will reinforce our pride uh, in what we believe and we contribute. We are truly blessed that you know we've been guided personally and mentored by Mr. Jamshed Godrej and the Godrej family members. You know, in terms of how do we groom leaders of tomorrow, and uh, we truly believe in talent in the organization in terms of you know how they can create a sh shared value for the organization, and uh, how do we look at talent development journey for the future leaders in the organization? And I should say the commitment, uh, you know, the personal involvement of the business leaders as mentors, you know. Uh, where they really take out a uh, huge amount of time uh, helping the individuals to look at an experience sharing of what they have done mistakes and which we, the future leaders should not repeat and the guidance that we get from our president mr anil varma the pna head Harpreet Kaur, in putting the whole framework to bed together, you know, which only not reap results for today, but you know, looking at the next ten years in line, uh, you know, really uh, brings a lot of lot of uh, confidence in us. And getting acknowledged in such a large platform by you know the jury members that are there, uh, it really boosts our confidence level. And I'm sure you know uh, it, we will keep on refining and improving our processes more and more. So thank you so much to the jury members for acknowledging this effort. Thank you very much. Ms. Kanchan has spoken a lot about the jury, but I'd like our jury chair to start off. Kanchan, uh, well done. Uh, quite often I wonder whether Godrej needs success in itself because your ability to retain leaders at various levels for many, many years is remarkable. Uh, I know the good work uh, that you are doing. Uh, I interact with quite a few of your leaders. Uh, well done. Keep it up. I am sure uh, you will grow from strength to strength. Thank you. Um, congratulations, Kanchan, and your organization. I know succession planning is one arena where most of the organization neglect. By by, I would say by, by default or willfully, I don't know. But succession planning is something is seen as a taboo for many, even including senior management. Mr. Chagarajan has picked it up very well. It has to start from the top, and it has to be part of your culture. Even in the many board meetings, NRCs, as Ms. Chagrajan knows, that one of the items which they have to discuss and debate is the section planning. But most of the time, it's very well neglected. Sometimes you talk about section planning, people think, why am I to be replaced? I think, you know, there is, I mean, things are changing. It's still evolved. But you have established a culture. I think, you know, what I like when the presentation is the way you said business uh, leaders as in as a mentors and you are assessing those mentors performance and it is starting from Mr. Godrej himself and right from this top which has driven it so you know it's something you know really admirable some people may say it falls under l and and all personally I feel definitely falls in l and and you're focusing on section planning is something unique I think I really enjoyed your presentation please continue to do the good job 
and congratulations once again to you and your team. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Dorgna, the most important thing is for the BW people team to be identifying this as uh, one category uh, is also to be mentioned, that uh, it, it is uh, to be complemented. Yeah, I, I said I totally echo what you said. I think, you know, uh, Mr. Batra, we are not patronizing you or your team, but I think the way they've analyzed it, you know, it, a jury will not be able to see all the entries. And, you know, you, the way it has been shortlisted, and sometimes they use the innovation. And the two examples I give, one of this leadership planning is a great, great um, uh, idea, innovation, I would say. And second, again, the experimentation. This is something you, you have chosen it. And these are certain things which you need to do innovatively. You did not follow a typical template in l &D, What are the various aspects, as Ms. Jagaranjan is saying? You try to be innovative and progressive. I think it's a great thing, which... I think the HR fraternity and the corporates also have to recognize this, this innovation. I think you should really focus on it. It's a, um, thank you, sir. Thank you for making this uh, uh, view, which is very relevant. You know, uh, Kanchan, I can only say, you can see the passion of these uh, leaders. You know, they both are in accomplished and continue to be very active. But you can see even in explaining the, now I think that what makes a great process and beauty and that's what makes the winners in the whole initiative worthwhile. So thank you again, Mr. Dwarkanath and Mr. Chagrajan. I feel the energy. I feel the warmth. I genuinely believe there's a long way to go and we'll get there. Uh, and I especially want to mention uh, my senior colleague, Mr. Talis Rizvi, who's really put this together. Uh, you know, Talis was an entrepreneur, so he works like an entrepreneur. And he has a deep dive knowledge of a uh, lot of domains, especially HR. And Janani and Ashish and then Sugan and Resham. But I'd say Talish, Janani, Ashish, these uh, three have contributed a lot, so has Aungsugan and, uh, and Resham. So, and the support system, you know, the events team, Prerna Singh Rathor is running it, there's Deepak on the back end, you know, they all work together to be able to put this together, to be able to present you. But uh, continue, congratulations and uh, keep doing well. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much and many congratulations once again to you, Kanchan, and to your team. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we're moving forward to our next category. The next category is something that I'm sure most of you will relate to. Anything that we do these days is possibly on our smartphones, mobile phones, being part of our lives in every possible way. So here it is, our next category, best mobile-based learning. Let's take a look at who the winners are in this category through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? <laughs> So many congratulations uh, to Reliance Nippon Life Insurance Company. I'd like to welcome the Chief Marketing Officer, Mr. Shiv Tiwari, to join us. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, it's an honor to, to be meeting you again. Um, before I go, go ahead and uh, talk more about uh, what we did with it, but I would like to compliment the uh, jury members here. I have been listening to all of you for the last uh, an hour or so. And I'm truly, truly impressed by how much you remember of each of the presentations that was made to you. I think, uh, I think I, I will, I will want to learn how you, how you learn, how you remember so much. So um, kudos to you, sir. This innovation that we did on uh, on mobile-based learning, I think, uh, came out of our need to innovate. Uh, we, were, we were on our journey to uh, transform the organization. We were a loss-making entity and we had very limited resources. So, so it came out of uh, the need of it. So that was point number one. But kudos to all the leaders in the organization, uh, special mention to our uh, chief distribution officer, Mr. Predak Parmar, chief uh, human resources officer, Mr. Srinivas Ladwa, for, for being per persistent with the initiative to force learning. These days, youth do not want to sit in a classroom and learn. So I think uh, more than developing the, the initiative, it was uh, how it was implemented is noteworthy. 
I was uh, personally very excited to present it to you, and I'm honored and humbled uh, to be receiving this on behalf of uh, 12,000 employees uh, that I'm representing here. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Batra, um, I, I have not forgotten uh, that we need to go to Taj uh, for our uh, uh, tea session, sir. So at your convenience, sir, definitely. Absolutely. You know, whenever I'm in Bombay, I'll look you up. Uh, congratulations, ship, and you, keep doing well. And uh, as Mr. Dwarkanath and Mr. Tyagrajan said, the services industry has people, as it is said. So uh, tonight or uh, today evening, a lot of winners are from that sector. You again come from a financial services uh, sector. So congratulations. I think it's a sector that is going to grow. Look at the number of investors on the stock market. We've gone from two crore investors to four crore plus investors. And the big bull, Mr. Junjunwala has been saying for at least six years, we'll reach 50,000. We ran a cover story also two years back. And now he's talking of uh, one like already. So clearly it augurs well for the financial services ecosystem. So congratulations. Thank you so much, sir. Well then, sir, they are, it is well deserved. Uh, most importantly, um, you, you are uh, creating livelihoods. Uh, these boys and girls who you train, um, they are benefiting immensely and uh, India will not progress without that. So in that respect, also this award is well deserved for you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, congratulations, you just say, uh, richly deserved. Um, I, I think you said it, but let me quote, Necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? When you're pushed to such situations, you need to create that innovation and make it happen, which you did it admirable. Sometimes you may have a great strategy, but you may not be able to execute it. I think the uh, what you have done is not only created a strategy, but implemented and executed seamlessly and brilliantly. I think, you know, um, uh, the way you have made the presentation, very passionate. You can see it's coming from and just be, from the, when you worked hard, then only you'll be able to do it with that sort of passion. You richly deserve this award. Please continue to do the good work and uh, all the best to you and to your organization. Thank you so much, sir. This serves as a great uh, encouragement to all of us here. Thank you so much, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Tiwari. Many congratulations to you and to your whole team. I'd also like to invite uh, and welcome, actually, our uh, two jury members who just joined us. We have with us Mr. Simnandan Bhanja Chaudhary, executive partner, the Tapalo Group. Also, we have with us Mr. Sudhir Mishra, founder and managing partner, Trust Legal. A very warm welcome to you, gentlemen. And we are moving now to our next award category. Our next award category is once again, the best mobile-based learning because we have another winner in this category. Let's find out who the next winner is in this category by this audio visual. Can we have the AV please? Yes, a big congratulations to the winner of best mobile based learning. SBI General Insurance Company Limited. I'd like to welcome the CHRO of the company, Mr. Sharad Dikate, to join us. A very warm welcome. Many congratulations. Thank you, Khati. Uh, thank you, everyone at Business World, Mr. Thagrajan, Mr. Uh, Dr. Batra, and the entire jury for this honor. Truly absolutely privilege and honor to receive this on behalf of young energetic team back home. Uh, the time which is challenged by not having enough appropriate face time. Uh, mobile learning is something which brought us a lot of leverage. Uh, thanks once again to everyone at Business World. Thanks to my l &D team who really worked hard and ensured that like, you know, this platform becomes one of the pivotal things in terms of l and progression in the organization. Thank you once again. Mr. Thyagarajan, would you like to start? Uh, congratulations, sir. Uh, well deserved. You, you join a light uh, uh, group of services industries uh, who, who, which have won awards in many categories. Uh, well done. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thyagarajan. Mr. Chaudhary? 
So you're on mute. Hi. Uh, congratulations, Sarad. That this is a fantastic award to win, I can tell you. And I still remember the time when uh, Microsoft got Satya Nadella to drive the company and when he took over. You know, one of the th things he talked about was about mobile first and cloud first. And if you as a company recognize that and uh, brought about a lot of learnings in that space and driving that piece very effectively, I think it's uh, hats off to you. And uh, congrats once again. Mr. Mishra. Congratulations, sir. Thank SBI you. the pride of our country. And you are getting an award. You represent our public sector undertaking. We are very proud of the work which SPI does. Dr. Batra. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations to you, Mr. Sharad. Takate, again, uh, you come from the financial services. And again, you were a functional manager, a business leader before you transitioned into HR. So clearly, you are, when you do any people initiatives or LND initiatives, you understand the business objectives. So really, I think that makes it special. So congratulations to you, Mr. Takate. Thank you, Dr. Patra. Truly humbling experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many congratulations once again to you and to your whole team of SBI. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're quickly moving forward to our next category of award, which is Best Learning and Development Strategy for Blue Collar Employees. Let's find out who the winner is through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? And yes, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the winner of the best learning and development strategy for blue collar employees, a winner, Hindalco Industries Limited, Hirakud. I'd like to welcome the senior vice president of the company, Mr. Krishna Padi. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, jury members. Thank you, business world. Uh, thank you for uh, recognizing our efforts. Last one year has been very tough, but we did uh, uh, realize or did experience that the saying that goes, top situation, top time doesn't last long, but the top people do last. So that helped us immensely while saving lives of our people, employees and their family. We also equally focused on a strategy which was drawn from our business strategy to build capability for future. And blue collar people were uh, they are the uh, uh, focus of our all attention. So today it's an old plant, old uh, setup, but yes, the people with the skill built up, with the multi-skilling and with everything, the development parameters we have set up, that helps us immensely to reach our objectives. So that's what me and my team have done. So credit goes to the whole HR team, uh, my LND team, Prasad Gupta and others. So thank you all once again for recognizing our efforts. Thank you. Wonderful. Sorry, sir, you're on mute. Congratulations. Uh, well done. In, in a location uh, where uh, your uh, factory is uh, there, uh, it is not easy to uh, tackle the pandemic and at the same time deliver such kind of initiatives. You did mention that we could see from the nomination itself it is aligned to the business strategy. Um, you, you must feel proud. Your employees will feel proud. And uh, I am very glad that you secured this award. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Mishra. Congratulations, sir. Many congratulations. Thank I hope you. this award helps the company go scale new heights. Yeah. Mr. Thank you very much. Yes, congratulations, Krishna. I think this is a fantastic award to win, especially given the organization of your size. Yeah. And uh, the mammoth organization which is there. And I know your CHRO, please congratulate him as well, Shomik Basu. Sure, sure. And I think it's a great uh, honor to 
manage such a large number and such a large number effectively i think yeah. goes uh, says a lot about the senior management in hr and their focus in learning and development which i think is a very very key piece for any organization congrats krishna thank once you. again thank you very you much and your team you. i'll convey your message to samit too thank you that'll be great i think he needs to know yeah yeah certainly yeah. thank Good you special mr padi thank you very much dr patra thank you so once again from the entire team of bw people we congratulate mr padi thank and to your whole team thank, thank you, you so much thank you humble thank you before we move on to the last few awards uh, in the next few seconds we would like to once again welcome our jury member here dr poonam segal former dean and professor iim lucknow dr segal if you are here with us request you to please switch on your video and join us on screen so while dr segal joins us on screen let me inform all of you that we are moving forward to our last big category which is bw people learning and development leadership awards under which our first category is the young ceo leader of the year and to find out who the winner is of course we're going to take you through the audio visual can we have the av please <laughs> So many congratulations uh, to Roxanne Saldana, Senior Manager, Learning and Development at WeWork. A very warm welcome to you. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Kiyati. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for this recognition and it means a lot to me, especially at this juncture in my career. Uh, the best part of this experience was that we had to cover a gamut of things in an extremely short time. And it taught me to be very crisp, to be very articulate. Uh, and it was quite hard for someone who otherwise talks a lot so business world has an extremely scientific manner to gauge participants uh, and this stems new ideas in my mind to adapt and apply at the workplace so thank you so much for this experience thank you mr tyagarajan your words of encouragement congratulations i i recall uh, my my um, conversation and i interrupted you many a times and uh, made you uh, confined to the time that was allotted and uh, well done. Uh, we know that you deserve this award. All the best to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dear Rajan. We're delighted to have uh, Dr. Segal also join us. Very warm welcome, ma'am. Thank Your you. of encouragement to Roxanne. Oh, well, it was wonderful to listen to her. We were so impressed, Roxanne. Thank you. And all the very best to you. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much, ma'am. Good luck. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mishra. Yeah, she actually brings a lot of positivity. That day we realized in the jury meeting, and uh, that will keep you always ahead because you are you are very positive about life. Thanks a lot. One Mr. second. Tha One second. Yes, Mr. Chaudhary, your words of encouragement to Roxanne. Yes, congratulations, Roxanne. I think it's a great award to win. And it's recognition of the new age companies, which I'm not surprised business world is doing that because, you know, I mean, I see uh, Dr. Batra and his team very recognizing the new trends that are there. He's always been a brilliant and, you know, innovative mind. I think it's a great award to me to win. And I think... Uh, fantastic to be there in one of the first years of BW Awards. So Congrats much. once again. Absolutely. Dr. Batra? Congratulations, Roxane. The business you are in is uh, changing seismic shifts because the future of work has changed. So clearly uh, in how you imagine your business, reimagine your business and you know, kind of reset your business, uh, you need to think holistically and hence the role of a people manager and the L&D initiatives become even more important. So all the best in being able to articulate it well and congratulations on your success. 
many congratulations roxanne to you and i hope this weekend has just gotten better and you'll be celebrating soon definitely thank you congratulations Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we are moving on to our next category of award on BW People's HR Learning and Development Excellence Award 2021. Here we have the CLO of the Year Award. Let's find out who the CLO of the Year is through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? <laughs> Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. The CLO of the Year Award goes to Sarmishta Mitra, CLO, Access Bank Limited. A very warm welcome to you and many congratulations. Thank you so much. I really do not know what to say. You know, I was really asking my family that people are saying some amazing things. I really don't know what to say, but yes, uh, truly happy, uh, truly humbled. And, you know, truly delighted by the process uh, that uh, we went through uh, to be able to get this far. I would definitely like to thank uh, BW and your team. You know, we've been seeing our interactions over many things in the last few months. It's been amazing. Uh, Dr. Batra, uh, thank you for running such a beautiful organization. Uh, Mr. Thyagrajan, Mr. Dwarkanath, of course, I have immense respect for. Uh, he is a very dear friend of my ex-boss, P.V. Ramnamurthy. So I have a lot of uh, things for him. And uh, just fun. And, uh, and also uh, the rest of the jury. I really, really enjoyed the jury round. So thank you. On behalf of Axis Bank, uh, we are all delighted. Our leaders are busy in a strategy meet in Goa. I've not yet told them, but I'm going to tell them so that their Saturday evening is really, really exciting. But I've really called uh, a quick meeting with my team and I said, we are all going to be talking right now. Uh, and I'm sure it's a celebration for them. Uh, I'm very new to the bank, you know. Uh, and it's my first stint in financial services other than uh, support of our managing director, our beautiful leaders uh, in business, in HR, and an amazing team. Uh, it all goes out to them. Uh, but thank you for making them smile. And as a bank, we have been in essential services. Our people have toiled hard uh, during the lockdown. Uh, you know, um, our heart goes out to them. And this is for each one of them as well, all 80,000 of us. So thank you so much. And I personally feel as a bank, our whole initiative that we support, that we got in things like stay positive, mindfulness, et cetera, uh, helped us uh, stand out in many ways. Uh, so I'm indebted to each one of you here and each one of us who's not here today. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Satyag Rajan, would you like to start with the congratulatory message? Congratulations. Uh, well done. Uh, my, I must tell you that uh, in a jury process, uh, it takes time for the jury to get into the rhythm. Uh, yours was, uh, was the first presentation and uh, straight away we uh, got okay. into the rhythm, number one. Uh, thank you for that, actually. Number two is um, you made it difficult for uh, the other entries, including that of your own bank. Uh, because you set very high standards, actually, in the, in your presentation. So, therefore, uh, the others got scrutinized in that context. So, so, well done. Keep it up. All the best to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would just like to say, uh, uh, Ms. Mitra, that what I learned from you is that how to be humble in this entire process. You were so impactful at Mr. Thyagarajan said that it became a unanimous vision for the jury that day and it set a tone for our entire meeting i and you were saying that this is your first instinct uh, in the financial services uh, this is the way one really opens up and i can see that this makes you a leader thank you thank you so much thanks a lot thank you sudhichi thank you 
Yeah, you see, um, you richly deserve charisma. I have seen your presentation. As Mr. Chagarajan said, you made others um, no comparison as yours. And uh, your contribution, I'm surprised that you spent only one year. Incidentally, I, I not only knew your earlier HR head, I know your HR head also very well. And I'm sure that you are in the right place with the right leadership as you alluded. Please go and enjoy and celebrate your success. And this is not only your success, but your organization's success. Please convey my regards to Raj Kamal. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Chaudhary? Yes. Congratulations, Karmishta. I must say that apart from being very articulate in your presentation, I think what came out to me certainly was the fact that, you know, there's a lot of passion. And uh, we as a jury love that, you know, and I think Mr. Tyagarajan uh, ensured that everybody could speak and this, you know, it was forthright and candid and we had a uh, great uh, interaction discussing and yours was, I think, unanimous, I think, the way he put it. And certainly uh, with the jury chair giving us that direction, we all had our say, but in your case, I think it was pretty unanimous. So fantastic. Uh, congrats once again. And like Dwarka said, please go enjoy. This is your day. Thank you. And I must share this with you, uh, you know, uh, Sunandan, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you talked about that, what the question was brilliant. And I think when it just resonated, you know, the whole courage and the stay positive and that interaction, I think for me, uh, somewhere something shifted and, and like other jury members say, maybe the passion just came out because it just something got vindicated. So thank you so much for that moment. I wanted to share this with you. I'm glad you enjoyed because we enjoyed with Mr. Tiagra being there. We were also fair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank spoke you. our mind as well, you know, and he Thank gave you. us a chance to do it. Fantastic. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Dr. Seigel? Well, I, I realized I'm banking with the right bank, and uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Wow. <laughs> having, having said that, Tarmishta, I think, uh, you know, you really spoke from your heart, and I would have loved to hear more. I think two, two minutes was too short to know about the kind of work you're doing. And uh, I'd really love to know more because I think there was a lot of depth in uh, what you were sharing, but it was constrained because of time. But um, yes, cheers to you and all celebrations and good wishes for the future. Thank you. I'll, I shall reach out to you, Dr. Seigel. I really okay. enjoyed the conversation and sure. we'll, we'll learn, no and learn from yeah, you. I'd love to know more. Yeah. I learned from By you. By the way, I have a line that you can describe your department and this particular function, you can call it the bank of learning as well. You know, <laughs> wow. <within> the... <laughs> wow, thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you so much. That is congratulations. Thank well you. Done. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations to you, Ms. Mitra, to you, to your team. And yes, like everybody has said, great. many congratulations. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'd also like to thank Mr. Dwarkanath for his time. Uh, I assume that I was told that you have to leave. So thank you, sir, for uh, you know spending this time here with us on the jury and also honoring the winners here. Thank you so much. No, it was really a pleasure. Thank you very much to Dr. Batra, to the jury members and the chair and all the organizing committee. I thoroughly enjoyed. I have a meeting which I have to join. Please bear with me. But thank you. Looking forward to have a great connect with all of you when when the situation becomes normal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Exactly with you. We are proud of being associated with you in some measure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, yes, Thank you so much, Dr. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two more big awards coming up for all of you. If you're taking those winning shots, don't forget to hashtag BWPeopleLND. Let us in on the celebration and join the online conversation. So moving on to our next award category, which is the CHRO leader in learning and development. Let's find out who the winner is through this audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please?
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the CHRO leader in learning and development award winner. We have Shrikant Lonikar, CHRO, Perno Record India. I would like to welcome him. Very warm welcome, Mr. Lonikar, and many congratulations to you. Unfortunately, Mr. Lonikar, I'm unable to hear you. Jury members, can you hear him? No. Um, you are not on mute. So, uh, can we try that again? So, I guess, Mr. Lonika, there must be some technical glitch. No worries. Why don't you quickly uh, leave the room and join back again? I think that should solve, uh, yes, the problem here. I'm un unable to hear you at all. You know, uh, Kyati, this reminds me of Mission Mangal. <laughs> and you know any others where you just have to like your mobile you switch off and switch it on it always works it always yeah. works yeah. <laughs> somehow rebooting always works yeah. <laughs> that mission to the mars i don't know where how many of you have seen it but they just had to switch it off and switch it on and all the signals came back so there you are great uh, idea so then uh, that uh, i i realized that uh, you know specifically while getting into tv interviews if that happens, uh, you know, you can easily get derailed. You are, uh, that that uh, 30 seconds to 90 seconds uh, is a very, very tough moment. Yeah. Um, Hello? Yeah. Yes, we are able to hear you, sir. Okay, great. Welcome back and congratulations once again. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Juri. Uh, uh, this is a little awkward moment for me because I'm not used to receiving awards. So, uh, <laughs> this will be, uh, 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 just a couple of things that I want to share uh, with you. One is, uh, as far as learning and development is concerned, uh, you know, uh, halfway through my career, uh, you know, I uh, got in contact with my spirituality, and that's where uh, one thing that realization came to me was serving people is serving God, you know, and then uh, I realized that I am in human resources. So I started th thanking God every morning. And my sense is that serving people in my profession is best way is to help them learn and achieve their dreams by developing, you know, so that has been my mission. And I thank my organization, Bernu Ricard, because it shares my vision and same thinking. So I have the opportunity to do what I want to do. And my team, uh, that's so committed to learning and developing people, they actually bring it uh, to reality, what I think once in a while, but they bring a lot of ideas, strategies and make it, so I want to thank them. And a big thank you to the jury for thinking me worthy of this recognition. I'm humbled, thank you. So well said, Mr. Lonikar. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary, would you like to start with congratulations? Yes, um, you know, Shrikant, I must say that, you know, I first of all enjoyed your presentation. And uh, for putting it across so lucidly and so it clear came across as very strategic. And the fact that, you know, uh, today LND plays such a fundamental role and, and I can see that you take it to a different level and you've appreciated. And I think you brought to the fore the essentials of the program very clearly. To me, it was amazing. It was uh, brilliant to get it in uh, so quickly and get a sense of what you're doing in the organization for the people. And congratulations to you and the team and to your organization as well for giving you that opportunity and making it happen. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thyagarajan. Please call me Sunandan, I'll feel a little young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was about to say that the um, you know uh, a mature leader uh, at the same time youthful in terms of thoughts and actions. Um, we thoroughly enjoyed as Sunandan mentioned. Um, good work done. Uh, please continue to do so. Um, uh, we we witnessed your humility that day and as well as today when you are receiving the award. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Sagal? Mr. Lonikar, you came, you reached out as a very authentic person to me. And I think, uh, you know, that is one very important uh, characteristic or ingredient for an HR person. 
that you know you feel for people and uh, uh, there was humility at the same time so much uh, authenticity in what you said and it really uh, touched me it was very inspiring and i think you definitely deserve this award and i'm so happy that you know we did decide to give you this award and many congratulations to you and may you have many many more milestones ahead thank you so much all the best thank you mr mishra many congratulations that's what i want to say many congratulations sir thank you thank you so once again mr shrikant lonikar many congratulations to you for being the chro leader in learning and development at our awards many congratulations to you and to your team thank you so thank much you. thank you kathy with that ladies and gentlemen we've come to the last but not least award here at the bw peoples hr learning and development excellence awards the next category is the learning and development team of the year let's find out who takes away this big award, big award through this audio visual can we have the av please <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen give it up for the lnd team of the year dalmia cement bharat limited we have with us the head leadership development vikas tandan many congratulations very warm welcome thank you thank you kwati and thanks a lot jury chair and jury members for this recognition uh, we at dalmia bharat uh, group feel blessed humbled and delighted to receive this recognition this recognition not only reinforms our objective to create unique learning experience for our you know stakeholders but also put us uh, in a very thin way towards excellence thanks thanks a lot for doing that our organizations unique learning and development teams you know they not only have the in depth understanding about the business but they have passion and empathy for people development that is a blend of you know business and uh, you know passion for this learning and development at this thing I, at this junction i also want to thank all our business leaders functional managers who has created the learning as the first priority in the organization and i think this recognition will further strengthen our learning agility in the organization thanks a lot bw for giving this recognition thanks a lot mr thiagu would you like to start congratulations uh, because uh, well done um, it is it is not easy for an organization like yours to demonstrate leadership in this uh, it's a uh, uh, cement is a world economy um, you know enterprise and i uh, you have so many challenges to deal with i i recollect uh, mr mishra who is uh, the strong advocate of sustainability even placing certain questions related to that and um, you uh, your team and the presenters explained that uh, very well um, you know uh, you are spread across the country and um, the i am certain as a very old organization you will have uh, resistance to change itself so from the lnt team to import uh, you know the, the learnings and making them uh, current to today and um, your brand has evolved and uh, i i see the tagline future today and you all seem to be aligned to the uh, strategy itself all the best to you keep up the good work thanks thanks a lot uh vikas uh, yeah vikas ji uh, i'm very personally pleased that you are getting this award because this is a right very rightly said by my chair that it's a challenging industry uh cement is a very challenging industry personally i have been involved in series of litigations on on both the sides pro, pro bono side and also defending the companies and if you can bring sustainability as a, a principle core principle i'm sure that uh, a lot of uh, lot of problems which other countries have faced especially china india can avoid them while developing the infrastructure so all thanks, the best and many congratulations thanks a lot sudhir dr sagal Vikas, hat heartiest congratulations. As uh, my jury uh, colleagues have already mentioned, it's such a tough industry, 
and i think that uh, kudos to you and your team for um, you know uh, building such a vibrant team that you can bring about learning and development across the country in your various plants etc um, i must congratulate your um, senior management who probably uh, has a lot of faith in learning and development because without that is not possible and obviously you played a role there in ensuring that you get the right support from them so time for celebration for you with us all the Thank very you. best thanks a lot dr sangal mr chaudhary yes congratulations vikas you know i must say that um, i had an undue advantage while looking at this uh, position that you applied for and in the sense that you know this particular award because i'm familiar with nalanda you know your chro ajit menon I, i did tell me about it few years back and and what a great thing to have created you know that hats off to your md puneet as well i mean you know dalmia and everybody in the top management and leadership team you know to have created something which is uh, of great value to every business that you have within the organization a business uh, Uh, that you have developed and i think it's fantastic and it's a, doing a great job and i think the vision for dalmia is also brilliant and thing and thank you so much for bringing it to the fore and uh, sharing with everybody congrats once sure. again because thanks thanks a lot mr chaudhary thanks a lot so once again congratulations for being the learning and development team of the year many congratulations thank to you, you. tandan and to the whole team of dalmia cement bharat limited thank you With that, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our jury chair and all our jury members here. Thank you for sparing the time for firstly judging all the entries and for being here and honoring them as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Tiagarajan and everyone. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you, Mr. Business World. Thank you. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you, and thank I you, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Tiagarajan. Thank you. And we thank have you, uh, our BW People Director, Mr. Talis Rizvi here with us who would be Yes thank you Talis and team fabulous job brilliant well thank done Thank you all Thank you Mr. Thank you thanks I'm able to hear you while you set up your audio once again I can't hear you Just please rejoin again Till then I would like to thank our education partner for the event Institute of Public Enterprise thank you for your partnership and support at the BW People's HR Learning and Development Summit and Excellence Awards 2021 So I'd like to request Mr Rizvi to join us back on screen for the vote of thanks till then let me also remind all our winners the winning teams if you are taking those winning shots then uh, do get us into the celebration through the hashtag #bwpeoplelnd we'd love to be part of the celebrations and join the online conversation so if mr rizvi is here request you to please quickly switch on your video there you are welcome mr rizvi yes you i'm able to hear you as well so just dr batra uh, when he started off with the thing uh, mr sunandan was the first person that i interacted with and uh, lnd was something that uh, he just thought and uh, we should do about it we were doing a lot of hr stuff and uh, at that point of time uh, when we started off it was not pretty clear that how to to curate uh, the entire thing and gradually we built it up around uh, the covid and what are the challenges that we have so finally uh, it took shape and uh, finally we are through with all the presentations today i would like to thank uh, dr tyagarajan for the constant support uh, mr dwarkanath dr poonam i spoke to her at length and uh, dr uh, mr sunandan uh, mr sudhir mishra harshwardhan ji and above all uh, to make this uh, entire event possible uh, i would like to thank the team of bw people and bw business world that is ashish janani devika sugan resham uh from our sales mr ravi khatri tanvi prerna avnish ayan deepak kuldeep mayank mok sumit and uh, yes uh, uh, khyati who held the show to, uh, together throughout the day and rohel ashima and mr sunil kumar so with that i think uh, uh, we can wrap it and uh, we need to launch it again and we need uh, the support from the jury for the upcoming events thanks a lot
Thank, thank you, Talis and Thank you very much. All the best. And thank you, thank you. Kati. Well thank you, Kati. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Dara. Thank you, Kati. Doctor, Dr. Kathy is conferred by BW University. I am not. <laughs> I am not a doctor. <laughs> so, but thank you. Please, well catch done. you soon. Catch you job. soon. See you, Puna. Doctor Puna. Bye. Bye, yeah. Nandan. Bye. Bye. Yeah, see you. Take care. All Bye. the best. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. All the best. Yes, with that, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen, we come to the end of the inaugural edition of. BW People's HR Learning and Development Summit and Excellence Awards 2020. We thank all of you for being part of this journey and we will see you again next year. This is me, Khyati Kawair, who's signing off. Have a very good evening and a super weekend, but please do stay safe. Thank you so much. Have a very good night. Okay, take care. Bye.